Good morning, everyone. If we could all take our seats, uh, we're going to begin with just a few words from Wendy Perdue, the Dean of the Law School. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here this morning um, for this important program. Let me start by um, thanking the, the Pillar uh, staff and uh, uh, the, um, Courtney Squires, the editor in chief, and Nicole Evans, the symposium editor. Um, at the students spend an enormous amount of time putting together um, this program and uh, are, are really um, appreciative of your attendance at it. It's a great learning opportunity for them, and we hope it's going to be a great learning opportunity for you all. This is an important program. Um, the assuring educational equality for all students is a part of who we need to be as a country. Um, it, it reflects the recognition that uh, all of our young people have enormous potential, but we have to take the steps to meet that potential. It's not always easy, um, and it sometimes requires the intervention of experts to make sure it happens the way it should. Um, so I'm delighted to see you all here um, and, and delighted to um, recognize the commitment that that represents to helping to assure that all of our young people can get the education they need and deserve. So I hope you all have a terrific program. It's an all-star lineup. We've got some fabulous um, speakers and presenters. Uh, so I hope you have an outstanding day. Take care. Thank you, Dean Perdue. Good morning and welcome once again to this year's Public Interest Law Review Symposium, not just for learning, a comprehensive look on how IEPs and 504 plans affect youth. My name is Nicole Evans, and I'm one of the symposium editors along with Aaron Sweet by my side. This symposium was born out of my interest in disability issues and Aaron's interest in child advocacy. The need for discussions on IEPs and 504 plans is stark. In just the time that we have planned this symposium, an article was published about Wendy Little and her son Aaron and their struggle over their school's non-compliance with Aaron's individualized education program, which culminated in Aaron being disenrolled from the Chesterfield County public school system. Before the 2022-2023 school year, Wendy and the Chesterfield school system were unable to agree to the terms of her son's IEP. The Chesterfield refused to add a medical aid to the IEP to address the boy's compounding disabilities that required a, the aid for hygienic needs. Wendy also disagreed with the Chesterfield's IEP's team's attempt to have her son placed in high school because her, his education was at, at a local day, private day school was subpar and left Aaron unprepared for a higher grade level. The night before school was to start, Wendy was notified that her son's special education tra transportation was canceled and that the school prohibited him from being enrolled. Aaron spent the last school year without any educational instruction, and now he has fallen behind at least two grade levels. As of September, Aaron still remains at home without a start date for the current school year. With proper discussions, education, and advocacy, situations like Aaron's can be prevented. On that note, we would like to thank you all for attending today to educate yourselves on the different issues surrounding youth with disabilities and the different strategies available to advocate for them. Our event today is a journey meant to take you from the start of the issue all the way through the remedies administratively, judicially, and legislatively. First, Dr. Norm Geller will walk us through what an IEP is, how to determine available interventions, and how to advocate for these services and protections for your client. Next, a panel of special education advocates will discuss and debate hot topics surrounding IEPs. After a brief break, Valerie Slater will move us into the judicial system, where she will illustrate the trends of youth incarceration and their intersections with youth of color and youth with disabilities. Professor Katropia will then deliver our ethics presentation about ethical considerations on undisclosed classroom recordings, a new topic of conversation when gathering evidence to advocate for your client. 
After we break for lunch, we will return to the court space with two panels, one of GALs to discuss their role in this and other processes in child advocacy, and one with members of the juvenile and domestic relations and circuit courts to discuss their roles and trends they see. Following our final break, Melissa Waugh will tackle the administrative remedies available to children and families denied other remedies, and we will close with a panel of legislative advocates who will discuss how children's and parents' rights intersect and diverge on this topic and how both can be advocated for. We hope you take away not only a better understanding of what options are available for students with disabilities, but also the vast issues that face children, parents, and advocates when trying to take advantage of these opportunities and options. Although all of the incredible people speaking today are working hard on these issues, there is much work to be done. But there is also much hope to be had because the first step into solving a problem is to name it. And the second is to talk about the ways to change it. This is what we hope to do here today. If at any point today you have a housekeeping question, please find someone with a name tag. All sessions should have time for Q&A from both our in-person and online audience members, so please be sure to engage with our fantastic speakers and panelists. If you are attending for CLE or GAL credit, please make sure to check in at the check-in table or the online. If you are online, please fill out and submit the brief survey put in the chat. Once again, thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to hand it back over to Nicole to introduce our first session. First, we will hear from Dr. Norman Geller in his presentation, Deconstructing the IEP, Pathways to Determine Best Intervention Strategies and Legal Protections for Your Client. Dr. Geller has a PhD from Virginia Commonwealth University and specializes in learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, and psychoeducational assessment. He frequently accompanies families to school meetings to facilitate best practices and intervention strategies. Dr. Geller? Can we hear me? Oh, I love when a plan comes together. Okay. So I don't stand still. In fact, for anybody who knows me, I spend most of my time on in court. So today's a perfect place to be. The difference is with not in this kind of a court, I'm on the pickleball court. So it's all the same. So I was really trying to find a way of how I can be just humorous and funny and how, how we'd start this off. And I was looking for something about IEPs. Couldn't find anything. I mean, it was all about teachers having to write IEPs. And the best I came up with was the little sign that the teacher walked out of the room was no parents were killed or hurt during the IEP meeting. And unfortunately, that, that should not be the case. We're dealing with children. We're dealing with our babies. We're dealing with the future of our civilization regardless of ability or disability we should not have that issue and so i've been doing this for a very long time and i will tell you from my perspective the iep is the most powerful tool that we have in dealing with special education unfortunately we don't use it properly so i have a i have a gadget so i'm good so the first thing i just want to go over very quickly is do, are we, are we, do we know what the timelines are? Because people don't know about timelines. I was just working on a, in a case in a school local, local here to Richmond, and a parent, or excuse me, an advocate called the school council and said, I want this child referred for special education because they may have ADHD. And the council said, no, no, no. If you're referring for ADHD, only the physician can do that. Well, first of all, we have a violation because anybody can make that referral and they have, and they, the referral process starts and you have 10 business days. End of conversation. After that, we have 65 business days for eligibility. That's business days. So that's five days per week. That's 12, 13 weeks. But if we have holidays in there and snow days and things like that, it could be 15, 16 weeks where this kid is sitting, not getting services. And without interventions, we don't progress the way we need to. And then we have the IEP, of, we have 30 calendar days. And what we usually find is 30 calendar days, you get, you get a draft IEP, the parent looks at it, oh, this looks good, and we're done. 
I will tell you that the 30 calendar days and the review of those of, of the data that's in the IEP is so remarkably important. Even if you have a child as young as six years old, when they become 18, that IEP is remarkably important. By the way, I am from New York. I talk fast. Those of you who are from down south probably listen slower than I can talk. Um, and if you need me to slow down, repeat something, that's perfectly fine. I, I like making facial contact so I can see people's eyes and get in the eye rolls. If there's a joke or a pun in there, my children, my grandchildren expect you to do some eye rolling. Um, so anyway, so the cornerstone piece of an IEP is the present level of performance. And I'm gonna focus on the word present because present means today. It doesn't mean two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. So, and I know this is really small, but this is really important because when I speak, when I speak to the, um, uh, the, the folks here at University of Richmond and I go to schools, I talk to parents, I teach in the graduate level, I wanna talk about what should be in there. That first paragraph, people just kind of gaze, well, lawyers don't gaze over any small fine print. But, um, but I, I look at this as an IP is comprised of specifically designed instruction that involves adapting the content, methodology or delivery of instruction to address the needs of the student, accommodations, modifications, and supplementary aids and services to ensure their access to the general curriculum. That's a huge piece in there. The times that we read that and we look at the present level of performance, the two don't match. And unfortunately, the teachers who write these, and they all mean well, and they all are lovely human beings, but they don't always have, we don't, they don't get the information in the reports. If they don't have the information in the reports, because we haven't helped them put that information in the reports, then we have to do a better job. I do a lot of um, clinical training across the country, across the world actually, uh, on autism assessment. And I do an advanced writing um, uh, seminar on what you need to do, put into a report so it conveys into an IEP. If those reports just have numbers in there, the people who write the IEPs are really screwed. Um, and that's probably a little bit my New York ease coming up, but that's just how I talk. Um, what, we want, what we want to look at is present level of academic achievement and, and functional performance. That doesn't mean what you got on an achievement test three years ago. It doesn't mean what you got in kindergarten in your report card and you're now you're in fourth or fifth grade. I want to know what's happening now. That also means, teacher, tell me what's going on in the classroom. This kid has no friends. The kid does not complete assignments. That's all part of present level of performance. It's clearly stated in there. Everything you have in your, pre and we'll go over this, everything you have in your present level of performance should lend itself to a measurable annual goal. Measurable annual goal. If I see a measurable annual goal in math, and for some reason, I go back to the present level of performance and, and says, math is on grade level. Please tell me why we have an objective. If you're telling me this kid has social deficit somewhere, I want to see something about social involvement. There are key words within the present level of performance that says to me, there's information that's missing somewhere. There's a key that's like, I need to go back and backlink where that information is coming from. Benchmarking short-term objectives, supplementary aids, participation with neurotypical children. That's a little line at the very end of the IEP. Tell me what that means. Look, if we have kids who are pretty involved, it's not easy for a general ed teacher to include them, but there are ways of doing it. This is an individual educational plan, not a generalized individual plan to make life easy. And we know what we're talking about. Um, so, and then, you know, we have all this stuff. And these are the pieces that are key, but we need to really break down the, the key pieces to make sure that, we are covering them and they are listed in the present level of performance. Carl, it's talking back to me. Okay. 
So again, we want to make sure everything we have in the present level of performance is tied to an objective. Thank you. We're making, you know, so when we look through this, I want to look at, I want to make sure all these aspects are covered. The reason I am so concerned, people are concerned about the end of the IP. People are concerned about making sure we have a kid placed in the right disability category. People are concerned about the objectives. To me, those are secondary. You may roll your eyes. Why is that secondary? Because if I can identify in the present level of performance based upon data, and I will tell you, data does not lie. I don't care for opinions. I don't care for opinions. I want data. Show me when you talk about a particular score, when you have a particular deficit, you can't lie about that. You can't make this stuff up. Numbers don't lie. But you need to learn how to use the numbers. So as advocates and attorneys and anything else you do to help facilitate, and I, I like the word facilitation, I like understanding the numbers. I like understanding what everybody else is working with. And the objectives should be linked to everything in the present level. So why am I so passionate about the present level of performance? At six years old, this child has had difficulty with socially engaging. This child has difficulty with processing the language. This child has difficulty with processing speed. We have all the different little caveats as to what makes this child different. At six years old, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but now when this kid is 11 years old, 12 years old, and suddenly he's 15 years old, he's in middle school, he's in high school. In fact, the, um, the, um, the uh, disability law clinic here in University of Richmond, we have a little case study that we go over and, and um, this boy is found with a backpack full of drugs and it's not his, he's clearly on the spectrum. It's not his, the police approach him and they ask him questions and he nods his head. He, you know, he smiles uh, and turns out that this little boy has autism. He has a slow processor, but he's a compliant kid. And nowhere does it say, I mean, in the report it says he's a slow processor. He has autism. He doesn't understand social engagement. <laughs> Police approach him and suddenly he's answering questions. You know, you know he's being Mirandized. You know, how slow do we read that? You know, not too slow. It doesn't say here, please read slower for me because I, I, I need to you know, cut down by about 50% speed. We can go back and say, look, we've known that this kid had a problem. We know this kid doesn't always understand social cues. We can go back and say, this has been a history of rather than just being, oh my goodness, how convenient that he has autism and he's a slow processor. So I, if we have it there, we have a documented trail um, year to year progress. People look at the IEP as a, as a static, here's my IEP for today. I want to go back and look at it for two years ago, three years or four years ago. Does this IEP match what his current goals are? Or unfortunately, in more situations than not, the rubber stamps. It's the same goals and objectives from the year before. And I will tell you that even though you don't, you can't change IQs, you can change achievement, you can change behaviors, what interventions work? The scientific method, method is, is um, baseline intervention data. The IP should be using the scientific method. You know, it was about 20, 30 or more years um, ago um, that, we came out and they're being advertised as, as a scientific method. It's almost like, you know, when they came out with, with, with potato chips or, um, or even water, you know, water contains no cholesterol. It's a great marketing device, but you know, a scientific method and, and the reading program said scientific method, that means pre and post testing. The IP is pre and post testing and we should be using it in such a way Unfortunately, the folks who are writing IEPs don't have the time to go over each individual item within an IEP, and that's our job. When I get called in as an expert witness, and I'll talk to an attorney or an advocate, let's look at all the data. I want to follow a path. There is a really nice web of information for us. 
Oops, okay. So I'm preaching that we have data. Even if the child has not been found eligible for special ed, even if the child has not had testing, there is data. And that's not just on Star Trek. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's at least two eye rolls today. So th there is data there. If you're in first grade, you've got a plethora of data, the report card. The report card has grades. The report card has attendance. The report card has teacher comments. The report card has work habits. You know, doesn't work well with his peers. Can you straight A's and B's? Doesn't work well with his peers, is inattentive. Or you see a report card with lots of absences and lots of tardies. I want to know that. I want to look at what happened from year to year. The report card tells you what school the kid goes to. You're in third grade and you've been to five different schools. That concerns me a lot. I want to know what's going on. And there's an inconsistency in terms of instructional delivery. Comments. I love the comments. The first comment of the, of the school year says, love having Jonathan in my class. The last comment is, have a great summer. Marking periods two, three, four, and five tell you everything, have him work on reading, have him work on reading comprehension, have him work on self-control, have him work on not talking to his neighbors. That tells me a lot. I want that annotated information. We have group testing. Starting in third grade, we have group testing. Let's look at the group test. How do we read the group test? Everything's in percentiles, and we're gonna walk through that in a minute about how do we look at group tests? That information is invaluable. People don't look at it. Usually they wait until high school and they get placed into the, you know, the, um, into the college bound or not the college bound classes, but that's very useful. I wanna hear about achievement and behavior. Tell me about how this kid behaves. Oh, he's lovely in my class. Really? He's been, re he's been referred to the office three or four different times. When is he lovely? I am all, I'm all about finding when the child behaves properly. I like the positive behaviors, but tell me about the stuff that he doesn't do well. Um, I want detail. Teachers know it, but they're afraid to put something in there. You know, and so at, at, a, at, a, at an IEP meeting or a child study meeting, and I have you know Mrs. Smith, you know, I, you know, talking about you know just sitting there as a teacher and she's nodding her head and agreeing with everything. And I'm going, you know, Mrs. Smith. You seem to, this, some of these difficulties seem to resonate. Could you talk to me? Tell me what you see. The minute I say to her, tell me what you see, the floodgates open up and we get the real kid. Because everybody else just goes in to observe. There are many times I've gone into schools and I observe for an hour. I'm a visitor. I'm a guest. I get the honeymoon for about an hour. And then from that, we get a functional behavior, a functional behavior assessment. And that doesn't tell me anything. I want to hear from the teacher that sees them from day to day. I see a kid whose behavioral behavior is horrible this year, and last year it was fantastic, and the year before it was horrible. Tell me about that teacher where he was well behaved. What was her approach? What can we learn from that? Everything is a learnable, teachable moment. One of the people, one of the things I have the hardest difficulty with is diagnosis or eligibility for kids with autism. We have a multitude of tools out there. One of the tools, most of the tools that people are using are quick and easy, and they're like the Gilliam Autism Rating Scale, the um, the the um, can't think of the other one. Um, but nevertheless, that is a they are checklists. They are they give you a basically a checklist, a a a, a guess a guesstimate. Are there oddities? But if anybody is working with kids with autism, I put up the, the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. If you don't have that, you don't have a detailed evaluation. And that is the gold standard internationally. And if anybody wants to talk more about the ADOS and what the ADOS looks at, you can give me a call. <clears throat> People who are trained to administer the ADOS have to go through a trainer. In the state of Virginia, right now, we only have one trainer. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the thing is, you know, I'm looking for more and more people to become more expertise. Again, teacher report and comments, we talked about that. Tell me about social understanding. You know, I know that the state of Virginia now has diminished capacity and that's based upon cognitive ability. 
But what about diminished social understanding? If I don't understand the rules of, of typical social interaction, I've got a problem. We have a young man, or you, we have a young man, and he's been taught to make eye contact. So they make eye contact. So I'm taught to make eye contact. So I come over to this young lady and I'm making eye contact. And I'm making eye contact, right? And about five seconds ago, I got kind of creepy, right? <laughs> Which means she knows me well. But the point is, I am told to make eye contact. On the other hand, when you make eye contact, you, you, you make eye contact, you look away. You may look at the hair. You may look at the nose. You may look to the back of the room and back in. But if I'm staring, you know, at 18, 20 years old, I come across as a predator. And there's no predatory intent in any of that, but I was told to make eye contact. So we want to document, is there any, anything different with social understanding? People on the spectrum have a lot of pedantic thinking. They are, you know, rule governed. You know, I had a six-year-old who was in a very advanced uh, high school, um, a, a very advanced private school. And the teacher decided to be creative one day and rearranged the tables and chairs. That's really cool. And he tolerated it all the entire day. When the class was leaving, he barricaded the doors and said, yeah, you're not leaving until we put the tables and chairs back. Rule governed behavior. You can, you can interpret that as being this is a, a behavior kid who's pretty you know, controlling or I liked it the way it was. Don't change things. We're going to get out of here at 8.05. We're going to take a break at 8.05. It's now 8.07. Excuse me, teacher, you're a liar. Because you said 8.05. And that's what we see in kids on the spectrum. Um, you know, Hank and I were talking the other night about some of the um, um, hidden, hidden, hidden diagnoses and hidden disabilities. It's like, these are hidden because that kind of behavior is interpreted as a significant emotional disturbance. And it's like, no. He wants his world even. The biggest problem we have with, with, is with young females, you know, teenage, you know, emerging teenage females, because they like their world a certain way. And when they can't have their world a certain way on the spectrum, um, then they look as kind of pre-psychotic. We can't really give them a psychosis diagnosis until their later teens or early, early 20s. And so is it autism? Or is it psychosis? And we don't know. We're not as good as we would really like to be. Speech language. I love my speech and language pathologists. I think they are, you know, them, they and, and OTs are worth their weight in platinum. But we don't, they don't, we're not giving them all the tools. You know, we can talk about articulation. We can't form the words. We can talk about receptive language and expressive language, getting our words out. But pragmatic language, we don't do enough with pragmatic language. People don't understand pragmatic language. I mean, what's really nice in here, if I tell a stupid joke, I get an eye roll, you understand pragmatic language. But these kids don't. I had a young man who was being treated, who was being treated for like 20, 21 years old, being treated for depression. And um, his mother said to him, so, so Jason, why are you sad all the time? Because, Mom, it makes me really sad that you think I'm going to kill you. That's a horrible thing to hear. And she said to him, Jason, why would you say something like that? I have never thought that a day in my life. He said, well, Mom, you're constantly saying to me, Jason, you're going to be the death of me yet. Chuckle is fine. I chuckled too the first time I heard it. But this is what he heard. That's the pragmatic language. Understanding the underlying intent of some of the language. So, and then look at social history. Let's look at past testing. Let's look at IQ from last year. Let's look at IQ from the year before. Do we see changes in numbers? And then we have to look at medical records. You know, one of the things that bothers me an awful lot is that we go through the entire child study process. We go through all the testing and somebody's, and, and, and eventually after you've given the IQ test and after you've given achievement testing, then we test visual acuity. Then we test hearing. It turns out the kid needs glasses. Do we retest the child? Should, but that should be one of the first things we do. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. This is gonna be statistics 101 and I need to check my time stuff because I do talk a lot. Um, okay, we're good. So when we talk about standard scores and this is where we get statistics and data, 
data does not lie. And I'm gonna show you a chart in a minute. An average IQ, an average standard score, an average skill level in any academic area is 100. So if you see a standard score of 100, tells me the child is average. On any given day, there's a degree of variability. And this is where you can make yourself much more effective. Understanding this chart, in fact, I'm just gonna take a chance. We're gonna go to that chart in a minute. And uh, I'll make sense out of it in a moment, but it went backwards, that was really good. Um, but Carl's there already ready to pounce when I screwed up, so it was good. So when, we, so when we look at a range of average, plus or minus 15 points from 100 is average. If you know this, you have enough information at your disposal to start asking questions. I am not a mechanic, but I have enough, I have the ability to ask enough questions of the mechanic to let them know that I'm inquisitive. I have some knowledge base. I'm going to start asking questions about my car, about what, you know, you know, um, what's going on with my car, the sound that I'm hearing. I'm just not going to take them at face value. But a score of 85 of, of, of plus or minus 15 from 100 gives us our average range. Anywhere between 85 and 115 is average. That being said, if we have a score of 85 on one test and 115 on another test, that's a 30 point difference. That's a 30 point discrepancy. The question is, is there a level of significance in that range? I've got to stand here. Okay. What we are looking for is a significant difference. I have the word standard, devi standard deviation is plus or minus 15. If we see a difference between scores of more than 15 points, that is statistically significant. It's not just a large difference. Don't use the word large difference. Schools want to hear significance. And 15 points is one standard deviation, and that is significant, statistically significant. What you'll also see on different tests that maybe you'll see scores of 8 to 15. And those have a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of plus or minus 3. Same scale, different numbers. But be aware of that. We have, you know, the range, I'm going to talk about the ranges a little more, but, you know, a low average, high average, and, and just plain average. Anything below a standard score of 70 is what we call the intellectual deficit or intellectual delay. I'm sorry, there are those kids that have intellectual disabilities, and those numbers don't necessarily lie. Making sure, though, that it's a true score. I had a youngster who was Actually, in this situation, um, child was trying to get into the advanced academic placement class. And he came up with scores, oh, around 100, 110, which is nothing to sneeze about because that's a pretty bright kid. But he wasn't strong enough to get into the, the advanced academic placement class. Turns out he was tested. His parents wanted to get him tested and you get a new score. And he had pretty profound ADHD. Put on medication. Retested two weeks later, his IQ score went up by 20 points. It wasn't because the medication made him smarter, but he had more he had more access to his overall intellectual ability. If we have a kid who has significant emotional disturbance, if we have a kid that has ADHD, we have other complicating issues, don't take the score just and you know, you know, just as you know, this is what this is what the psychologist told me. I want to ask questions. You know, how do you feel when you have a when you have a middle ear infection? You have a head cold. You have allergies. You are not on your best performance. I want to hear if this kid's on his best performance or not. Um, one young lady I had, you know, I worked in a um, children's psychiatric hospital, and <clears throat> I tested her, and everybody had her intellectual disability. One day I walked in. I was a new person. I am and was old, still am. And, um, and she, and she kind of liked me. I was like kind of the grandfatherly type. And she worked with me. We did testing. We got a, a receptive language score of about 105. Tells me, this kid's not intellectually disabled. This kid it does have some significant emotional problems. He's been in, in the last five years, she's been in 12 different foster homes. She's not that emotionally stable. But, you know, she, I did see a really nice score. The next day I went onto the unit to get her tested again. 
And she started screaming bloody murder. That doctor's mean. I hate him. He's mean to me. And I wasn't going to get any new scores. But I do have one score saying that this kid is somewhere outside the ID range. So what I'm going to try to do, and folks who are on Zoom, I am, I am I'm sorry, but you should have a copy of this. You should see this PowerPoint. And um, Carl tells me that's not going to show up enough, but um, I have my own. So when we look at this chart, is there a way of blowing this up, Carl? I want to get the top thing blown up if at all possible. Okay. Okay. So wait. I can wait. I love that. Oh my God. How'd you do that? Right there. Perfect. I love this man. So when we look at this chart, these are the standard scores right here. And y'all can see my, my, my laser beam. Mine's better than yours. And so if we look at this, this is a bell curve. And here's our 100. Here's our 85 to 115. And this is our average range. And you'll notice that 86% of our population is average. If we looked at more standard deviations, 115 to 130, all you did was add, a, add or subtract 15 points. This is our high average range. Um, and that's only about 15% of our population. Our low average range is 85 to 70. Again, it's 85% um, of our population. Anything below 70 is our deficient range. Anything above 130 is very superior. You just now know more than half the people you're going to be dealing with. Now, how do we put it into practice? If you get scores that are percentiles, my little chart here does convert things over kind of nicely to the, the standard scores. So how do we use this? Can we do the same thing, just move down so I can see the right side, please? Perfect. Oh, I lost my box there somehow. Maybe we can leave it the way it is. So we're going to look at IQ scores. Understanding IQ scores is really important. The way we learn is we went through verbal and nonverbal. So if I want to test your verbal skills, I'm going to say some things to you. I'm going to ask you to repeat them. I'm going to ask you to give me vocabulary. I'm going to ask you to have a conversation. That's verbal. Your, your, your hands tied behind your back. Your eyes can be closed. It's all mouth and ears. Com and conversely, there's nonverbal. No talking, no language. Show me, you know, do some comparisons. Do like a matrix. Do a comparison of, and people who are taking pictures, if they want to email, I mean, I will send you a copy of this. So, um, in, in, a, in a much better format. I saw you. <laughs> This is why I like live, live better than Zoom. Because people on Zoom, please do that same thing. Um, and I'll send you the information. Anyway, when we look at the nonverbal, it's how do I do well? How do I do with the visual stuff? Let's just say you go to a country and you don't speak the language. And how do you try to communicate? You use gestures. You use facial expression. As I go around the room, I see people's faces. I can read your faces. Each and every one of you have communicated with me non-verbally. You have that ability. Kids with a learning disability, 80% of them are the language-based ones. So you're going to see lower verbal skills. 20% of the kids who have a learning disability have weaknesses in the non-verbal area. Those are the ones we typically see as Asperger's or non-verbal learning disability. But we want to do a comparison of the two scores. The thing to be very careful of is... If I take the verbal score and the nonverbal score and I um, average them together, I could get a score of 66. 66 is what range? Intellectual disability. But if I have a verbal score of 60 and a nonverbal score of 85, even though it may it, it, it may average to a score in the ID range. That 85 tells me this is a kid who does not have intellectual disability. Does he succeed in language and verbally? Absolutely not. But I want to capture the part of the brain that, that works really efficiently. I'm going to start asking that question. You're not going to be instant neuropsychologists. You're not going to be instant diagnosticians. But you now know to ask the question. Which I'm going to show you in a little bit in the IEP is that when I... I got, an, I got a, 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 on the IEP, there's an IQ score in there. And there's nothing in there about nonverbal skills. They just, for some reason, did not put 
do that particular test. I don't know why. I want the psychologist to put in report why they didn't do that section or report that. They didn't. So we're going to compare those two, and then we're going to look at IQ versus achievement. If I've got a kid with an IQ of 65, which is intellectual disability, and I see achievement in reading being about a 55 to a 60, well, you know, they're performing where they would be expected to because I'm looking for that 15 point significant discrepancy. But if I see a kid in reading who's got a 55 um, standard score, but in math, they now have a 90, it's like, I need to pay attention here because a kid who has intellectual disability is not going to get a 90. So there is one of those, aha, let's look at the IP. Why are we seeing these scores? If I see a kid whose overall IQ is a 60, and he's getting A's and B's on his report card, I have lots of questions. I'm not going to accuse anybody of anything, but I have lots of questions to be asking. The other thing is I want to look at achievement. Is the reading and the, and the math and, this, and the spelling and the written language all within the same range, or is there a great deal of discrepancy? And is there a discrepancy from first grade to fourth grade to fifth grade? I want to do a comparison of all the scores. When I'm called in as a, 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 an expert witness and I have the attorneys come in and, and, and get prepped, I want them to know that. I want to let's look at the discrepancies. You don't have to have the answers. You need to have the questions. When I go to meetings and I was talking to one of my friends over here yesterday, it's, like, it's not important to be right. It's important to get it right. And by asking the questions, you get it right. Okay, so what are the implications? The implications are eligibility. Where are we going with this kid? Is this, I mean, the different disability categories, we have other health impaired. We have emotional disturbance. We have autism. We have learning disability. We have, you know, visually impaired. We, we, and we have a, a plethora of eligibility considerations, but I want to know where does this kid fit? And, and the bottom line is, as an advocate slash facilitator, I told some of my friends last night, I don't like being called an advocate because an advocate just says, we're going to get into a fight. I want to be a facilitator. I want best practice and interventions for this kid. At the end of the day, I want proper interventions. I want to be able to ask the question. I, don't, I never get into a fight. No matter what school system I go into, particularly even throughout the state of Virginia, they love me because I don't get into a fight. In fact, you know what? <clears throat> One of the things I've told our law students every year to year, and it comes across as being rude, but I'm from New York, it's okay. Um, I tell them when you get to a school, get to a meeting, shut up. Be the last person to talk. Because if you're the first person to talk, you're going to be spending, you're going to spend the entire meeting defending your perspective and your opinion. I want to hear what's going on. I'm going to ask questions upon questions upon questions. And suddenly, when they start talking about how this kid has difficulty on the playground. And then we ask him socially, how is this child? And they say, oh, he's, he's socially, he's perfectly fine. But you just finished telling me that he had difficulties on the playground. Let's talk about that. So I'm using your word, not mine, your words to tell me what you saw. And I will tell you that when I was growing up, <clears throat> my father had a temper and the person sitting to his right at dinner was in the death seat. So you are unfortunately in my death seat. And I apologize for picking on you. My father's no longer around, so we can't prosecute him anymore. Um, I also want to look at manifest, manifest determination. Are any of this child's behaviors that seem to be illegal a manifestation of what we see in terms of a disability? And by putting as much detail as we can in the present level of performance, we have him protected. Don't tell me he went up to Johnny and, and threw something at him. If four or five other kids are doing the same exact thing and he's following the lead, well, he should know better. It's like, you know, he, he has a learning disability, he has autism, he has emotional disturbance, whatever it is, don't assume everybody knows better because not everybody is wired the same. Again, we talked about diminished capacity. There's data there. There's great data. And if a kid has not been tested for an IQ, let's go back and look at school records. This kid is getting D's and S. This kid is getting really poor percentiles on all his standardized testing. You know, what data do we have here? 
I can tell you a lot about a kid by just getting a set of records. What are the social limitations? Does he know how to play with other kids? Well, he's constantly putting his hands on other kids. For those people who have never read the book, Look Me in the Eye by John Elder Robeson, it's a fantastic book to read. John Elder Robeson um, got diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of 40. John Elder Robeson is a person who created all the pyrotechnic lights and exploding guitars for the singing group Kiss. Man was just absolutely brilliant. But when he was little, before he was diagnosed with autism, he knew that you need to have certain rules to play on play in the sandbox. And you need to follow my rules for the sandbox because I'm very rule governed. And that wasn't working out so well. He wasn't very popular. And so he learned that, you know, dogs like me. Dogs smile and wag their tail. And they wag their tail and they smile at me when I pet their head and I rub behind their ear. So if I do that to other kids, they're gonna like me. Well, that doesn't work so well, but now he's being accused of putting his hands on, on and, and touching other kids. You know, so look, you know, what is the diastasis to him putting his hands and touching people? Um, and then slow or limited processing. You know, I start off the conversation today about how fast I talk or how slow some of you listen, um, especially if you feel from Kilmarnock. Um, a friend of mine is from Kilmarnock, that's where I came from. Um, but, um, but people don't always listen as quickly as we talk. The gift of time is the best gift we can give anybody, but we don't always do that. So let's talk about limited processing speed. And, there, and there's testing and there are numbers there that tell us about it. So it may, it may very well be the kid's not very focused or attentive um, <clears throat> and they need to get their frontal lobe you know, warmed up and, 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 get, and get on, um, uh, get, you know, uh, on you know, turned on. What we want to look at is if AIP is going to be effective, let's compare from year to year to year, not continually reporting the same scores. And the scores don't have to be scores. They can be report cards, information from the school, teacher report, teacher be, uh, behavior report. You know, is there information to compare one year to the other? And what are the differences? And then we want to integrate all this information and make it uh, comprehensive. Okay. Not doing too bad. Uh, I have what, another two hours for this? Kidding. Not really. Um, okay. What do the scores mean? Let's know what the scores mean. Go in there knowing and explain to the parents that this is what the scores mean. If you don't know what a score means, ask. Let the school know. I don't know what this means. Can you explain it to me? Can you explain it to the parents? Do we need a functional behavior assessment? People don't usually do a lot of functional behavior assessment, but if there's a behavioral issue, what is contributing to that? What is the trigger for the functional behavior assessment? Don't tell me you're gonna go in for an hour and observe the kid, because you're gonna get nothing. In fact, if I've got a kid in third grade and he's been in school for two months, I don't need to even look at the kid. I can bring all the people working with this kid and triangulate all the information. What do you see during math? What do you see during reading? What do you see during you know, during history, why don't you see the problems that they're seeing? And let's, it's not making you a better or worse teacher. I want to know what's impacting this child. Is it the beginning of the day? Is it the class right before lunch? Well, maybe they have, you know, <clears throat> maybe they're hungry, their blood sugar level is low. I want all the information. Is it because one particular kid is picking on them? You know, <clears throat> my wife she keeps on telling me a story over and over again and over and over and over again. Um, She's not here, so I can get away with that. Um, but she said, when she was in camp and she didn't know how to swim and she was trying to learn to swim and she couldn't learn to swim, kids would make fun of her. So she told her parents about a terrible stomach ache she had. And so they took her to her for a whole GI series. Turns out she just was having this somatic response to kids making fun of her, you know, at camp with, 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 you know, with swimming. Had they asked what's going on in camp and really did a functional behavior assessment, they would have realized somebody's making fun of her. So we need to look at that functional behavior assessment and do it thoroughly and get somebody really skilled. Don't just hire somebody because they're gonna come in for an hour and do a functional behavior assessment. You really wanna turn it around. Um, and you know, are we looking at altering our interventions? You know, we've done it this way for the last two years. 
still not working. Maybe we need to revamp everything. Maybe we haven't gotten it right. It doesn't make you an inept educator. It makes you a skillful educator when you say, this is not working, let's try something different. Paradigm shifting. Anybody has the opportunity to meet um, Barry Hewitt, he's a school psychologist in, in Hanover County, and I, have, I have no problem giving him a shout out because he and his, his staff many years ago were looking at autism versus emotional disturbance. How do we differentiate the two? There are those kids that show significant signs of emotional disturbance. On the other hand, is it because of autism and the misunderstanding of social cues and social, so, you know, social mores? And then... There's an, and then taking the IEP, IEP developers and holding them accountable, not holding them, holding them. Somebody didn't proofread that. Okay, so let's play for a little bit. Carl, can you bring up the other? Carl, can you bring up the other? We're going to look at an IEP, and I want you to play with me. So this is a child who's 12 years old in the sixth grade. And um, okay, we're gonna go. So the, on the first page, can we make it bigger? Okay, so the first thing that we see on here is that this kid has an, a, a disability category of other health impaired. So to me, I hear other, other health impaired. I'm here hearing, you know, is there, is there some kind of brain infarction of some sort? Is there ADHD? I don't know what's going on. Is there seizure disorder? I don't know. I wanna know. So I want my IEP tell me what's going on. So I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna go to the next page, okay? And in fact, we're gonna go to, keep on, keep on. I want that page. Yes, keep on going up. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's, let's, can you all see that? You can make it bigger if you can. Oh, it's okay? Well, I, need, I need this. <laughs> okay, so tell me, and this is a group discussion. Tell me what you see about the scores and what you think. Does this kid have intellectual disability? Look at all the scores. We're looking for anything below the score of 70. And comparing them to herself. Phonological processing um, is at 58. How about the other scores on top? What I want you to be looking at is this score. Verbal comprehension is an 86. But going back to your point of phonological processing, we have an 86 all the way down to a 58. Quick math tells us that's a 28 point discrepancy. Oh, good, thank you. Still love this man. Um, so we have a significant discrepancy. We even have, we have a lot of scores in the 60s, 70s and 50s, but the 86 says there's something in that brain that says this kid is not intellectually disabled. I love that 86. The question is, what does this kid do in a nonverbal domain? There's a test called, you know, there's perceptual reasoning or nonverbal uh, non um, IQ. It's not up there. And this particular test, the Wexler, does have that scale. It's not reported. And I go back and look at the reports, it's not reported. So that's one of my first questions. Why isn't that in there? So then we move down. If we can go to the next. Yeah, that one right there. If we can. So I'm going to read that out loud if you can't read it. But this says, um, the child came willingly to the testing session. She was cooperative throughout the exam. I'm going to just so, I'll keep on going. When compared, right there, it's good. When compared to the scores earned by others at, at the age level of achievement, it's very low range of 40 and academic skills, 40. Ability to apply those skills of less than 40. Fluency, less than 40. So academically, this kid is drowning. Compared to her IQ of 86, this kid is really struggling. So one of my questions is, I mean, today you know what a standard score of 40 means. I'm the parent. I don't have a clue what that means. When you tell me there's a standard score of less than 40, 
you as an interventionist, what are you going to do? You're going to give us, us um, you, you're going to give us um, interventions that are going to be above 40? I don't know what that means. I just made that up. I don't know what that means. I want a descriptor in there. I will tell them, I will ask the school, this kid's skills are really significantly delayed, but tell me what that means. Does that mean that the child can read words but doesn't comprehend? You know, reading comprehension versus word recognition is a difference. I can read a foreign language fluently, I have no idea what I'm reading. So there's recognition versus, versus comprehension. These are weaknesses, but this doesn't help me develop an IEP to know where I'm going to start working with this child. I want to hear what the teacher is saying. Um, one of the things I'm going to advise you to do when you look at an IEP, I want an error analysis. Describe to me the nature of this child's weaknesses academically. Tell me what kind of mistakes this child makes. That's one of the biggest concerns I have. So then, um, if we go down to the next one, it's a, a paragraph three. And here we, we see a sign says here that she gets extremely frustrated when she does not understand the concept or she answers incorrectly. Struggles to work independently daily and sometimes requests that to perform tasks for her and requires prompts. Um, that's great. Give me a little more detail. And this is just the preliminary stuff. Um, she, she, she benefits from guided reading strip to help her focus on assignments. So the question I have here is, is this because she can't read or she can't focus? There's two things in the same paragraph. Give me a little more. I'm going to ask questions. You said she has difficulty with focusing. Is this by in nature ADHD or is this by in nature um, a learning issue? So, and by the way, feel free to ask questions. Um, if we can move on to the next page, which is going to be page four of 28, Carl. Okay, so here's present level of performance. So this child has been at, can we move up a little more? As far as we can, do we get to pre the word present level? Good, okay. So this child has been identified with other health impairment and is not working on SOL curriculum. Other health impairment. Okay. Um, I've been watching Dancing with the Stars and she just gave me a 10. <laughs> huh? But the question is, tell me why OHI? It could be a number. Go ahead. This is the IP team. You can ask anything you want. There's only one bad question. When you go to a meeting, there's only one bad question at those meetings. And that's the one that's not asked. That's possible. They're going to ask questions because then they're just like, I don't know, like, especially like saying, you know, because you're talking about ADHD. You can't like, why not? You can ask anything you want. This teacher can ask. Do you think the child, I mean, if the school system suggests that the child that ADHD, ADHD, by the way, is believed to be a clinical diagnosis made by a physician, but the state of Virginia has a, 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 a other health impairment, ADHD worksheet that's put out by the Department of Education. And so we can start looking at, does this kid qualify under other health impairment under ADHD? But So that's the first question. Is it ADHD? I don't know. Kid can have seizure disorder and have other health impairment. I don't know. But when we're, when we're deconstructing the IP, we see that that is a question mark. And I want that answered. Nowhere in here, I mean, in the eligibility, it might be in the eligibility, but most people aren't going to go back and look at the eligibility. They're going to look at the present level of performance because this is a document that uh, moves with them from year to year to year. So, but absolutely ask, the, I mean, that's what I want you, that's what I'm trying to arm you all with. Ask the questions. If you don't get an answer, then we need to find a way of getting that answer. We're not going to accuse anybody. You should know better. Let's find the answer. Um, so if we can go down to the next paragraph where it says, um, let's see, 
No, that was it. Don't go back. Good, thank you. So when we look at this, this child has relative strengths in the areas of vocabulary and oral comprehension. I would like to know where we got that from. You know, where's that? I mean, if we're going to put that in there, let's reference what document we're getting that from. Doesn't mean they've done anything wrong, but I want to have a. I, I I would like to have a map as to where it's coming from. We're going to continue with. Um, if you look at the here, due to very um, due to very slow processing information, depend on a frequent prompting and review of concepts while completing classwork. Socially, she chooses to interact with the same core group of peers and seldom ventures her beyond her comfort zone. We're now talking about something socially. My my autism radar just went up. It's like we're talking about social. She doesn't venture out. What's the cause of that? You know, what's contributing to that? I, I have some questions about that. And then I want to go back and I want to look at the report. So what I did was when I saw that, I'm going, I mean, I've got a whole stack of stuff here. And I went back and I looked at my information and Problem is, I can't read my information. I went back and looked at a report from a few years beforehand. And in a previous IEP, two years beforehand, one year beforehand, it says that she was administered the Gilliam Autism Rating Scale. You don't give somebody the Gilliam unless you're suspecting autism. And in this particular report, it says that she has a very high likelihood of having autism but it's never considered anywhere. So as we keep on moving along and I'm running out of time, I'm gonna to wanna to leave time for questions and, and questions and answers. The one thing I don't see in this is how is she doing on her report card? You, you know what her skills are. You know what her IQ is looking like. When I go back and look at her report card from the year before, in English, first, some, first nine weeks was an A, Second nine weeks is a C, and she ends up with a final grade of a B. Huh. Geography, she ends up with a B. Health and PE, an A. Math on, on grade level, a B. Um, science, she, you know, that, that, that she bombs out and she gets a D and an F. But I'm going, how is she getting Bs and Cs? Is this kid on grade level? I want some, some discussion about. Is she on grade level? What do the B's and C's mean? What are my expectations as a parent? I had a young lady in one of the city school systems who, sweet, sweet child. And the parents were sure she was, she was getting all A's. And she was sure, the parents were sure that she was gonna be a doctor or a lawyer, but she had an IQ of 60. And she spent most of her time under the desk, but she was a sweet kid. Not that I want to give kids D's and F's, but I want some qualifiers saying this is what's going on. Anyway, I have about two or three minutes left, um, and I'm hoping this was helpful. We could be doing this for the next two or three hours, but are there any questions? Go ahead. Behavioral needs and things like that. So schools, I've seen where schools will say, well, they don't, they're making, they're making good grades, especially when it comes out of eligibility. They're making good grades. Whatever's going on with them is not affecting their um, education. No, they do not qualify for uh, special yeah. education services. Branch that gap. I mean, everything that you said yeah. today, that's really, that's got my, my head yeah. spinning on, you know, so how do we branch that gap? One of my heroes is Lieutenant Colombo. We just ask lots and lots of questions. The people with the gray hair know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but Colombo is a detective, played by Peter Falk, and he just asks a lot of questions. And the way I would approach it, like, gee, you know, she's getting all these A's and B's, and she's got an IQ somewhere between 85 and 58, and the IQ says academically she's everything, you know, you know, below a uh, standard score of 40. How are, how are we equating those two? You know, how, I mean, are the, are the grades being um, adapted for her ability, you know, adapted? Are these adapted classes? Can we talk a little more about it? Because if it is, I want it in the IP. I want her protected. You know, when we, when we get her into high school and she's getting A's and B's and meeting at a second or third grade level, and she goes out and commits a crime because she has no other means of supporting herself, 
We created that school to prison pipeline. Good question, yeah. Somebody else? I was just going to say, I was looking for the lowest score for the test and, and talk about the discrepancy. Well, okay, this kid is making all A's. I have an IQ of 135. Um, why in the biological process is it having a PA? You know? And it, it seems to be ignored a lot. And I'm like, like it's the elephant in the room. How is that and, and, and that's the question. And when you ask a question like that, I would hope that when you finish the meeting and they have minutes in there, that this question was put on the table. We're going to investigate that. They may not have an answer, and I'm okay with not having an answer. I am not okay with um, I'm not okay with just leaving it on the table and letting it die. But put that you know, ask the question. The other thing I do is is I ask the parent, why are you here today? You think there's a problem. Well, the kid comes home every day, throws up and hides under her bed. That's that is learning. Learning causes this reaction. Something that school caused this. And the school would say, school and the school would say that's an issue at home. It's like you know what? If this is contributing to a home situation, I don't want in two or three years from now for it to escalate to something that prevents them from going to school. So I'm going to stop here because I because my friend is coming up and. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be around until about lunchtime. We can talk. You can give me a call. We can talk. Uh, one more flex question. No, I'll, I'll you. Okay. Hopefully, this worked out well for you. It is pretty perfunctory, but you know, there's a lot more to it. Um, so she's only giving me that one. Thank you so much, Dr. Geller. Uh, next, we have our first practitioners panel on understanding the IEP with Courtney Pugh. Sarah Plattenberg, Latonia Slave, Hank Boston, and moderated by Melissa Wong. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to be here with you to talk about IEPs and especially to follow Dr. Geller's great presentation. And uh, my name is Melissa Waugh. I am a special education attorney with Dalton's Law up in Northern Virginia. And uh, I have with me, I brought four of my colleagues and friends uh, to come talk to you guys about um, what it's like actually sitting around the IEP team meetings and some of the issues and concerns or hot topics uh, that we see in our everyday practice. And I'm just going to briefly uh, give you everybody's name and where they are. Yes, thank you. Uh, where they work, we have uh, Hank Bostwick. He's also an attorney. Special, uh, he does a little more than special education, but he has focused on that for many years. He is a uh, new lead with the Legal Aid Justice Center. In November, obviously. He will be starting. And uh, then we, next to him, we have Latanya Slade. Uh, Latanya is an advocate. Um, she is with the company Full Potential Education Advocacy and Consulting, and she's in the Tidewater area. And then we have Sarah Plattenberg, also an advocate. Uh, Sarah practices in Virginia, but also several other states as well. So she has broad experience there. And then we have Courtney Pugh, who is more in Southwest Virginia. Um, her company is Four Peaks Educational Consulting, also an advocate. And together, I was trying to calculate my head. I think we have a little over 75 years of combined experience sitting around IEP tables. So hopefully we can give you a few golden nuggets to take home today. Yeah. Um, but but truly, folks, I mean, this is a this is a group of rock stars, and please check out their bios, but I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, I did really quickly want to uh uh and drop that down. Uh, there are a few little things, little nuggets, golden nuggets we put in your handouts that we're not going to address in detail, but check it out if you need it. Um, one item is what I call the pre-IEP meeting worksheet. Uh, this is a, a worksheet that you can use doing intake with a client when you're preparing for an IEP meeting. It's just some things to be thinking about. Um, I also included Another little tool, it's called the IEP meeting worksheet. It is a chart with all the elements of the IEP and questions and things that to be asking that you've obviously discussed with the client in advance, but you can take this into a meeting with you. Oh, are my slides not up? Oh. Uh, actually, if we could just go to that, actually go back to the slide you're on, we'll start there. Can I move them with the right to left arrow? Okay, good. All right, good. Now I can get back where we were. Um, sorry about that. And uh, But these are in the box that everyone should have been given access to because there was a question about whether you, you're not going to have it on a table anywhere. You have to electronically access this. But I just wanted to point out that these things are in there. They're tools that you can use if you choose to. 
Um, but the idea is this is something you take into the meeting and it kind of helps keep you organized and on track to make sure you're covering all the issues that your client wanted to get addressed. Because a lot of times we run down rabbit holes and, and whatever. And, and so this kind of can help you stay on track during those meetings. Okay. Uh, also, a copy of the PowerPoint slides is in the box um, that you can access electronically. We're not going to go over every single slide. Dr. Geller covered a lot of this. I just wanted to make sure you guys had it in one um, easy place to access. Uh, but as we all know, uh, the IEPs are a product of a federal law called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. Yes, I understand that it spells the word idea, but I'm telling you, nobody in the field calls it that. It's IDEA, so a little, little tip of trade there. Uh, and the one thing I want to point out about the IDEA, and because it's something that I always myself try to keep in mind before going into these meetings, is why does the law exist? Why are we here? And it all comes down to the purpose, and it's right there in the law. And the purpose is... Uh, to make sure that we're emphasizing special education and related services designed to meet a student's unique needs to prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living. It's not just about academics, folks. It's about the whole child. And so that's what the law says, and that's what we need to be sure we're advocating for in these IEP meetings. But again, the key to um, uh, effectuating the purposes of the IDEA is the IEP, the Individualized Education Program. Some people call it PLAN. You're going to hear it both ways. The law says Individualized Education Program, but both are fine. All right. Uh, I'm just going to scroll through this part pretty quickly because Dr. Geller covered most of it, um, but the IEP is actually a written document, and it's developed by a team that includes the parent, and the parent can invite whoever they want to come to that team meeting. They can invite an advocate, their attorney, their next door neighbor, they're allowed to invite whoever they need for support. Because I'm telling you, as a parent with two children with special needs who are 18 and 19, so I've been on this path a long time, uh, you know, you go into these meetings, it's one parent, and you've got 10 or 12 school staff there. Um, so it can be a little overwhelming. So yeah, they can take whoever they want with them into these meetings. Uh, and the whole point of the IEP is that it is to confer on the child a free and appropriate public education or FAPE. That's how we refer to that, but free appropriate public education. And how do you know if, the, if, if this IEP is conferring a FAPE? Well, there are legal standards. It doesn't say in the, I, in the IDEA, right? But now the Supreme Court has, we have two big cases, Rally and now Andrew F, that have kind of fleshed out what it means to confer a FAPE. And in Andrew F, uh, prior to this Supreme Court decision, many jurisdictions relied on more than de minimis progress. So schools had a pretty low bar. <laughs> it just had to be more than a de minimis amount of progress, and that's good enough. Um, that was uh, evolved out of rally. And then the Supreme Court said now that the IEP must be reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So you have to make a prospective uh, judgment based on where the child is today, which you're going to know what that is by looking at the PLAF or PLOP, but it's that present levels of performance section of the IEP. And that's where we're going to know where the child is today, and we need to make a prospective determination of of what is reasonable for this child to achieve and accomplish. Um, and then uh, the other important thing that came out of injury is that the goals in the IEP have to be appropriately ambitious, right? It's not, you know, we want to make sure that it's more than de minimis progress. We want to help these children, you know, do more, develop to the greatest extent that we can. All right, I'm going to skip over some of these. Dr. Um, Geller did a great job on present levels of performance. So, um, but a couple of hot topics that we've noticed in, um, in this area, teams failing to update the test data, leaving out test data, um, just had a case where they just um, completely misconstrued test data. Um, you'll get a giggle out of this, Dr. Geller. You know, we had a standard score of about an 80, 81, and that was defined in the plot as average. But you see why, they, I mean, but what does a parent see? Huh, nothing to see here, no problem. It, it's just very misleading. So as advocates, we want to make sure that that the plop is complete and that it's accurate. 
Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Hank. He had a few comments he wanted to make um, in his experience. And so take it away. Yeah, thank you. So Dr. Geller, you did an amazing job talking about the importance of the evaluation process, but there are a couple of interlinked legal concepts that we need to talk about, right? And so one of those is the concept of child find that I'm sure that you may have heard of in your studies, education law, special education law. And that's the obligation of a school district to, to identify all the children with disabilities within its jurisdiction and to identify and then assess to determine their level of educational need. One of the things that Dr. Keller uh, focused on was the idea that we have to evaluate the children in all areas of suspected disability. And so the suspicion of a disability can come from a number of locations. I really wanna draw particularly the law student's attention to DB versus Bedford County School Board. It's out of the Western District. It was a case in 2010. And not only is it a great like primer special education 101 and the way Judge Moon wrote his opinion, but it all also gets to this direct issue of suspected disability. This was a child, black kid, came into the district pre-kindergarten and where kindergarten and was reading at a pre-primer level. By the time we caught the case when he was in fourth grade, he was still reading at a pre-primer level. And Judge Moon wrote that this was one of the saddest cases of social promotion that he'd ever seen. But one of the crux of one of the legal issues, and there are many that were dealt with in that case, was that there was a mention of MR, now intellectual disability, during an IEP meeting that, that this might be something that is impacting the child. Well, that was never followed through in the evaluation process or anything else. And so as a result, there was an incomplete picture or profile of that student. And when we start with an incomplete picture or profile, then we're not going to be building from the ground up the foundation for that education. So you did a great job about talking about the timeline for the evaluation process. But one thing I wanna mention is that there is a mandatory triennial evaluation every three years, but a school division can evaluate a child yearly. And in fact, a school division can evaluate a child more than yearly if the parent and the school dis district agree. And this is often done when you administer a set of assessments and then there are, all, are alternatives to those assessments. So you can't necessarily test Dr. G right within the same year using the same instrument. But if there are alternate instruments within the same sort of panoply of testing that you're doing, then, then, then you can use those, right? We have, we talked last week in our presentation about uh, students who are passed along through the evaluation process through a procedure called the READ, R-E-E-D. And so if you'll look in the fine print of the IDEA, there is the review of existing evaluation data. So a school division in cooperation or agreement with the parent can elect not to do any new additional testing, but simply review the existing evaluation data that they have at the moment and then use that as a basis to go forward. Practice point, advocacy point, right? <laughs> the school division has to inform the parent of their right to have that full tri triennial evaluation, right? And to forego the read process. Read process can direct where an eventual evaluation will go, particularly if we're talking about identifying all areas of suspected disability. But once we move forward with the evaluation process, doing simply doing a read, we're not going to get the present levels that we need. Um, one thing also, and I think you'll talk about it later, is the ability to request an independent educational evaluation if the parent does not agree with the school district's evaluation. And when a school district presents an evaluation, you'll often hear from the school board side, well, we didn't evaluate in that area, so you're not entitled to an IE. My opinion, and I think it's supported by the case law, is that when the division presents an evaluation, they're presenting a full and individual evaluation. It's not, the onus is not on the parent to decide what areas that the student is evaluated in. That's way beyond the ability of advocates and attorneys even. So a parent is not the one responsible for identifying the areas of need, it's the school division. So when a school division hands you an evaluation, I believe that an IEE provider can test in areas or evaluate in areas that even the division didn't pick up on. Yes. But that's a controversial subject. Yes. Um, also, we want to make sure that we are evaluated in area, all areas of academic, non-academic educational need. And that's a phrase that I repeat over and over again, because often educators, well, there's not an academic problem. Well, there are tons of things mm -hmm. that students pick up in the school in in the school experience that are not necessary at the academic educational achievement or educational benefit. So we have to look out for that. Um, 
Also, the PLAF, as we mentioned earlier, is the heart of the IEP. Mm -hmm. So as a litigation strategy, what I do, if I'm preparing for due process or if I'm trying to put together a demonstrative exhibit for an IEP meeting, I will take the PLAF statements from year to year using a P, you know, PDF editing tool, and I'll actually cut those out. And I've even put them in my due process hearing complaint so that the hearing officer can see from year to year, there has not been much change or there's surplus language that no longer applies that's been carried over from present level to present level year after year. And so that really is the only way that we could prove regression, stagnation, lack of progress is through the use of those statements. Tried to keep it at 120. Good. But I don't, I don't we only had 30 minutes to cover like a million things. Um, yes, Latanya, please pop in. Yeah. Um, just to say, I'm Latanya, just to say one quick thing for the from the parent standpoint, we may not have the verbiage or know, you know, what type of tests to ask for. If you see that your child is not able to do something, whether it's academically, whether it's socially, whether, I mean, in any area, you can ask. For them to be evaluated in that area my child cannot do this i need you to evaluate my child in this area it does not have to be um you know oh that's a great point because you might not necessarily know the name exactly you don't right. you may not know it so you, my child needs to be evaluated and always put it in writing put it in writing whether you are asking it at the aep meeting or whether you are talking to an administrator you put it in writing I want my child to be evaluated in this area. They cannot do this. That is your the parent's key to making sure you keep that paper trail yep. in everything that you do. And just quick follow up um, to what Hank was saying about IEEs, because I've just filed two systemic complaints and per we prevailed on those. And, and the U.S. Department of Education has been super clear with VDOE that absolutely we are not limited in an IEE or independent educational evaluation to only the assessments that the school chose to do. That is now crystal clear. Um, and in fact, we had to change the, the here in Richmond, the legislature changed the regulations for special education to take the word component out because um, U.S. Department of Education mandated that. So we, we do know now, it's it absolutely crystal clear that, that they cannot limit um, the IEE to only the tests they did. And Melissa, I should yeah. have mentioned that IDEA requires, oh, I'm sorry. Nope, nope. Well, IDEA requires that the evaluation assessment instruments be not culturally or racially discriminatory. Oh, so you. we yes. need to make sure that we access resources, particularly in some, with, with, with students of color, there is often over-identification, under-identification in certain areas, particularly are non-native speakers. They are often, as I think Dr. Geller mentioned earlier, they are often uh, diagnosed or educationally diagnosed with a suspicious, sus I can't say the word, an SLD, thank you, right, <laughs> and, and, and reading or reading fluency. So that's something to look out for too. Yep, and Sarah, you had a quick point? Yeah, real quick, um, two quick points, sorry. Um, one is a tool at the IUP table. I request testing, even if it's off um, cycle, and I request that the eligibility is not open, but that testing is done in order to inform the IUP team. Mm -hmm. So that's a way to, to get your information without forcing the issue to open eligibility. In our state, we you know, we have different consent options available to parents, but not all states have that. And so if you open eligibility in other states, there's a the potential you're going to lose eligibility. So one way that I use to get around that is request testing to inform the IEP team rather than open eligibility. And that's been pretty successful. Another quick point um, just piggybacking on what was brought up about litigation and using the PLAFs over time. I actually use that as a strategy before I go into any IEP meeting, particularly with new clients. I take the statements over time and the goals, and I will send that to the school in advance so that there's no secrets, mm -hmm. right? I don't want secrets. I don't want anyone to show me something surprising at an IEP table. So I try not to do that either. And so I will send in advance. This is the data from two years ago. This is the data from last year. This is the current data in the current draft that you just sent me. And these are the goals over time. And here's where we need to go. And so that way, we don't have to wait till litigation. We don't have to wait till get to that place because we know the best work is going to happen. The quickest work is going to happen at the IEP table. So that's just a good strategy that I use. Just letting. And, you know. and, I'll get a jump oh, on that real quick. Yeah, it, it, yeah. 
Well, I'll let you go. I'll <laughs> Sorry. Let you go. Because we're down to 12 minutes, 12 right, minutes, right. my friends. So, um, but, but yes, and to follow up on that, the new regulations um, that say that IEP team, the school has to provide to the parents at least two days before the IEP team meeting, any draft IEP that they create. And the reality is most do create it. There is, they have that little loophole in there, but, um, and that gives us as the advocates a chance to review it, make edits, get things back to the team to review before we all get together. It makes things so much more efficient. Yeah. Good point. But moving on, and Sarah, you are the next uh, one hot topic person, okay. but we are now in the goals section. Again, there's some great information in the slides, review those later. Um, but uh, Sarah, you wanted to talk about a couple of things on the hot topics. I did. For I goals. have so many things to talk about with the goals. So, so <laughs> Dr. Geller did such a fantastic job with talking about data and the importance of having robust data and accurate data and current data. And I would say, and I use, um, I say all the time that the foundation of the IEP is, is the plan, right? If it's broken or if it's not all there, then we can't possibly write a really strong IEP. So that leads us to the goals. The goals are based on what's in the plan. And what I say to my clients all the time is that you should be able to draw a line from the plow, from the areas of need directly to the goals. There should be goals aligned with all the needs. And so, like, I think what Dr. Geller was saying is that when there's something missing, right, we could have a big gaping hole in programming. And so it's really important that when we're looking at goals, we're developing goals. We use the term smart goals, right? And that's a pretty readily used term in the world of education. Um, and so I know Melissa has a slide up here, right? Yeah. So, um, but we want specific goals, right? Specific goals are the key. I say all the time in IEP meetings, what is the, what is the actual skill that you're targeting? If I don't know what skill you're targeting, oh, 10 minutes left. Oh my God, we have yeah. so much information to cover. I'm feeling stressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, okay, I'll talk really quickly. Extra time accommodation. Oh, yes, you did. It's an extra time accommodation. Yeah. And I was going to request right. visuals. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll talk quickly. You did such a good job talking so quickly. I'm from Chicago and I usually talk <laughs> fast. And now I feel like I'm like an slow. <laughs> but I okay. think you had one other quick point, just like 10 okay. seconds. Okay, quickly. So goals, you need to be able to draft your goals so that we know what skill we're looking at, that they're measurable, meaning how many times are you running the goal? I say to teams all the time, you can't run two times the goal two times in a quarter. And then for us to know that the kid made progress or not, right? You want lots of data samples. You want eight, 10, sometimes 20, 10, sometimes 30 data samples. The school will always push back on this, but it's really important to know whether or not the programming is working. Um, and the only way to do that is to have enough data samples, right? So you want that embedded into the goal. You wanna know the accuracy rating, right? Of whatever the skill is. So is the student gonna do this five times at 90% accuracy? Okay, well, what does that really look like, right? We don't want 75% accuracy. I see this stuff craziness all the time. And I said, that means 25% of the time, the kid's not doing it. So if 25% of the time, the kid isn't able to read, then they're missing 25% of the curriculum. What are you talking about? Right? So we have these conversations. So important. Um, and we talked about, um, sorry, now I feel like, oh, achievable. Um, I, this is really important. The goals have to be achievable. What I think is achievable is sometimes very different than what the school is, thinks is achievable. So I pull up always pull up the state standards. Oh, okay. So you think it's not achievable, but this, that the student's going to write a paragraph in a year's time, but right now they're writing three sentences. I think it's pretty achievable, right? That they're writing maybe a multi-paragraph paper at that point. What's the state standard? Where are we trying to go? So you want to ask all the questions like Dr. Geller was saying, like ask all the questions. Where are they now? Look at the work samples, figure out what's achievable, figure out what's working, what's not working. Is this working over here with Mrs. Smith and you know, with Mr. Thompson, you know, what's going on with, with the student in each of the classes, um, talking about objective. Oh, I want to do one more thing. I, I, right. Can we let Courtney talk a little bit? I, I'm so sorry. It is the worst to be cut off and not be able to give the information you prepared, well, but I want Courtney to have a chance to talk about, <laughs> I'm so sorry about services and accommodations. There's just a couple of quick points. I know you wanted to make on the services and, um, section. Absolutely. So the services section, I don't have the benefit of Dr. Geller talking about it first. So 
some of the things that we're seeing that are trends that are going on is the changing of the language that is being used on the services page. It is not just reading instruction anymore. They're now calling it specifically designed instruction. That doesn't tell the family and it doesn't tell you what kind of specifically designed instruction this child is receiving in that classroom. They're also just labeling as general education classroom versus a special ed classroom. Well, if we're talking about a student who on placements, we're talking about a self-contained class, or are we talking a resource class? Families need to understand how the service is being delivered to the child and where it's being delivered at. Another trend that they're doing right now is they're changing and they're not writing the minutes of the service delivery as far as a weekly, but now they're doing it for the whole reporting period. So you're sitting with the family and they're like, they get 900 minutes of speech for the, you know, for a reporting period. That's not a lot of speech. When you figure it out, you know, 900 minutes by nine weeks is 100 minutes a week. That would be like 10 minutes a day if they had that service like that. And when you count, like, for example, November, December, there's not that many weeks in the month. Where is that service being delivered? And more importantly, when you have related services such as speech OT, if they're getting that service delivery, how many other students are in there receiving it at the same time? Mm -hmm. Because 30 minutes of speech sounds really good mm -hmm. if it's just me receiving it one-on-one. -on -one. But if I have everybody in here and, and Hank's working on articulation, we're working on conversation goals, where are we getting that direct instruction that is related to our IEPs as, as, as our person, not as a collective unit? Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times they're trying to build these to Medicaid and to other places. So those service logs, going back and seeing how much time this person is saying that they're working with your child can come back because I've actually had them write it where they were, you know, giving services on Thanksgiving Day. Really? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> and, and the last final thing that I, I really would put out there is the fact that services and accommodations are for extracurricular and after school activities as well. So, for example, in my own life, my child had a vision impairment. He was on the robotics team. They did not want him cutting his fingers off using drill presses and things like that. He had a one-on-one -on -one aid after school that attended the robotics program with him. Some schools will push back and say, oh, well, that's after our teacher's work hours. Doesn't matter. It's extracurricular activity sponsored by the school system. They have to provide the service or the accommodation for that. 30 seconds there, I'm done. Yeah, good job. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> Wonderful. And Latanya, you had a couple quick um, uh, hot topics you wanted to address related to accommodations. Yes. Okay. So uh, some you'll see that uh, you'll see an accommodation or a um, goal where it puts the, what? You're good. Oh, no, you, you're good. <laughs> it, you, the burden is put on the student to ask for help yes. or to request an accommodation. Okay. First of all, you'll see this more in middle school and high school. Dr. Geller mentioned this, and I, I made a note of it. If that student has diminished capacity, do they know how to do that? Do they knew, know how to ask for it? Do they know how to self-advocate? We have to make sure that the student is taught first how to do something. If it's going to be a goal, okay, the goal is that they do it. However, there needs to be language, specific language, that it's going to be taught to the student how to self-advocate. What does that look like? We have to make sure that that is in the IEP. They will be taught how to do such and such. It could be before the goal is, I mean, if our goals have to align with our PLAF, they don't self-advocate, okay? The goal is to self-advocate. What's the first step? We're going to teach that child how to self-advocate. And then we're expecting them to do at, at a minimum, raise their hand or, you know, it has to be specific. Um, so the language has to be added to the IEP. We cannot leave the student out of the conversation. You have to ask the student, how can we help you? Does what we're doing right now, does this help you? Most of the time, I can tell you, I've heard so many times, no. Okay, so what do you, what would you like to see? This, this, and this. Okay, that's what they want. That's what we put in it. Don't leave the child out of the conversation. This is about their life. Mm -hmm. So if they're able to sit there and, and listen and be in the conversation at a minimum the, as an advocate, I want to talk to the child and say, so what do you need mm -hmm. at a minimum? So I can go in there and speak for the child. And I will say, this is what Johnny or Elizabeth said they need. This is what they said works for them. And this is what does not. 
because I want the team to know that this is not me. This is not mom, dad. This is the child who's asking for this and it needs to be included in their IEP. You can go as young as you need to go, but you still need to ask. Thank you, LaTanya. And I'm so sorry, we're going to have to skip over our hot topics for placement and transition, which is unfortunate. But again, for the advocates out there, people working and going to these meetings, these hot topics, just take a glance at them because it just kind of gives you a clue, a little flag of something to be aware of in your meetings and to be able to address. The last thing we absolutely wanted to get to today, because um, basically the IDA cr creates two incredibly powerful tools for parents. One of them is the independent educational evaluation that we talked about before, which um, the U.S. Supreme Court said in Schaefer v. Wiest gives the parents equal firepower. All right. The Supreme Court understands there is an imbalance, a huge imbalance of power between the parent and the experts, the, the school. Right. So it's the independent evaluation that helps balance those scales. The second most powerful tool that we have, particularly here in Virginia, and it's not the same in every state, is the ability to um, provide partial consent. Virginia is what we call a full consent state. In other words, the IEP cannot be changed without the parent's consent. Eligibility cannot be changed without the parent's consent. That is incredibly powerful. And the way we leverage that is with partial consent. And I like to tell, especially the advocates that I advise under me in our firm, that think of partial consent as maintaining the status quo. You can't add things to an IEP with partial consent. But what you can do is you can prevent the loss of something important. For example, if the school, the kid has been getting an hour of speech language therapy a week and has been making arguably some progress, but now the school wants to cut the speech language therapy, typically with no data to support that decision, in my experience, the then point. with partial consent, the parent does not consent to the removal of the speech language services. And therefore that portion of the IEP goes into what we call stay put, which is a much broader definition in Virginia because of these consent powers that parents have, right? And that, and, uh, and that allows the, that part to stay in until it can be resolved. And uh, again, some golden nuggets that we have in your box of materials, uh, one of them, is uh, one of them is an FAQ from Virginia Department of Education. You can't get it on their website anymore. They refer to it, it exists, they admit it, but you have to contact people and whatever. It's in the box, save it, download it, keep it. It's a golden nugget. And the other one is um, I put a sample in there of how in our firm, we do partial consent. We literally use Adobe Acrobat. We put it right on the IEP. We X out in red. I consent, I do not consent because they don't, Virginia IEP, the, the state's new system doesn't give you an option for partial consent. I don't think schools want you to know, all right? Because it is such a powerful tool, but parents have it. We want you to know they have it. Let's use it to help protect um, services and supports for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, panelists and our wonderful moderator. We will now have a break until 1020. Okay, everyone, if we could all please grab our seats so we can get ready for the next session to start. Uh, next up, we'll have Valerie Slater, and she is presenting the troubling intersection of race, disabilities, and youth incarceration in Virginia. Ms. Slater leads the Rise for Youth Coalition and advocates for the rights of system-involved youth. Additionally, she has also worked to protect the rights of children with disabilities in community, residential, and juvenile justice facilities throughout the Commonwealth. She has also worked at the Disability Law Center of Virginia and has dedicated her life's work to the advocacy in its many forms to preserve and protect our most valuable resource, our youth. Please welcome Ms. Valerie Slater. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. As you've all just heard, I'm Valerie Slater, and uh, yes, I am the Executive Director of RISE for Youth, and RISE stands for Reinvest in Supportive Environments, because we believe first and foremost that prison isn't the place for children, and the best way to keep them out of prison is to ensure that we are providing them with all of the resources that they need, that we are prov providing supportive environments for them to be able to find their path, because every child is unique. And so therefore their paths are also unique. 
in the best way to ensure that they are successful, that every demographic of children is successful, is to be individualized in our treatment of them. I'm so excited to see such a room full of some familiar faces, but folks who care about our children. So what I'm gonna talk about this morning is race education, disabilities, youth incarceration, and how all of those things are working together and in some instances causing great harm to some of our children. So I'm gonna start with this thesis statement that I want you all to consider. Black youth with disabilities in Virginia are receiving a diminished level of support to access their education. They are disproportionately pushed out of school for their behavior because they're not seen as children in need of support, but rather as bad seeds that need to be rooted out. And they are disproportionately entangled in the legal system, experiencing the harshest outcomes at every stage of criminal legal system involvement. So we're gonna start right there. I'm gonna give everybody a moment to just kind of ingest that because that was a lot. So now during this presentation, we're gonna explore these interconnected components of race and disability and incarceration. And we're going to discuss, first I'm gonna learn to use this. So if I could learn how to use, there we go, there we go. I wasn't pushing hard enough. There we go. So we're going to talk about all of these components and how they interact. And if we've got some time at the end, I would love to entertain some questions. Okay. So the problem, not surprisingly, begins at school. Now, that's not ignoring the environments and the home situations that children are coming from. That's not what I'm saying. But once the child enters the school system, that's where we should be putting into place the supports necessary for kids to be successful and even reaching back into the home if need be. And, you know, as we get further, I, I'm going to let you know that I am not looking for teachers to do it all. Okay. I am not of that train of thought. I actually believe that we ought to be resourcing schools in such a robust way that there are teachers that are teaching, there are support staff supporting, there are counselors counseling, there are, uh, there are psychologists or whatever, whatever other level of support necessary doing their part. And there are even home care workers who are reaching into the homes and providing supports there because unfortunately now we have so many children raising children. And so oftentimes our education system is called upon to do so much, but I want you all to know, I, I just really need to drive home the fact that school teachers should not be doing it all. It's a collaborative approach. And because the school is where we have that first real connection to children, and that's where we are not only giving them the academics, but we're giving them the social and the emotional learning, then we need to make sure that we're doing it in an effective way so that they are going to be strong, robust, contributing members of society when they leave. So when we look at the number of Black children in Virginia, that school age 6 to 21, that only makes up 20%. But 27% of those students are students with disabilities. And now Virginia, our disability pop population in school is 13%. So when you consider that Black youth make up 27% of that, that's a significant number. And we've all heard the rhetoric that says the prison industrial complex, it looks at third grade reading scores. We've all heard that, right? Third grade reading scores and then we're ready to start building prisons. Well. That's not exactly how it goes. What really is happening is that if students aren't able to read by third grade, if they haven't caught on, then they are more likely to drop out. And if they drop out, then guess what? They're more likely to then be involved in the justice system. Also, if they aren't reading at level at grade three, then it's harder for them to catch up. 
And if they're not catching up, then they may be acting out, not necessarily because, well, you know what, I just want to cause trouble, but I don't fit in. Everyone else is getting it and I'm not. And so then they end up receiving disciplinary actions uh, uh, beginning against them. And so it's this horrible cycle rather than shoring up their skills and making sure that they are able to catch up. I need to catch up with my slides. I wish I could see it in front of me. I would do better. <laughs> but what I wanted to show you here on this particular slide is that So first of all, the four categories are, there is below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced. Those are the four reading categories that are measured. Now, for Black students, 57% are below proficient, below. And 75% of all students were, with disabilities are below basic reading proficiency. Now think about all of the things that happen when kids can't read. This is fourth grade, so we've already passed that third grade mark. But fourth grade is where we had that first SOL, right? That's where we start measuring. So if these students are below proficient, then guess what? They're the ones that potentially might be acting out. They're the ones that potentially are going to be targeted for, okay, we've got to do something with this one, right? We've got to do something with this group because they are disrupting the classroom. And then when we look at the proficient children, only 15% of Black students and only 8% of students with disabilities are actually proficient. That's, that is sobering. What are we going to do about that? So I know I made that inference earlier that there was a direct correlation between fourth grade reading proficiency scores and high school graduation rates. So now let's look at it. This is the graduation data. So we were talking about kids in 2021. So this is the 2021-2022 school year that we're looking at here. So the graduation with a standard diploma. And the reason I target the standard diploma is because that's the one that's going to lead to higher education. It's the one that's going to lead to, I can go into something vocational and just kind of move on and be successful. And so let's look at those differences. Here we see that 91% of students without a disability graduated with a standard diploma, but 39 there's a 39% gap between Black students with disabilities and those students, all students with no disability. But then even when you look at the students who are not Black with disabilities, even that number is closer to students without disabilities. Isn't that something? Why is that? Why is it that there is such a gap between, first of all, the students with disabilities in, in general, that 30 point gap, that's sobering, isn't it? 30% difference, but then add almost another 10% if you're a black student with disabilities. Mm. <clears throat> so now we have talked about the educational attainment. And we talked about how if you can't read, then you're more likely to get in trouble. So now let's start talking about expulsion and suspensions, okay? Now, you'll see that I have put up the 2023, 20, 22-23, but can I just share with you that 21-22 numbers were uh, similar, if not worse? Just, But I just wanted to give you, <coughs> excuse me, I just wanted to make you aware that this is a problem that is persistent. It isn't going away. Look at the number of Black students, 21.7. That's how many Black students were enrolled in Virginia, 21%. But look at the short-term suspension and the long-term suspension. They were 46.5 and 51.7. 
So when you are only 21% of the population, but you are carrying double, almost triple the burden of these suspensions and expulsions or the short and long-term suspensions, once again, let's go back to the reading scores. We aren't reading at third and fourth grade. And now we see that it's playing out, that discipline is pushing you out of schools. Let's look at expulsions. Still, they're 21%, but 44% of the expulsions. Now, they don't disaggregate the data, so I can't tell you how many of those Black students were also students with disabilities. But if they're only 21%, we don't have to wonder, or it's not a stretch of the imagination to imagine, right, how many of those students are also Black students with disabilities. So why is it important, once again, that students who aren't able to read, who are not accessing their education, and who are being pushed out of school is for suspension and expulsion, what's next? What's happening to these students? What, is the, what are the implications of expulsion? Now, I could read this, but I'm going to let y'all read it because you'll have these slides, but you know, kids that are getting pushed out, they are not being involved in the justice system. Isn't that what we said? I've already shared that. Is there any doubt in anyone's mind that if a child is not where they ought to be, they might be in trouble? And, and, and that's just children by nature, leave them alone long enough and they will find something to do and you're probably not going to want them to be doing what they're doing. That's just children. And so imagine children that are frustrated and they're angry because they have been pushed out of school. They aren't able to access their learning. And now they're being told that you don't fit here either. So juvenile intake cases. Y'all know what intake is? That's when kids have come into contact with, they, they've gotten in trouble in some sort of way. And now they have been referred to the court service unit because someone has uh, filed a petition for them to now be involved with the system. That's called an intake. So let's look at the number of intake cases. We've got 2021 20, and 22. So the numbers for black and white youth are pretty close with uh, white youth kind of a little further ahead, right? But then, we have to decide who we're going to detain. That petition has been filed and you're gonna determine now whether or not you're gonna hold this child pre-adjudication before we decide what we're going to do with them in court, whether they are going to um, be held because of a uh, post D. I'm not gonna get into, the, into all of those different categories, but who's gonna be detained? Let's look at that. Something's happened here. Now the numbers have changed. It's 37% white youth that are being detained and 55% black youth that are being detained. What happened? Now, two slides back, what one of those bullet points shared that children are pretty much getting in trouble. They're, they're doing the same things at pretty similar rates. So but the detention rates have changed here. Who's being held has changed. Now, this is just detention. Let's look at who has gone all the way through the system. And now we're looking at who has been committed to the Department of Juvenile Justice and will be held in, in some sort of a facility or has gone to the deepest end, if you will. The numbers have changed even more significantly. Now we're at 71.4 and 23.8. What happened? We have got to do something about these disparities because if children with disabilities, if all children are pretty much getting in trouble at the same rate, if they're even intake cases are happening at the same rate comparatively, but then when we look at who's getting detained, then the numbers begin to uh, deviate significantly. Something is wrong. Let's talk about why kids are incarcerated. Now, these are the deep end kids. So 
out of the 4,226 youth who were detained, I'm sorry, that's not the one I wanted to share, 49%, 49.6% of all of the kids who have been committed to the Department of Juvenile Justice are there for stealing crimes. That's burglary, larceny, and robbery. Stealing. Can I share something with you? The majority of the spaces where kids are coming from are profoundly burdened with lack. Profoundly. I do not take lightly the actions of children when they are doing what they should not. Please don't misunderstand me. But profound lack plus children might equal these kinds of behaviors. The second largest category was assault. And so we are incarcerating children because they are stealing and because they don't know how to manage their emotions and keep their hands to themselves. Again, not making light of the harm that children have caused. But when you look at these numbers, we ought to be concerned that, you know, those really horrific things like murder, sexual offenses, those aren't the highest. Stealing is the highest, stealing and assault. Something's got to change and it's got to be the way that we are dealing with the needs of children so that they learn how to manage their emotions and so that they are not profoundly burdened with lack, not knowing how to deal with their emotions and then sometimes being left to fend for themselves and figure it out for themselves. So in essence, more than 70% of all of the incarcerated children are there once again for stealing and for assault, over 70%. Do you wanna hear another staggering statistic? We're not even doing a good job at rehabilitating because more than 70% of them end up back at the three-year mark. And that's not rearrested, that's not recharged, that's reconvicted. So we're not even doing a good job of rehabilitating these children. So what are we doing? When we think about education, and I know I'm flipping back for a moment, but we spend, and I'm going to be generous, 13000 at most per student for education in Virginia. That's very generous. You know how much it costs to incarcerate a child in our JCC, our prison, Bonaire? over $250,000 a year. 13,000 versus 250. When we consider where our heart is, when we consider where we are spending our resources because we want to invest, are we really willing as a Commonwealth to invest more in the prison system that is failing than we are in the education system? Shameless plug, I am for the one pot system where we put all of the, the uh, tax money into one pot and distribute it evenly across the Commonwealth so that every education system is just and, and full and robustly funded. I don't believe that we should have some localities where students have a set of books at schools and a set of books at home and a laptop and new multimedia systems and some school divisions the books are falling apart and there isn't even enough for everyone to have one. So teachers are Xeroxing copies of pages to hand out to their students. So if we have those kinds of disparities in our education system, how can we expect anything less than those same kind of disparities in the way children are being processed through our justice system? Again, talking about why the disparities exist. Kids are in trouble at pretty much, let's see, they're doing the same things, but Black youth are two and a third, 2.3 times more likely to be arrested. 
And if arrested, they are going to be treated more harshly in the system at pretty much every point. Why? Black youth are perceived as more culpable and as older. Look at those numbers. I, I, I just want you to see what this is saying. This first in column A, it's showing you what age are these children being perceived as. And we see that for white youth, they're perceived as a little younger than they are, right? Even for Latino youth, it's a little younger. But look at Black youth. They are perceived as more than twice their age. This, and so here's the shocking part. This survey was given to undergrad students. But then culpability, meaning likely to commit a crime, guilty if, if, if charged. Again, white youth less culpable. Gratefully, black youth, the, the, the uh, percentage of more culpability is smaller than the age overestimation. But again, for Latino youth, it's pretty much the same. Yeah, you, you probably did it because you probably did, right? Now, let's look at those impl the implications of this for Black girls. The adultification of Black girls. Now, that bottom line, the reason it's flat is because we're just looking at how we compare the age of Black girls to white girls at all of these different points. <laughs> But look how troubling that is. From zero to four, we have already uh, jumped up a half a point in considering the age. But look at that 10 to 14 age group. Look how much older folks are perceiving black girls than white girls. And if you're older, then of course you're, you're more culpable. You're less innocent. And the way this information, and I hope you take the time, you'll see that the website for every place that I got this data, it's at the bottom. Please go to these sites, look at this data, see that I am not taking it out of context. This really is the way of our country right now. But if you are older, you are more than likely, you understand what you've done. You did it, right? That's the way we are perceiving children. And here, here it plays out, right? And I recognize that this is 2013-14 data, but the problem is that it's the same. I just wasn't able to find this data as cut and dry like this. And so I want you to see that when we look at the suspensions of girls, we'll see that Black girls, 15.6% of the population, but 52% of the suspensions, why? When we look at uh, the, the black girls on this side, this is referral to law enforcement and in-school arrest. Again, only 15.6% of the population, but 37.3% of those referrals and arrests at school. That's what happens when you look at a child and say you're older than you really are. Therefore, you understand more than you really do, and you are more culpable than even your age would suggest. You know, whenever children are processed through the system, the first thing we look at is whether or not they're competent to face the charges against them. Meaning, do you understand the charges? Do you understand the process of the court? Are you able to participate meaningfully in your, uh, your defense? If we are thinking that children are older than they actually are, then we're going to answer yes to those questions more readily, whether they are or aren't. So what about Black boys? What is the implication? When shown photos of white, black, and Latino boys aged 10 to 17 alongside descriptions of crimes, undergraduate students overestimated the age of black boys by an average of four and a half years and found them more culpable of crimes. Why? 
how did we get here? How did we get to this place where we are so quick and easy, we so quickly and so easily will see Black children as older? Now, this quote was taken from research published in 2014 by Philip Goff and others, and it was entitled, and it is entitled, The Essence of Innocence, Consequences of Dehumanizing Black Children. And it consists of four studies of police officers, college students, and they find that Black boys are as young as 10 may not be viewed in the same light of childhood innocence as their white peers. Instead, they are more likely to be mistaken as older, perceived as guilty, and face police violence if accused. Face police violence if accused of a crime. And this research provides evidence that these racial disparities are predicted by the implicit dehumanization of Blacks. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. I am not attempting to, to uh, make this a racial presentation. But what I am trying to do is make everyone aware of what is really going on when we have children being processed in schools, in discipline in schools, being pushed out of schools, and then that have engaged in some behavior that has them now in contact with the criminal justice system. If we don't take the time to recognize these realities, we are not going to make meaningful change. Because can I share with you that all of the changes that we have begun to make have had a greater impact on white youth than black youth? Until we recognize these realities, grapple with them, and do something to change them. We'll continue to make some progresses, but they are. But the disparities won't go away. The gaps will actually begin to widen, and ultimately, we are trying to bring justice for all youth. We are trying to bring equity so that every child has access to education. Every child is able to graduate, get across that stage, be celebrated by family and friends, move on to have meaningful and productive lives. And who should we want that more for than our students with disabilities? Yeah, I, can I say, I don't really like the word disability. I don't like it because it, it, it brings about a connotation in our mind less than when it actually is different ability, differently abled. Reminding y'all again, the consequences of exclusion. When we push kids out, these are the things that happen. So given the near universal protection that society attempts to afford children, why are Black youth so vulnerable? to being treated as adults. That's what we've got to grapple with and change. So we've talked about the kids in school and whether or not they are being successful. We have talked about the push out and we have talked about involvement. Let's tie it all together. So when we look at the treatment needs of children who are incarcerated, more than 90% of all admitted youth appear to have at least one symptom of ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, CD, communication disability, ODD, operation, uh, oppositional defiance disorder, or a substance use disorder, over 90%. Over 70% of them have, had, have been prescribed a psychotropic medication. Over 70% of them are displaying symptoms of a mental health disorder as defined in our DSM, I don't know, number, whatever number we're at right now. <laughs> Over 70%. And that is excluding the ADHD and those others. And more than 30% have current psychotropic medication prescriptions. So again, if the majority of them are Black, 
and they have been pushed out of school. And we're saying that it is those disabled children that are finding their way into the system. Here are the numbers that demonstrate that that is true. I'm hoping that everyone is just like, really, is that what we're doing? That's what we're doing. That's what's happening here in Virginia. I'm not saying that that's the intent, but that is the consequence. That's what we are. That's what we're doing. So I want to go back to the thesis statement. Can I, can I restate it? I've given you all of this data. Black youth with disabilities in Virginia are receiving a diminished level of support to access to their education. They're disproportionately pushed out of school for their behavior, not because they're seen as children in need of support, but rather they're seen as bad seeds that need to be rooted out. They are disproportionately entangled in the legal system and they are experiencing the harshest outcomes at every stage of legal system involvement. That was my thesis statement. So what are we gonna do about it? Even from the White House, <laughs> I'm not gonna read this, but ultimately what, it's, what, what the president is saying is that we've got to do something about the dis disparities that are that exist in our uh, the way we are treating children in school, the the, uh, the discipline that uh, children are receiving, and specifically, there's been new guidance handed down from um, the Department of Education on discipline provisions and guidance on the protections from discriminatory discipline. Familiarize yourselves. Those of you that are doing this work, familiarize yourselves. Be ready to come to the aid of all students with disabilities, but make sure that we are not continuing to allow the, the disparate treatment of certain children. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we're not asking teachers to do everything. So we've got to be asking for the funding for support staff in schools that will do all of the things that are needed for children to access their education. Isn't that something, isn't that what our IEP is supposed to do? It is supposed to ensure that you are providing all of the supports necessary for children to be able to access learning and so that they can receive a free and appropriate public education. What's appropriate? And I know that's a, a legal question. We could get, really get tangled up in that, but can I, put forward that appropriate means that they're actually able to learn and that if there are things in their behavior that are impeding that learning, that we're going to put into place what's necessary to, to remove those barriers. That if there are things in, even in their home life, you know, we have that thing called a FAPT team. We've all heard of that, right? Help me out with the acronym. Help me to decode the acronym. Family Assessment Planning Team. I've got two of them right. The other two I'd have gotten wrong and I didn't want to do that. Family Assessment Planning Team. You put that together when there are not just behaviors at school, but perhaps there are struggles in the home that are impeding a child's ability to access their learning. What if we flipped the amount of money we were spending on incarceration and education? And we were willing to allow that kind of wraparound to happen for every student. And we didn't have to wait until IDEA was involved to put in place every support for kids. What if? Here, here's the great thing. I may be making suggestions and, and saying what if, but we have, the, we have the ability to fight for and win these kinds of protections if we really want them, right? We can all work together to make these things happen, make them a reality. What if we embraced a village approach once again? What if we said every child belongs to each and every one of us, and we all made it our responsibility to ensure that every child was successful? That's something that we could do. 
as, as an attorney, when I represent a child, I represent the whole family, maybe not in the courtroom setting, but I am looking at all of the potential potential needs, and I am bringing in my partners to make sure that we don't have this child in court again, not for the same thing. If there is a struggle between whatever the struggle, I'm going to make sure I'm going to bring in the partners to help and to support. Some of the programming that we do in Rise for Youth, we have what's called the Youth Development Academy every year. And we collect children, the ones that everyone has pretty much given up on. And we live with them in a retreat styled setting for a week. And we love on them. And we tell them that they can make it. And we give them, we help them to develop a personal development plan. We provide them with a mentor that's going to help them meet the goals on that plan. We take them out to have fun. We introduce them to employment partners. And while they talk about the work that they're doing, we're asking these young people to envision themselves in one of those spaces. We require them to collect public service hours. Go and interact with these employers that you've met. Find where you really want to be. And at the end, we subgrant money so that they can have a six month paid internship with whichever one of those partners they select. This year, we're still in the process of getting all of our young people placed. Two of our young people decided to go back to high school and get their high school diploma. I actually had to put my legal hat on and fight for the, one of the two of them to actually get back in because the school was resisting. But that young person is in school now and thriving. Both of them are. We had, thank you. We had three young people decide, you know what? I can do college and three are in college. We've got a young person who is building out his own dream of a therapeutic cafe. And, and he's going to build this thing with the employment partner. And at the end, when he is done with his internship, you're going to make sure that he has a business plan put together and that he is able to present it to potential funders so that someone can help him get this off the ground. Next year, he's going to come back and he is going to cater the graduation dinner for next year's class. This year, one of last year's graduate was our photographer our paid photographer for this year's graduation. We've got to be willing to do what we're saying, right? We've got to be creative in the ways that we are showing young folks that they do matter. And especially those ones that folks have said, mm, maybe not that one, but you know, even when we put our application out, all of the different places that we go, well, I don't know if you want those kids because I've, I've got some really good kids that you should take. Why is it that we are so quick to want to push? Even when I said we are specifically looking for the ones that have been pushed out, the ones that have had the behavioral challenges. And I'm gonna tell you, we had some challenges. We had some, let me not say all of the different challenges that we had. <laughs> but we had challenges, but we were able to work through them. We were able to show children, no, we're not going to push you out just because you ran afoul here. What we're going to do is we're going to put the supports in place so that you don't do that again. And if we run into another challenge, then you know what? We'll deal with it when it comes. But we believe in these children. Believe, believe in these kids. Believe in them. Believe in their ability to succeed. We've seen some really dire statistics. Troubling. Alarming heart-wrenching. It's up to us to do, to, to, to do different, to make change happen. I did not mean to go off on that tangent. <laughs> there is federal legislation that is saying, let's do better. The Reducing Racial and Ethnic Disparities in the Juvenile Justice System Act of 2022, that has been introduced and it's moving through process now. Become an advocate. If you are not already doing legislative advocacy, consider it. We 
you know what, on the on one of the slides, you're going to see a QR code for Rise for Youth, and I hope you will scan it, and it'll take you to our website, but it, it, it will also take you to our social media so you can see what we're doing, but it's also going to take you to a, a basic history of our legislative advocacy, and we are in the process now of hosting conversations around the Commonwealth. That's what we're calling them, because we're going into different localities and having conversations with community members and young people, and young people. Young people are leading. So every space that we go into, every locality that we go into, we find someone that is hosting young people. They are doing that work with young folks. That's who we partner with. Because while we may be based in the Richmond region, we are a statewide organization. Our next conversation is November 2nd. It's going to be at Hampton University. And we are partnering with an organization, Sister to Sister. And you know that they work with young ladies. And so they are going to be leading that conversation. And we are going to be taking notes because we've got to be sure that whatever we're advocating for at the General Assembly is reflective of the needs, the desires, and the and, and what is the community saying? That's what our legislative advocacy has got to reflect. So again, S4398, take it down now, <laughs> fight for it. The Office of Juvenile Dutches and Delinquency Prevention. Do y'all know what that office is? It's the federal agency that determines how, as a, a, as a nation, we are going to be treating children in our justice systems. It sets the standard, if you will. One of the great things about OJJDP is they are the ones, and, and realize that the feds can't tell us, and the, and the things that we have decided uh, localities or states have the uh, ability to control, feds can't tell us what to do. But what they can do is they can tie money to it and say, if you want this money, do this thing. And that's what they have done as it relates to incarcerating status offense, uh, children with status offenses. And so basically they said, hey, do you want this pot of money? for your juvenile justice uh, initiatives, then don't incarcerate students or children for status offenses. We've created an exception though, isn't that something? The Valley Court Order exception, which basically says if you as a status offender have run afoul of whatever the court, uh, whatever um, stipulations the court has put on you, if you run afoul, then we can incarcerate you for uh, five days. We, we, we found ourselves a little loophole. Take advantage of the office of OJJDP because you know what else they have? They have other pockets of, of buckets of money. There's an RFP out right now that says, if you as a government agency are willing to um, fund NGOs, non-governmental organizations that are doing the work of supporting young people, we will give you this money that you can then subgrant. I don't know how many of you are um, working in government, but you know what? You can take this, even if you're not, you can take this to your Commonwealth Attorney's Office. That's a government agency. Can I toot the horn of the Richmond Commonwealth Attorney for just a moment? They have, they have created what's called the Community Change Advocacy. Oh man, I'm slaughtering it. It's an, it's an agency within the Commonwealth Attorney's Office that is basically ensuring that they are keeping as many community members out of the justice system as possible. They've established a restorative justice um, group, which I'm a member of, <laughs> and basically are doing what they can to divert young people, to divert community members away from the system. So that's an example of taking federal money and pouring it into programs that are not government in nature, but that are supporting the community. And that money has been distributed out towards the uh, Virginia Center for Restorative Justice and other organizations to ensure that they are able to continue doing this work. So, Go to OJJDP's website, look at their funding opportunities and find the ones that you can take. And, and whether you are applying for those funds or whether you're going to your governmental agencies and saying, hey, I'll collect the non-governmental agencies that you can subgrant to. You apply for this fund and we'll all come together and we'll do good in our community and keep as many young people out of the system. 
there's that QR code. So please scan it. <laughs> you will have access to this uh, presentation. But can I just tell you the redefine the vital signs? We believe that we should be taking a public health approach to public safety. And I think I have demonstrated that in the way that I've been kind of talking and putting forward what we can do. But if y'all would please take this survey and you probably know all of the answers, but we have a piece of legislation that we have asked uh, the, we've asked JLARC to do a study and in that study, it would be looking to move the Department of Juvenile Just Justice from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Secretary to, to the Health and Human Resources Secretary. Do you know why that would be important? There's a paradigm shift in the way that you think about agencies in the Health and Human Resources Department, right? There, there, you think about it differently. And that's what we want. We want our children to be considered in need of supports, not in need of criminalization. You know, when you look at Department of Juvenile Justice, when you look at their um, mission to protect the Commonwealth from, does anyone else have a problem with that? The Department of Juvenile Justice, their mission statement to protect the Commonwealth from, that's a problem. We need to reframe to support the needs of is how I think it should start. Connect with organizations doing the work, you know? There's a whole list of them here, and this isn't all of them. But when you get this presentation, there's a link to every one of them. There's a link to them all, whether whatever your passion is, get connected. Start doing the work. And zealous advocacy. You can, re, you can help to reshape the narrative and the legal landscape in these ways. So if you aren't doing special education advocacy, consider taking it on. Consider taking it on. Encourage your, your colleagues to take it on. Support a less experienced attorney. For you attorneys in the room, support less experienced ones so that they can be the best advocate possible. Show up at the General Assembly, show up. I'm telling you what, uh, Rise for Youth and so many other organizations that we're partnering with, we are there all session long and we are fighting and fighting hard and we are asking that you come and help. Add your voice, add the voice of all of those that you know, spread the word and bring your people, bring your people. I am gonna read this because I want y'all to hear it. <laughs> Virginia must begin dismantling the systems that over scrutinize, over criminalize and over incarcerate youth of color and especially youth of color with disabilities. We are faced with the damaging toll the current oppressive system has taken on our youngest residents and their undervalued and over policed communities. Now is the time for bold action that goes beyond acknowledgement and baby steps. It's time for a paradigm shift that demands needed change in policing, school discipline, our legal system, community resource allocation, and that creates systems that move youth from trouble to triumph. A healthy community is a thriving community and it begets healthy families. Healthy families will raise healthy children and they will contribute to building healthy communities. And that cycle as it continues will yield positive results when we seed it with resources, commitment, and love. Virginia, our time is right now. Thank y'all. I think I might have just a couple of minutes, five minutes, if it, thank you. Wait, so I'm a guy who's been special for a while. I, uh, when I first started, I came across the guiding document. We spoke about the guiding documents. Um, we have the Department of Education that puts out this guiding documents. Um, you know, and one that you presented uh, in your presentation today, great. 
But as a student, I was a student also in my master's education law, I learned that these guiding doctors are just basically suggestions. They have no legal uh, strength behind them. What do we need to do to change that? It makes no sense. I can go into a meeting and see, okay, the guiding doctors is this, but the school is not taking that information, what you just put up there, and putting it into action in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they don't have to. Mm -hmm. How can we change that? Changing and making guidance law is a much more difficult matter, but here's what you can do. When you look at the guiding document and you look at what the school division is doing and you look at the results, if you're able to demonstrate that because they are not following this guidance, they are not providing that free and appropriate education, they are falling short, then you are able to write the complaint that says you have failed to provide this thing that the law requires you to do. And then when you start talking about what resolution would look like, you write in the guidance document, the guidance. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dad. I love your music. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I just wanted to Point out or mention, I'm, I'm presenting a little bit later in my interior focus, so it, it really focused, it, it's like the next part of yours. And one of the things I'd like for you to kind of talk about some of the examples that you shared here with us today are very similar to some of the information that Charles, let me get his name right, Charles Hamilton Thurston used, right, when he was collecting information for board versus the Brown education, mm -hmm. right? That, Predominantly for well, black schools at the time they were segregated on points was that uneven funding of resources, right? Like you said, they would get, um, like your example, your white schools back then had the cream crop as a human resources, higher pay for white teachers. So, do you not see <laughs> that this is just a newer form? Uh, the same kinds of segregative kind of behaviors, or even maybe the term I'm not sure if it's familiar with Dr. Love, but that might range the result of integration. Um, do you believe that possibly some of these statistics are a result of them? I do believe that that, is, that does explain partially. I also believe that we have been fed a narrative for so long that um, how many of y'all remember the super predator age era? <laughs> yes. You know, these incorrigible, untamed, wild children who are going to ravish our communities, right? We were taught that. And then even our, our entertainment media began to mirror that, right? When, who, who were the thugs? Who were the bad guys? They were always black and brown folks, right? And so we were fed those images so long that it's kind of just been ingrained. Those were undergrad students that said, black youth are older and are more culpable, more likely to have committed a crime. Those were undergrad students. You know, we want to pretend that the media does not impact us, but it does. Whatever you ingest is going to impact you. And so even well-intended folks who are trying to make change until they begin to grapple with those things, th those narratives that they have ingested and decide, you know what, I, I am not going to subscribe to that. It's simply not true. And I am looking for equity for every student. That's when we're going to start seeing change. And I am at one minute. So this has got to be the quickest question ever. Oh, go ahead. But one of the things that you're suggesting is looking at 504s and, and special education. That is a little concern for me. I'll tell you why in a little moment. When you showed one of the slides that says in mindset of assault and robbery, the 17 years old seemed to have a blink. 17, we saw an increase in that across all the ages. It seems to me that when we get in high school, 
We're pushing these kids out without a lot of skills, and they don't have a lot of problems because we're not preparing them. Special education at 504 is great, but another tool that we have is response to intervention and not waiting to 17 years old, starting in school, finding some kind of intervention now, because we're not just talking about academic skills, we're talking about all kinds of school classes, as well as helping improve the academic status and graduation rate and response to intervention is a tool that we can use. Dr. Geller, I couldn't have said it better myself. We have not taken the time to prepare children, and by the time they get to 17 and they're doing these things, what do we expect? And so you're absolutely right. We need to start putting interventions in place to ensure that children don't get to that point. And with that, I know that my time is up, and so once again, I thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Slater. Our next presentation is our ethics presentation, Ethical Considerations on Undisclosed Classroom Recordings, presented by Chris Kratropia. Professor Chris Kratropia is the Dennis I. Belcher Professor of Law at the University of Richmond. He writes, teaches, and presents. Okay, here he is. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Nicole. Actually, Nicole and Aaron have been doing an amazing job, and I've, I've really appreciated being um, a kind of a, a watcher on um, uh, this morning, um, because I'll just admit um, I, I know a decent amount about ethics. I think it's professional responsibility, um, but my main area of expertise is in patent. So that is very outside what's been going on today. And so um, uh, Carl is my friend since 2006, if I can date us all here, Carl, um, uh, gets me ready. Um, I'm going to play the, the role that maybe this is what Aaron and Nicole wanted to play. I'm going to play the role of the laws, right? So this is the, I don't know how to practice at all. I know what the law is. Uh, uh, and I'm just going to tell you uh, what I think the law is. And then a Aaron and Nicole said, look, I'll just admit, somebody else kind of dropped out. Can you help us out? I live in the building. Um, uh, and so um, they, so there's this, this, this kind of growing, and, and this is not that surprising to me, I, um, mainly because I kind of teach some technology and privacy law, this idea that we, we might have situations where um, individuals might be secretly recording someone else, and this might particularly take place in the school setting. Um, this is not that foreign. I remember the story of uh, Sarah Sims. She was in Norfolk, 2017. Um, unfortunately, her nine-year-old daughter was being bullied at school. She had reached out to the school. The school said, I don't know what you're talking about. Nothing's happening. And Sarah says, look, we've got technology for this. And she's going to hand her daughter a recording device. It says, look, just set this on your desk and we'll, we'll, we'll document the bullying, right? And then they'll know about it kind of one way or another. Um, uh, and um, so her daughter does that, uh, sets it on the desk, leaves it on the desk, teacher picks it up, what is this? And the next thing that's happening is the Norfolk police are being called. And Sarah is brought up on felony six murder charges. That's what we've, that's what we'll find out here in a little bit. That's the wiretapping statute. Um, uh, and this is, a, you know, wait, what are you talking about? How is this? Yeah. Maybe so. Um, and so uh, this is a really real situation. Now, uh, fortunately, the charges were dropped. Uh, this was on CNN, C SPAN, all this type of stuff. Um, and so I think that the kind of Sarah situations are not that uncommon. I think I'm not on it, I'm not clicking. I, I can do it if, if it won't work. I don't want it to play it. I just want to go to the next slide. There we go. And so this is the motivating hypothetical that we're going to talk about, right? The motivating hypothetical is that we've got an IEP and or a 504 in place, right? Um, and we have one of two situations. Either there's some trust breakdown where we don't think the data is really being gathered from the classroom and or the IAP or 504 are not being observed. So we, would, we need to do some taping. We don't trust what the teachers are saying or administrators or having had kids, still having kids, 
I don't trust what my kid is saying at school, right? She says she's not getting it. Is she getting it one way or another? Well, one of the ways that I can just verify this for myself is to have it taped in some way, right? Um, and so then the parent either asks the attorney about, could I secretly record? Or I understand that a lot of times the parent might show up and say, I've got a secret recording, right? Or we might even have the situation where the lawyer as an advocate, I think that's one of the neat things about the discussion this morning, is that lawyers are about law, but they're also about solutions. The lawyer might suggest, I don't think we're getting the straight story. Maybe we should think about a secret recording. This prompts ethical considerations for the attorney. And this prompts ethical considerations for the attorney, not only because if they're the ones advising to do the secret recording, but if they've got investigators, advocates, their client doing it, those ethical actions fall back on the attorney if the attorney's the one giving the advice, right? So there's our professional responsibility. Here's our one hour credit before October 31st, right? Which I had for those in the room that are barred in Virginia, right? A big date. But there's also a concern about the liability for the parent or child, right? The Sarah Sims of the world. We don't want to put one of our clients in a situation where the police are going to be called. And they'll turn to us and say, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't expect to pay for this, right? And so we have these two considerations that are there. So a couple of caveats and limitations. I'm not your attorney. This is not an attorney-client relationship. I'm not giving you any legal advice, one. Two, I really don't know anything about 504, education law, et cetera, although I've had some experience as a parent in that regard. I don't have it um, uh, legally. Right, so take what I tell you today with those kind of lenses. I do have some expertise and professional responsibility. And if you wanna kind of just get a zone out to the end here, the ultimate answer is it depends. This is a real land of law school type answer. And maybe I'm putting this as the punchline to force you to actually have to listen, right? Through the end of this presentation, um, there's also lunch, I guess, that's waiting for you at 1220. So, we have some rules that are at tension here for us Virginia bar members or bar members outside of the Commonwealth. There's rule 1.1, which basically tells us as attorneys, we need to provide right, competent legal advice, right? If we don't provide competent legal advice, we're not meeting our professional rules. And not only does it have to be competent, we need to be diligent advocates for our clients. This is always the two that I think a lot of students in particular, maybe lawyers too that are out there, right? When you're shying away from the ethical line, in some ways, 1.1 and 1.3 are pushing you to get closer, right? Because you're trying to help your client. What pushes on the opposite side of that, particularly in this circumstance, is rule 1.2. That is, when you do engage your client, you don't give your client advice to do illegal things. Makes sense, right? The other thing is there are third parties that you are going to interact with. And we are, some maybe say we are not, we are a profession. We are supposed to act like professionals. So we're not supposed to be nasty to third parties if we're not needing to be nasty to third parties. That's a real kind of bastardization of 4-4. And 8-4 says, look, even if you're not doing something illegal, you shouldn't really engage in deceit, right? Trickery things that just don't look good on the profession, and that's our 8.4 misconduct. And essentially, there's this tension between these two when we think about the idea of an undisclosed recording. And so, I being a law professor, right, we always want to kind of look at the actual rules, right, competence here. I've got to have competent representation. I've got to know the law. I've got to have thoroughness, preparedness, right? I need to look at this issue and get closely to understand what's going on. I've got to reasonably, diligently, and promptly advocate for my client. And this is in comparison to when I do counsel my client, I certainly sh should not counsel my client or even assist my client in engaging in criminal or fraudulent behavior. And one of the things about this are fraudulent is why we start to expand this analysis beyond just mere legality, right? I don't want to help them do fraud, I can, though, discuss with them, and this is the kind of situation we're talking about here, should I secretly disclose or not, what's the proper course of action? And I certainly need to discuss with them the legal consequences of any proposed course of conduct, right? So 
So, so even if in the end you're going to say no for your professional responsibility, you should be able to communicate with the client why the answer is no or why the answer is less or is, is yes. And as we go about this, I talked about third parties, rule 44A. I'm not supposed to be out there just trashing other people, right? We're not kind of bulls in China shops breaking a bunch of plates. I'm not supposed to embarrass, delay, or burden a third person if it's just to do that. Now, we, we do that as lawyers, right? But we need to make sure there's a purpose to it. And I should, very important for our hypothetical here, motivating, use methods of obtaining evidence that might violate the legal rights of a person. I've got to watch out for that, right? We're supposed to abide by these third party per people. And then for 8-4, I need to make sure that I don't assist or induce others to violate the professional responsibility rules. So this is not just you as an attorney. If you're engaging an advocate, and we've seen advocates, I got to make sure those advocates aren't out there doing something that violates the professional responsibility rules. And I need to make sure I don't engage in conduct that is not just illegal, dishonest, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. So here's our tension, right, that we're presented with. And I want to start with the most basics, and that is, this shouldn't be shocking to anyone that wouldn't even know the professional responsibility rules. Us as attorneys should not advocate for illegal action. It'd be kind of odd, right? Right? Ever. Thank you. And the illegal action that can go on here with an undisclosed recording is, is essentially wiretapping, which sounds so old and you know, who's on a phone anymore, whatever, right? And here's Virginia's code for wiretapping, interception, disclosure of wire, electronic, or oral communications is unlawful. And when you take a look at the statute, it seems insanely broad, except as otherwise provided. We'll look at that in a second. If you intentionally intercept, endeavor to intercept or procure any other person to intercept or intervene or intercept any wire, electronic, or oral communication, you should be guilty of a class six felony. Now, maybe there's some people in the room that are nervous now that have been taking pictures of slides. I've, I've called the, the, the Richmond PD. They'll be down here soon, right? Well, it turns out there's some exceptions to this because this seems pretty big. This is what Sarah Sams got hit with, right? There are exceptions. Two big ones that we are concerned with with the, our discussion today of this motivating hypothetical. The first is oral communications. This is so law is not what we necessarily think are all oral communications. The oral communications the statute is concerned with are oral communications in which the person that's uttering the oral communication has an expectation that it won't be intercepted. My gut is, is that the doctor this morning expected for people to take pictures of his slides, right? So even though you are capturing his oral communications, it was not an oral communication pursuant to the statute. Right? This would be the same if someone, heaven forbid, would like to record what I'm saying right now. I can't say I would have some expectation. In some ways, it would be the opposite. I would hope someone cares about what I'm saying. Right? This is my experience every Wednesday and Thursday in class. Right? That's not our only exception. The other exception, this is when people talk about are we a two-consent state or an all-consent state or a one-consent state. I don't know if anyone's ever heard this phraseology before. In Virginia, we are a one consent state. Why? If it turns out that one of the parties to the communication is consenting to it being recorded, it's not a wiretap, which essentially means that even if the doctor said, nobody here better take pictures of my slides, the person taking the picture, although we'll talk a little bit as to whether this was really a communication or not, is taking the picture and I'm consenting to the picture I'm taking, right? I'm doing it, right? It's not, a, it's not falling under the wiretap statute, right? Which is really big in Virginia. And so one of the things as we go through our analysis, I'm going to talk about this stuff in the concept of Virginia. If I'm in a all consent state or a two consent state, this gets much, much trickier because it means that I need both parties to the communication to say it's okay if it's not an oral communication to that first party. So what do we mean by oral communication? Here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, this is one thing I learned, someone who originally came from Texas and some other jurisdictions, where they actually decided to kind of write their law down and issue cases and actually have minutes for their general assemblies and all this stuff. And I come to the Commonwealth, and there are very few published decisions at all. We just decided to have a court of appeals that might have some more decisions. We actually do have a decision 
on what do we mean by oral communication. And essentially, the definition of oral communication tracks the constitutional expectation of privacy, which maybe is being shrunk a little bit as of late, right? Um, but essentially has a subjective and an objective prong. That is, for this to be an oral communication that could be protected by the wire staff statute, the person uttering the words has to subjectively think that it's private, but there also needs to be an objective understanding that it's private, right? So if I, again, I hate to pick on the doctor, he's a, not a, a doctor, I'm the cheap doctor, which is a JD, we get the kind of, kind of short run doctorates. If the doctor believes I should have some expectation of privacy, but objectively we'd say, why would he think this is private? It's being on Zoom, there are all these people in the room. We would say, sorry, it's not something protected by the wiretrap statute. Or we could flip it around and objectively we think it's probably private, but subjectively the speaker says, I don't think this is private right, or something like that. That would get us out of this. And so we can try to apply this to the concept of what we're doing right now, right? Would a teacher's oral communications in class, do we think that they would have an expectation of privacy? Maybe subjective if we've got our oddball teacher. Objectively, it's really hard, right, to think that when I'm sitting in front of a classroom of 30, 40 students, then I've got an expectation of privacy. We can even think about this. This is something that came up during our kind of the Zoom years of, of, of COVID, right? Whether I would have any expectation of privacy if I'm, I'm having a Zoom class, et cetera. And so maybe for those oral communications, which might be what the undisclosed secret recorder is picking up, they might not be oral communications under the wiretap statute, depending on the circumstances. We're also going to pick up some other communications in the classroom, right? Hopefully, if this is a good class, the other students might say something. Do they have an expectation of privacy? Right. No, probably not, right? If we're thinking on a normal kind of classroom that's there. So probably for both of these communications, we might be able to take them out of our concept of an oral communication. What if we get out of the classroom, we go to other settings? The IEP meeting. Well, it's not as much of a public place. There are just a couple of people in there. People are looking at me wanting the answer. I don't have the answer, but this would be our harder one, right? And if we start to kind of triangulate this as to what do we mean by when we lose that expectation of privacy, there are a couple of example cases, none of them in Virginia because we don't issue written decisions here. We have one out of Wisconsin. There was a disabled child who was being harassed by the bus driver, if you read this case, you all will sadly already know it. It's, it's really sad in some ways. The stuff this bus driver was saying to this child. And the parent says, you know what? We're gonna put a, a recorder in your backpack and we're gonna get this stuff down on tape. It gets down on tape and actually the tape is then being used. And this is why it's state versus Duchow. The tape is being used by the police to prosecute this individual. He wants it excluded because he says, listen, this was brought by illegal means, right? Fruit of the poisonous tree. And the way this was brought in was the state was able to establish there was no expectation of privacy on that bus, right? He might have thought it should be private, but we objectively wouldn't think statements made by a bus driver on a public bus would be public. So the answer there was no. Then there was a case in Texas. Um, this was a situation where someone had actually taken a phone, put it on record, put it in a locker room. There was a lot of politics behind, as us in Texas with sports will have. The coach probably used certain words when he was talking to the girls during halftime. He said, let's get this on tape. They get it on tape, and they want to use it to get him fired. Texas appellate court said, actually, there, the coach had an expectation of privacy. So this is our triangulation of like where, how small is the group? Where is this being done? It was big that this was being done. And I guess there's a part of the locker room where they would normally meet during halftime. Typically, many would be excluded from the locker room unless you were part of this small team. There, the court says, you know what? I think that's an oral communication that's protected. The last one comes us from Illinois. It's a special educational classroom. Here, actually, the school district installs video really to monitor the teachers to make sure that they're doing their job and acting appropriately. They find out some things are not going that right. 
Plock was one of the teachers actually sues the school board and says, look, you guys have to stop doing this. You're violating the wiretap. And here, I think this is our kind of classroom exception. That's not an oral communication. You shouldn't have an expectation of privacy if you're in a classroom that's there, right? So we can maybe try to use this to triangulate where we think we might have an oral communication where we might not. <clears throat> so we'll say, fine, a lot of situations, if we're doing these undisclosed recordings, we're probably not catching oral communications that the statute talks about. Let's say we do, though, right? That's not the end of the legality question because we're in a one consent state. And the obvious argument probably will be, well, wait a minute, the child is consenting to the communication, right? And so the child's the one that's saying it's okay. And so even if this is something where there's an expectation of privacy, we've got consent, we fall under an exception. One big question that comes up initially is whether minors even have the capacity to consent. Shocky, a lot of times minors do not have the capacity to consent. There's a concept though, of vicarious consent that's used a lot of times when a parent kind of kind of emboldens the child or tells the child you can do this or says to someone they can do this to the child, et cetera. And we can say vicariously, the parent has consented to the communication, even though it's the minor that's acting that capacity. I think that's what would be considered here. So we're probably okay with that. The other one, which I have to admit, there's not a ton of case law on, is what does it mean to be a party to the communication? This will shock you. I was one of these kids that actually didn't talk a lot in class, probably because I wasn't able to stand in the front of the classroom and talk to everyone. So if I'm sitting there not saying anything, but I've got a recorder in my backpack, am I a party to this communication that's going on? Um, I have to admit, there's just not a lot of case law on this. Um, I could say I'm a party to the conversation because I'm meant to be part of the conversation, right? Like I'm in that classroom because I'm supposed to be part of the class and what's being discussed. So probably those situations where the child is present, right? And they're the ones that might have the recorder in their backpack or, or sewn into their jacket, et cetera. They probably are a party to the communication. What if it turns out that the child is not present? Getting back to the Sarah Sims case, the recorder was actually confiscated when the child was out at recess and the recorder was just still going there left on the desk. Do you think we have consent in that situation? I've set up the recorder and I've left it. Our, our pro attorney here shaking her head, no, she's exactly right, right? And this is, I think, one of our concern points about if it turns out it actually is a protected oral communication and we're really relying on that one party consent situation, I'm concerned about situations where I'm gonna start picking up conversations where the child is not there with the recorder. So putting it in their backpack and they leave their backpack in the locker room. I don't know, they, they leave it just because they're children and they just leave it somewhere, right? And it picks up some recording. There you're not gonna be able to use this exception. Right? You're not going to be able to use this exception for those recordings that are there. We're going to eventually get near the end to talk about practicalities, but I think this is something to think about with regards to practicalities. Right? Because if it's anything like my children, it's even if they're ages of 18 and 16, I cannot direct them what to do. They don't listen to me what, I could, what they're supposed to do. So I think it'd be maybe hard to think about a situation where they're always going to have the recorder on them or not. But that's something we would need to have there in this particular situation. So, okay, fine, we maybe have dealt with the legality under the wiretap statute, right? We've got our, our initial question of, is it an oral communication? I think a lot of situations where these recordings are taking place probably isn't an oral communication. We're in a one consent state. We might actually have consent in a lot of those situations where it is protected under oral communication. I then started to brainstorm other scenarios. Um, uh, uh, we're gonna have lunch here in a little bit. Only five minutes though. We got more than five minutes, don't we, Carl? Yeah, we are, we're good. Um, maybe Carl's got lunch in five minutes. Oh, oh, stay here. No, I know they have lunch in five minutes. I promise you we'll have lunch in about oh, 40 minutes. Maybe that makes it a little bit. Um, uh, am I right? No, okay, uh, less than 40 minutes. So, so what about FERPA? So, so the other thing I do is I teach. We talk a lot about FERPA. This was actually a big question when we had Zoom classrooms. Like, what do we do with FERPA? Or we have FERPA concerns, et cetera. 
So one of the things about FERPA is that it applies to educational records. Um, and so I think the typical is grades, but maybe other things that are in the student's educational file that the institution holds on to. Um, there was a Supreme Court case in 2002 where there was a challenge to FERPA for peer grading, right? So this is the situation where the professor has really decided to just not have to do anything. And so I say, guess what? You guys are grading yourselves. This is part of the pedagogy. We're going to really get some good teaching done here. And so they say, well, that's, peer, that, that's FERPA violation because now Janie next to me is, knows I'm getting a C because she's going to put a C on my paper and I'm going to get a C. And the Supreme Court said, no, actually, those are not educational records until the teacher puts it in their grade book. Right, And the reason I think this is relevant to our analysis is, is that we're thinking about FERPA applying to something when we've actually recorded it down and put it in some type of institutional record. Right, So let's think about it in this scenario. What about the classroom conversations? Right, So we're having a conversation in the classroom. Do we think that that is an educational record? Right. Probably not, right? Now, the exception to this could be, and this is what we had to deal with here at the University of Richmond is, if the school's recording it and making it part of a record, well, then there might be FERPA concerns about that recording, right? And we've talked a lot internally as a faculty, particularly during COVID, like we would have these recordings about access, who had access, did we need FERPA waivers, did we not need FERPA waivers? But if it, it turns out that I've got a child in the classroom that's recording the conversation, we probably don't have a FERPA violation because what's being recorded is not an educational record. There might be some other variations of this, but I don't think we've got a FERPA issue. The final issue on the legality question might be a question about school policies or code of conduct. My ch one child, used to, one child still goes to an Arico County public school. And so I decided to pull up the student, code of student conduct that you know, they sign every year and we've never flipped through and never looked at and who knows what's in there. And this is always this nerdy. I'm like, okay, get ready. Who knows what's in here? And so I did this search. I said, okay, what about um, uh, recording. And actually, this was one of the big kind of kind of hooks for the Sarah Sims Norfolk case is the Norfolk um, County Public School said, but it's against school policy, right? And it turns out, maybe not shockingly, it's against Henrico County school policy. Students using cell phones or other electronic devices to record anything or anyone without authorization is strictly prohibited. Failure to adhere to this policy result in the confiscation and use this evidence. This seems very ominous. I don't know what it's being used as evidence as. Other consequences may apply. So probably if I've got a child recording, they're violating the school policy. My gut is all schools have this policy in place. The question is, is that a legality concern, right? I mean, is this a legality concern? This might be evidence when we get to the other prongs of professional responsibility, the idea of misconduct, deceitful fraud. But this doesn't make it illegal. I do think, though, this is something to think about on the practicality side. Right? If the child is caught with the recorder, yes, I'm concerned about my bar license. I might also just be concerned about the child being kicked out of school. Right? That's probably not a result that you want to give your client. Right? And so this would be, I think, more of a practicality concern as opposed to a legality concern. OK, so we've stepped through the legality question. I think that there's going to be cases where it's going to be legal for a child to wiretap their teacher. It sounds really nasty, doesn't it? Whatever. It, 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 they're going to be legal situations. It turns out that's not the end of the analysis because we don't just want our attorneys to do things that are legal. I know it seems like we're going there in today's society, but we want them to be a little better than just doing things that are legal. And it turns out that the Virginia State Bar has been really big about this. And that is, we still need to be respectful of these third parties. We're not supposed to embarrass, delay, or burden them, right? If there's no reason to do that. And maybe even more importantly, we're not supposed to engage in dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. I think this is where it gets more difficult. Because inherently, when I say secret recording or undisclosed recording, right, there's just a nature to that where there is a level of deceit. Sounds loaded, morality-wise. And actually, the Virginia State Bar has been battling with this. And actually, a lot of state bars have been battling with this question, not specifically in the classroom context, but broader, for a long time. What do we do? 
about secret recordings. You maybe knew this or didn't know this. And so the Virginia State Bar has this ability to get these legal ethics opinions. You can get individual ones, but you can actually push out broader kind of, kind of hypothetical questions where they'll actually publish an LEO. That is, I, I, I like the conversation earlier about guidelines. It's like a guideline. It doesn't control. But it's always nice if you got a guideline on your side. If you don't have a guideline on your side, and there's really a long history of these LEOs where over time, the Virginia State Bar and many state bars have flip-flopped on whether these things violate 8-4 or not. So in true law school fashion, we're going to walk through the history of these LEOs. And the, one of the things I hope that you take away from this is you'll get a sense of maybe where truth lies somewhere in the middle of all of this. And this becomes really big because there is a Supreme Court case here in Virginia, Gunter, that kind of falls in the middle of this. And the big thing is going to be, we always got to make sure that recording is legal, but even if it's legal, we're going to be wondering whether we've got dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. <clears throat> so our first LEO is in 1989. Someone asked the Virginia State Bar, they said, hey, is it okay for an attorney to record a telephone conversation with opposing counsel and pending litigation. Some real trust going on here, right? Do you think we got a legality concern here? We're in a one consent state? No, right? I'm on the phone. I'm a party to the communication. There might be a thought of privacy here, but I've got consent. Well, I don't have a legality problem. But the Virginia State Bar said, but yeah, you know what? That's not the end of it. You need to be concerned about 8-4. Are you acting dishonestly, fraudulently, deceitfully, or misrepresenting in some way? And this LEO is insanely short. They don't expound any further than that. Okay, great. Thank you. That didn't really help very much. Well, pending at the same time is this Supreme Court case, Gunter versus the Virginia State Bar. This was a scenario where we had an attorney was representing a client in a domestic relations matter. He suggests to his client to install a recording device on, I love this terminology, the marital phone. I guess there's the marital phone and there's the other phone. If you want to really think about perceptions here, do you think he's representing the man or the woman in this case? The husband. I'm just it, 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 I, Stereotypes play strong in all this stuff. He says, look, let's tap her phone. It's the marital phone. And let's see if we can get some evidence of infidelity. Shocker. Wife's not engaged in infidelity. The one thing the wife is engaged in is she knows that her husband's been going to get an attorney. And so she's making sure that any new income that she's making is not going in the joint account. Well, that information is really important to the attorney and the husband. And they say, okay, we need to act on this information. And so they immediately file, try to get the divorce filed, try to move this, 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 this money around, et cetera. The wife finds out about the recordings during the divorce um, litigation, and she, guess what, calls the police and says, there's an attorney who tapped my phone, or at least instructed someone to tap my phone, and the police arrest the attorney. And if we think about this under the wiretapping statute, this is not one consent. The marital phone does not mean that the husband's always on the marital phone, right? There's no one person exception here. Actually, a fairly good case that this is a wiretap problem. He actually ends up getting acquitted, right? Doesn't go to jail. Well, that's not the end of the story, right? Um, it's not just about jail if you're an attorney. It's also about the state bar. And so the state bar says, great, you got acquitted, but man, you violated 8-4. You violated 8-4 because it was illegal, one, although his pushback during the litigation was, well, it wasn't illegal. I had a jury that acquitted me. And Virginia State Bar goes, okay, fine. It might have been legal, but this was deceitful, dishonest, et cetera. And your surreptitious rec rec recordation of the conversations is an underhanded practice desired to ensnare uh, an opponent. It's completely beyond fairness and candor. And they actually affirm the state bar's um, disciplinary action under 8-4. This case ends up having a big impact on the early LEOs after this as to the scope in which I can do undisclosed recordings. It turns out though, and we're gonna find out here that the Virginia State Bar didn't read the whole case. Um, the Virginia State Bar in the Scooter case, the Supreme Court is pretty specific. They say, listen, 
we were really specific that this is a situation where the lawyer or the lawyer's agent wasn't a party to the conversation. It's a really big no-no, right? We're not going to answer any other circumstances that might not be before us, right? And this would be a situation where you might actually have the attorney, right, or the attorney's agent on the other end of it. Um, the Virginia State Bar doesn't seem to take this to heart, and they kind of run with Gunter. And for a number of years, they're going to be issuing LEOs where they're going to be deciding that any secret taping is a violation of 8.4, right? So let me give you some examples. So here's a hypothetical. Now we've got the wife secretly taping her, I guess it's the marital phone. Maybe it's not the marital phone. Maybe this is just the husband's phone, right? Conversations on the marital phone. The wife has done this before engaging the attorney. The wife then comes to the attorney that she's uh, engaged for, for, for divorce proceedings and says, hey, look, I've got these recordings, right? And the attorney says, no, 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 you got to stop that. You're not a party to the conversations, right? These things are illegal. You can't do anything else with it. And so the question was, could the attorney still use the tapes in the divorce proceeding? Right? And one of the arguments was, look, I didn't give her the advice to do it. She did it, though, and now I've got these tapes. Can I use them as evidence? The Virginia State Bar and their LEO says, no, you can't. Gunter. Right? We've got an 8-4 problem. This is dishonest. This is probably illegal, quite frankly, um, uh, because nobody was on the, on the recordings. The wife wasn't on the actual recordings that are there. So we got an 8-4 problem. The other thing that came up in this case, put this as bonus if we want to get kind of deep in PR issues, is whether the attorney needed to rat out his client. Right? This is the no, noisy withdrawal scenario. Um, this, Elio says, no, you don't need to do that. Like, look, even if the wife's actions are illegal, they've stopped, right? She's not still doing that. There's no bodily harm. There's no big risk here. And quite frankly, it might actually hurt your representation of the wife going forward, right? To kind of rat out this, I have to disclose confidentiality, et cetera. So can't use them, but you don't need to tell anyone about it. This one is actually not that shocking of a result, given that it probably was an illegal recording, right? Because the, the, the wife was on the phone. How about this one, right? So a couple of years later, the hypothetical that's sent into the LEO, we've got an attorney. This feels very law schoolish. We're A, Bs, and Cs here, right? Represents A, who was abused by her father B. Right? And this is a, representing her in a cause of action against her father, civil cause of action because of this abuse. The downside, and I think this is where we get some kind of, kind of similarities to some of the situations we're talking about today, is we've got a kid. There's just not a lot of evidence, right? There, there, there's her recounting of what has happened. Right, but I don't have a lot of physical evidence or written things, et cetera. And so in the conversations between the attorney and the client A and B, the attorney figures out that actually the, the, the daughter is still in communication with her father. He says, well, so you still talk to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in those conversations, does he talk about the abuse? Yeah, he'll, he openly talks about it. Let's record it. Right? Great evidence. You can think about the scenario that if she sat down with the father and said, okay, I'm going to record you. Now tell me about all the bad things you did. Maybe he's that brazen. I've seen idiots that are that brazen, right? But, but no, right? And so it needs to be undisclosed. And they actually do the recording and the father admits to the abuse. The problem is under the earlier LEOs, I'm nervous about this as if I'm an attorney. I don't have a legality problem because we got consent from the kid. Right? They're there, part of the conversation. You would hope the Virginia State Bar would have some practical sense. In 1992, they did not. They said, no, you can't use these tapes. You can't even ask them to do this because of the Gunter case. And it turns out here, which is important, the father was not represented by anybody, which is important because if the father was represented by an attorney, I've got another concern. Right? I've now got communication with a represented party on the other side of a litigation, right? And so then that would be a problem, but it wasn't here. And I get a sense after this in 92, and it's not just happening in Virginia. A lot of these Virginia state, these state bars are really hamstrunging the ability for individuals to collect information that's legal, but for some reason is thought to be fraudulent, et cetera. Here's another one from 1995. If anyone kind of follows these, there are not a ton of LEOs out there, and there are a lot of them on these undisclosed recordings. Here we've got an attorney who's an officer for the corporation, 
calls up essentially an employee and says, look, we're terminating. Records the termination call without the employee's knowledge, right? Um, probably CYA, this probably was just part of company policy. The person gets fired, engages an attorney and says, hey, can you represent me in this, this wrongful termination? During discovery, they find out that there is this secret taping by attorney A. First of all, is this illegal? The attorney recording the call that they're on with B if they're in Virginia? No, see, I'm, I'm gonna pretend that I've taught people stuff and they've learned, I don't know, right? It's not illegal. What do you think the Virginia State Bar is gonna do with all these previous cases? Say it's ethical or not? Not, right? They sure as shit might say not here. If they didn't say, if they said no for the sexual abuse, they better say it for the employee, right? We're gonna be fair here. And they said no. Gunter, it's just dishonest, fraudulent, right? And they even went so far to say, look, the attorney can't even record another person if the other person is actually threatening the attorney personally, which is actually what was happening in this. Can happen in employment cases. Employees can be mad, right? And part of it was just the attorney trying to just cover themselves, right? They're saying, they're really saying they say, no, you can't even do that because your professional rules of responsibility. And the LEO of the issue is so far to say that B's attorney might need to actually report A's attorney's conduct to the bar because they violated it. This is really expanding the scope of the LEO. So attorney C is the one that's representing the employee. Thank you. There we go. Good, good. You would have done, you did well in the MBE probably, right? Um, <clears throat> this is going on, and I think that it, it, we're getting in the modern era, right? And, and, and realities are realities. And we get an LEO in 2000 where essentially somebody asked the state bar, can you just please tell us there got to be circumstances where you can do this? There's got to be, right? And the Virginia State Bar says, okay, okay, we'll revisit some of our previous LEOs, and they modify some stuff. And they say, you know, we probably held Gunter to be a little bit broader than we thought it was, right? That was actually a case where we had an illegal recording. And we've actually concluded that our prior opinions sweep too broadly and therefore are overruled. This is where you say to me, why did we spend half a class talking about a bunch of cases that are no longer good law? This is education, you know, where we came from, where we're from, right? So where are we now, right? And so they give some hypotheticals. This one, I think, is the one that I don't know why the, the Virginia... State Bar didn't figure out. There is a whole host of attorneys that direct a gaggle of individuals that have a lot of money and resources to do a lot of secret taping. They're called police, right? Technically, those attorneys were violating 8-4. And so now the Virginia State Bar says, yeah, you know, you're exactly right. Actually, no, 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 th they aren't violating 8-4 because there's another interest involved. There's a reason why we have secret wiretaps, right? And so we're going to allow that. There's another situation where we might have secret wiretaps, and those are testers in housing discrimination cases, right? This is when I want to get that specific evidence of discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. What do I do? I send an individual that has the traits that we think the discrimination is happening. And while we might be able to have a statistical discrimination case, it's the best to have an actual specific evidence of discrimination. So I need the individual to show up. Will you give me a place? They say no, and then we, I'll just admit, then the Caucasian person shows up and says, yes, you can have that apartment. Technically, right, it's got to be secret or the person's not going to tell you the truth. Now the Virginia State Bar says, you know what, that's not a violation. You can do those secret recordings. Well, what about that situation you talked about where I, as the attorney myself, am being threatened? Can not I secretly tape those threats? That's fine too, right? So we're starting to now see this relaxation of at least what the ethical opinions say is okay or not okay. They recognize that there might be other facts out there, which I think this is important for our analysis, right? There are going to be circumstances where this is allowed. We won't tell you what those are, right? Um, um, but they're, they're out there, right? While this is going on in Virginia, the American Bar Association is also kind of fighting with this question. Um, and they come up together with a formal opinion. This is not something that would necessarily give you much weight in Virginia, but I think it's important. They also remove the kind of complete bar against secret recording. They say, listen, I know we said in 1971 you couldn't secretly record people. There are circumstances where you can do that, right? One of the things that you can't do is if someone asks the attorney 
or the attorney's agent, are you recording me? You've got to tell the right answer to that. That that is fraud or deceit, right? Not that you have to tell them, but if they say, you wearing a mic right before they rip your shirt off or whatever, right? You got to say, yes, I'm wearing a mic, right? But then you say, okay, fine. If it's legal and I disclose if asked, am I okay? And actually the ABA says, you know what? We're divided on the question. Which this is fine and dandy if I'm trying to litigate it to the Supreme Court. If my bar license is on the line, I don't like. This is kind of you know, in between. I've got to feed my kids. I want to make sure I can help my client. But they say in the end, it's inadvisable, which I think when we get near the end of this, I think it, you got to really be careful with this on a number of reasons. And one of the things is, is that it turns out circumstances are really going to matter. And so after this ABA opinion, you start to have a final series of LEOs from the Virginia State Bar. Can you give me more examples, essentially, was the request in 2010. They say, yes. First of all, we go back to that one where you were secretly taping the abuser. We were probably wrong on that, right? And the reason we were wrong, this gets back to the beginning, is that there's this tension. I'm trying to help my client. My client says that they were abused. I don't have great evidence, but my client is telling me that the unrepresented defendant is saying that they did the abuse. And I probably know that if I tell that person I'm taping them, they're not going to say the truth, right? And so here I think the Virginia State Bar says, listen, we understand there's this tension. And if the attorney analyzes that tension and comes up in the end and says, you know what, this is the only way for me to help my client out and it's legal, then it's okay to take, right, secretly. And we don't have an 8-4 problem. And so I think that's why they come to the answer here that it's okay to secretly take the abuser. <clears throat> and here, actually, we go back to the situation we had with the attorney for the, for the corporation. Here, the attorney for the corporation is actually trying to investigate a, a sexual harassment complaint by one of the employees. And what the attorney for the corporation says is, look, here, just secretly tape the person when they're doing the harassment and we'll use that, right? Which under the old LEOs you would think would be a violation. And in the end, the court here, the court, the Virginia State Bar says that's not a violation. Which if we kind of reset with all these things, we get this sense that, you know what? We're starting to allow these undisclosed recordations. Here's the last one, I'm a criminal lawyer. I'm representing... My client charged in a conspiracy. We've got an unindicted co-conspirator who's not represented. I'm worried that this person might change their story at trial. Let's secretly re-record them. Virginia State Bar says, yes, that's proper. Right? So we're, 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 we're seeing this kind of movement in this direction. We'll, we'll relieve the, the bonus here. And let's get to our... <clears throat> so you say, fine, I've listened to this for too long. Professor Gatropia, can you please make something out of this mess? First, you got to make sure it's legal, which I think there are situations with the, the tape recorder on the kid that you might have an illegality problem, particularly if it's sitting around somewhere with the child not there. Make sure you're in Virginia. It's a one consent state, one person consent state. Beyond that, you've got to know there's just not a bright line on the professional rules question, which means you need to do your own internal analysis. Is this the best way to get the information that I need for my client? Which think, you know, think about alternatives. Do I need a secret tape recorder? What's the likelihood of the secret tape recorder catching things that might be illegal? Right? Have I tried other alternatives? Are there indications that I am worried about people lying, et cetera? And so I think circumstances matter here a lot. And this is why I say, like, it depends. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think there's an, an ultimate answer, yes or no, on this. There is a modern trend to allow these ethically. Thank you. But I still think overarchingly, if you think about, like, what's my presumption? My presumption is don't do it. It's inadvisable unless that's my ultimate recourse, right? What I need to do. And this would be the same as if a, a, a recording tape came to you and you're thinking about trying to use it, right? Do I really need to use it? Um, yes um, or no. I'm going to get past the last hypothetical and I'm going to conclude with this and then I'll take confessions. Um, uh, 
I, I really think looking through all this, and I think this is where the practicality meets the, the professional responsibility side to it. My uninformed on the practicality side, but at least from the PR side, is that you really want to consider other options first. And if anything, maybe even document those somewhere, right? I've considered doing asking, <laughs> asking for information, maybe even asking to say, you know, is there any documentation? Could I observe the classroom? Could I have someone else observe the classroom? Those types of things. Because I think that as the ABA is that generally you really don't want to do these undisclosed recordings. I think the other thing is consider the practicalities of all of this. The Sarah Sims scenario, I think, is a great one where, not a great one because she got charged by the police, but a great one to give you the practicality concern. She handed her daughter this recorder, and I don't think her daughter had a sense of what this thing was, and basically came into the classroom and just set it on her desk not really undisclosed anymore one if that's your purpose and two then it created this problem where she left it right and so here i'm going to have to have a child again i'm just thinking of mine i'm sure yours are insanely well behaved and do exactly what you asked them to do that has to understand what this thing is don't disclose it to anyone because that's the purpose of this make sure you're around when it's recording and i've read stuff about children that try to sew it in the jacket and the child's like fiddling with it maybe practically turns it off and you don't, it's only downside, not upside, right? I think also the practicalities in a sense of if you're caught with it, probably does violate the school code of conduct. It doesn't mean it's a PR problem for us responsibilities. It might be a PR problem on the other side, right? Where is my position on this? What are the relationships between them? So I think you really want to consider the practicalities. Definitely do a case-by-case -case analysis which maybe is the, oh God, you know, give me a bright line rule. There isn't one here. And I think my final point, and this more comes from the, the, the privacy law space. And I know here, look, I've been on the other side of this. You want to skin on the wall. You're, you're mad about what's going on. Is to try to have empathy for the other side. And when I see the other side in a sense of the teacher, the IEP coordinators, I'm thinking about the, the doctor's comments. Empathy goes a long way, right? And so I feel like the undisclosed recording is that last resort where, yes, I empathize with the privacy of the teacher and, and I empathize with the fact that the educators are trying to do their best. And I really only want to reach for this kind of, kind of secret recording if after thinking about all those empathies, I've got to do this, right? I've got to do this for my client. Um, I, I've got to do this to represent um, uh, them and their child. Okay, so I know lunch is on the other side, um, but I'm happy to take questions and not give legal opinions. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Or John, I'm stuck for that. What was it that we know that specifically addressed the situation of a non-verbal disabled child, a family that he was being abused in school, and and did the secret recording, and it was determined that is an exception. That yes, that is not a violation. So maybe it is my possibility. I don't. I don't see that. I don't think there have been cases about a non-verbal child, and this was an abuse. But this is more about a question of accommodation and privacy for the other individuals. So this is not the this is a recording device as part of accommodation. Yeah. And there was a question about the other kids in the room. But I'm not going to tell you that'd be great for one on one. I do think it translates with the other user situation we're talking about, right? So if there this is my non-answer law professor, I think. If there is a reason that one, I think the analogy that I would level leverage on heavily are the ones where, hey, they're being abused. I, I, the, the abuser is not going to tell me it up front, right? It's not there. So, so that's why I'm not going to take it. It's a great, it, and I, yeah, we should talk. I'd love to know if there is one. Yeah, okay, sure. I, I, I'll take it too. Okay. Uh, the, what if you, because I'm an advocate, I'm an advocate. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> but I think you probably work with attorneys, and so you would be concerned about this. So, I mean, I work at the state law system. So, with Virginia being the one part of the right. and it's actually been our regulatory language is that we can report IEP and special education. So, that's even great. So, thank you. so, this is domain knowledge that I don't know. That's right. That's right. That's right. But, which also means to come to not make it in the right? And then, 
You might think, I think this is getting back to what I find the FAQ that's not published. Like having that regulation in your back pocket, so I'm going to report the meeting. You can't report the It's like, well, no, I can. Right. Uh, so go ahead. Well, I'm in mean, like the prime here in Virginia. I'm right. doing the meeting, but I have an IP meeting in Florida where it's not a one party consent state, but I still want to report because I'm sitting here in Virginia participating. Isn't that a limited track? I'll invite you to my PR class in the parade. <laughs> So there are a couple of things I think that we have to, so there's, the, so let's start with the legality question. So, so there's a PR question, but there's the, do I go to jail question, which is probably even more important. Um, uh, and, and, and I think that might be a concern if I'm, if I'm communicating with someone with a two party stay, I would be afraid that I'm, I'm effectuating an act in that state. And you have knowledge that they're in that state that I would be concerned. That's my, I, so I would not, and, and that's where, knowledge and I, I and even just doing some google searches i was able to find really good lists of two party one party state so that's it um uh and the second thing i would say about that is even if i, I still think you probably have a legality even if you have a legality problem i think this is where the eight four and this wouldn't be as much of an issue for you but the attorney that might be helping you say you know what even if technically you're not in that jurisdiction it's more deceitful or fraudulent because those individuals you're dealing with are in a state they might not know it that's a two-party state, right? And so I think, I think Massachusetts might be a two-party state. And so they're just expectations are, we don't do that crazy stuff you guys do in Virginia or whatever. So yeah. So that's the that was the first question or. Oh oh oh. Oh, that's okay. So can a parent of parent who is situation, you can advise that and you know they have ADHD and still report it a lot of times. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll self represent here. Yes, okay, yes. So, this is what I thought. The, so, yeah, so this I thought was the LA, and I, I was making the LA on the finish. Not even there, it's closed for recording. Although, maybe the accommodation is so I know sometimes, could we are not, but we do not. And a lot of times, we're not we this. We don't know who needs the accommodation. This has been a discussion about how we provide services to our students. We just get a list and say, these are the accommodations you need to provide. And I don't even know who I'm providing them to, which I don't think is really the way to do it, but whatever. But maybe even if it has to be secret for some reason, I, the ADA loophole, I think, is a big one, right? In a sense of, so even under wiretapping, there's an exception if it's allowed by law. So this would be like a, a, a search warrant, but it would also be this. And I'm thinking about the scenario where I believe it was a nonverbal, either nonverbal or they need the recordings to understand later. And the school is saying, no, their privacy concerns, wiretapping. I mean, it's always good confirmation where the domain knowledge people are saying that I read the case correctly. <laughs> the situation of child dyslexia, the parents want to use like an echo pen or a light scribe or something to for him to take notes in the classroom. And the teacher is saying no because of privacy rules. There's no expectation. We're saying there's no expectation of privacy. So I think that's, that's the first one. But I think even if there was, I think the, the, this opinion said that ADA, you know, accommodations complex, basically. Yes. Right? And it has to be tailored, right? So we're not just like, the camera on the shoulder. Right? Well, I have one minute. Um, and, oh. You know, and, 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 um, 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 notify the school that you're going to be recording is sometimes a push for the school to make sure they're on their day and doing the right thing. It's so that they know they're going to be recording and this has to be part of the student's educational record. So, and this is interesting when you think about the, the, the circumstances. So, this is disclosed, right? So, so, when you're thinking about your professional duties and whether this is the best for your client, I'm sure that some circumstances, disclosure is or at least. A lot of items. We might be recording at some time. You might not know when, but I just want to let you know, right? Which actually would get you out of a lot of these problems we're talking about here. It might get you closer. So that's a, that's a really good point to think about when you're thinking about this. I mean, I'll just wrap up with this here. It says she didn't talk to the school a number of times to try to do something. They were just not in response. Now she's not even there to her, right? But I think those are situations where maybe you could say under the circumstances, I think we're in good shape, right? Um, and 
using to figure out the, the taping mechanism. There's technology now based on reading. Yeah, reading on the line. That's the there are some lines that are voice activated on the child grid. That's thank you again. Confirmation. The next part is actually um, it's like these are the kind of things. I know we've got much outside, right? At home. I don't want to say that and they leave and then they're mad and all this stuff. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Carl. We do have lunch outside, so please, if you exit through these doors, uh, you'll see the lunch right on the side there. You are welcome to eat um, in here in the commons area where we have the live screen um, if you've been over there, and we will have lunch until one o'clock. So if one o'clock, y'all can be back in your seats. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have our second practitioner's panel on the role of the GAL with Rebecca Imhol, Jennifer Newman, Erica McCormick, and moderated by Julie McConnell. It's wonderful to have you here at the University of Richmond. I'm going to start out by asking each panelist to tell you their name, where they practice, how many years of experience they have practicing, and why they've chosen to be GALs. So I'll start with Erica. Great, thank you, Julie. I'm Erica McCormick. I practice here in Richmond in Midlothian and Chesterfield County at Winslow, McCurry and McCormick. Um, I've got 11 years, almost 12 of experience now. And I originally got into and still continue to serve as a guardian ad litem because I appreciate advocating for children in the context of legal proceedings. Terrific. Jen? That was like an academic answer, right? <laughs> um, so I'm Jen Newman. Um, I have been practicing for 23 years. I worked for the state for a year of that, so I guess that doesn't count. Um, I've been a certified, qualified guardian ad litem for 17 of those 23 years. Um, I did not take a direct course here. I was going to be a prosecutor. I've never prosecuted a single case in my life. Uh, I went to work for a defense attorney uh, when I was in law school, and I was an appellate writer for a long time with her. And honestly, it was about who you know. So her partner was a juvenile court judge and said, we have a terrible pool of attorneys here. Please come work in the juvenile court. I said, I don't know anything about juveniles. Uh, and 17 and a half years later, I am usually the one they ask <laughs> questions about in terms of guardian light and work. So um, was not what I designed, not what I was set out to do or what I was really designed to do. I'm, I'm not a warm and fuzzy person. Um, for the most part, but um, I can't think of a better job than representing the best interests of children in whatever legal matter it is. Um, and my name is Rebecca Imholt. I've been a guardian ad litem for about 10 years now. I actually came out of law school wanting to do that. I clerked for Judge Williams in the Henrico Juvenile Court while I was here as a 3L, um, and he really introduced me into a bunch of different guardian ad litems. Um, I trained with them and realized exactly how hard that job is. So I didn't do it for a few years and then I got roped into doing it and I've been doing it ever since. Wonderful. All right, so I'm just gonna go through a series of questions and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for a few questions from the audience as well. But one of the first questions I wanted to ask is, do any of you also serve as the attorney for um, the child, for example, as a court appointed defense attorney? I do. And I do as well. Okay. I do not. <laughs> All right. And how do you balance that with your work as a GAL? You're going sort of back and forth between those two roles. So it's a very different um, standard of uh, representation. When you're the child's attorney, you are arguing for what they uh, would have you argue for, just as you would for a um, adult, you know, delinquent, uh, I'm sorry, for an adult defendant. So a lot of times if you're representing them on a chins petition um, or something of that nature, as a guardian, um, its best interest. It's a very different standard. It is not necessarily what the child wants that I have to advocate for. As a guardian, I advocate for their best interest, which may be different than their actual expressed desires for what they want. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer that? The only thing that I would add to that is remember your role. Um, I, I frequently tell colleagues, um, it's, a, it's a joke and not a joke, that sometimes I forget what hat I'm wearing. Um, when I'm dealing with a client, I don't think that I do that in the courtroom, and I don't think anybody would accuse me of doing that in the courtroom, but sometimes that's hard for other people to see because they're like, whoa, what is Jen talking about? Because I'm advocating for the kid to 
you know, not go to detention and not be found guilty of anything. Whereas if I were over in the other seat, I might be arguing other things. <laughs> um, but remember your role. I also think that there is a benefit to remembering that you do both roles so that when you're talking to the child, when you're talking to the family, um, especially um, there are a lot of delinquency cases where there also will be a guardian mm -hmm. appointed on a chins case. There always is. Um, so I think, you know, you miss an opportunity if you don't also kind of talk to them that way as well, so that you help them understand where the guardian ad litem might be coming from and why you might be advising them to do certain things as the defense attorney, because you've got a guardian ad litem involved. So, well, and I don't represent, uh, children in cust uh, as court appointed, but I represent frequently parents in custody visitation cases, um, as a private attorney for them. And that can be a challenging role as well, because with my guardian ad litem hat, while I listen to the parents, obviously, I don't have to do what they want me to do. As the attorney for a parent, if they want me to advocate for a certain thing, that's my job. I have to advocate for that, even if I personally don't think it's necessarily the best thing for that child. So that's certainly a hard thing to balance. So picking up on that issue of your role, can you talk a little bit about the role of the GAL in special education cases? Rebecca looks <laughs> eager. <laughs> So actually, that's kind of a hard thing because for the most part, we don't get involved in a lot of special education cases. Mm -hmm. What we have is more of a tangential uh, relationship with, you know, IEPs and other areas with, with kids. If a child is in front of the court for a CHINS petition, which is a child in need of services or a child in need of supervision, then we might be getting talking to the school about what services are in place, what services need to be in place at the school. Does the child have an IEP? Do they need an IEP to, to determine what what services are already in place and what that kid might need. Same in a custody case, we might be looking at the IEP to see what's going on, what parent is being the parent that is really advocating for the child at the school and if that's going to impact custody and visitation. But in terms of actually say being part of the IEP meetings and things like that, unless that's going on while I am appointed, I generally am not involved in that. Um, so I, I think this ties uh, into two things, and I'll try and answer the question, but I think guardian at lunch for the most part are kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, you need to know so much, a little bit of lots of stuff, right? <clears throat> um, so I think part of our issue with answering that question is I don't think any of us really have been involved in a true special education case um, because guardian at lunch aren't appointed on those. Um, we are involved in other cases where special education stuff is happening and we're injecting ourselves. Um, and that's not the only type um, of scenario or topic where that happens. And as a guardian line, you just have to understand that, that there are going to be things that <clears throat> you were doing something else on a custody and visitation case. And all of a sudden you find yourself sitting at an IEP meeting. And you're like, whoa, what am I doing? Um, so I'll give that caveat. I think um, I think it really depends on the case. It really depends on the family. Um, and I think it depends on the guardian ad litem. Um, in foster care cases, um, which I do tons of, those are probably the longest cases from start to finish mm -hmm. um, that a guardian ad litem is involved in. So you could theoretically, and I think in one case I have, been involved from child study requests all the way to the development of the IP. And I was at every meeting. <clears throat> um, and I was there advocating um, and at times I was the voice of the parent because the parents had flaked um, and parents maintain educational rights during a foster care case. Um, but in a custody visitation case, it's more about um, is the parent cooperating? Are you getting what you need from the parent in order for the school to be addressing what needs to be addressed, either in developing the plan um, or in getting the testing done or whatever it is? And so it's more about that connecting to services. Um, if there's an IEP happening, um, an IEP meeting, if there's a child study meeting happening, if there's a disciplinary meeting happening, and I'm the GAL, I'm there, um, and I, I get really angry when people don't invite me, um, because one of our standards say we should go. I can't go if I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I think we find ourselves in little bits and pieces of that. We're certainly not the experts on the IEP process because of that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where you have to know just enough to know what you don't know and where you need to direct people. Thank you. Do you want to address that? I, I think they've pretty much summed that up in a very succinct manner. Yeah. So if you have a case where you were appointed as guardian ad litem in a delinquency, for example, and you learned that the child had been expelled because of the delinquency, would you be involved in perhaps appealing the expulsion before the board? 
I can't say that I've ever had that. I can't say I wouldn't be involved either. I think, again, as, as Jennifer said, it's very fact specific. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of that is going to depend on what other parental supports are or are not there for that child and who else is advocating for them. If no one else is advocating, then yes, that could be a scenario in which that could certainly arise. Um, but if you've got other advocates and you've got a parent that's involved with the department and the worker, then it may be less of a, a less of an involvement at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, one in 17 years. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a matter of timing. Mm -hmm. um, and timing and when the case comes and when all of the other matters are happening with the school and timing and when somebody would like to tell the guardian of that that's going on. Um, I have been more involved in um, while they're still trying to make that decision. <clears throat> what's going on. In fact, I had a case very recently where a child's behavior was just uh, unbelievable at the high school. She ended up biting a staff member. Um, she did not get charged. Um, we oddly had a foster care case two days later where the neurologist was testifying and the defense attorney of all people asked whether or not her behavior as explained by the staff members and the administrators could have been a manifestation of her disability and got an answer of no. Mm -hmm. It's not particularly helpful because, of course, everyone else in the back of the courtroom was like, oh, I'm taking that and running with it. And I so I interjected and was like, well, 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 wait a minute. OK, that was in the context of a foster care case. Like, let's let's talk about what the disability is and what happened because um, they were going to expel her. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we dialed it back to at least uh, two weeks of homebound and let's all reassess. But so more I've done more of that kind of in the before we've taken a true action, mm -hmm. I've been involved in. And, and I would okay. agree with that. It tends to be less the formal process of the appeal and more the conversations with the school of, hey, before you guys talk about appealing, what can we do to prevent that from happening? And how do we how do we mitigate the issues that I we all see are happening, but ensure this child is still getting educated because we that's important. And also making sure the child's not not doing anything is really important, particularly if you've got a delinquency kid. Mm -hmm. So hearing your answers, it makes me think that it's very important to get the school records in your cases, right? To get yes. that IEP or that 504, to get any information about a manifestation, determination, review, that sort of thing. How do you go about getting those records? So my general intake process, once I get an order of appointment, regardless of the case, um, if I've got a school-age child, um, which can often include, um, you know, four-year-olds that are sometimes in the Head Start programs and things, so just because they're not in kindergarten doesn't mean there may not be um, some work that the counties are already doing. And so I'll send a records request to the school for the records, including discipline, IEPs, 504s, grades, attendance, et cetera. It's a, a form letter uh, that goes out, and obviously it's tailored to each particular um, school and child, but certainly it's a form in that I'm sending it as the guardian. It used to be that the school um, would just simply fax those back to you. Some schools were really quick. Some schools had more going on, but I would say generally I would get them back within a week. And I think the new policy, at least for Chesterfield, I can't speak to Henrico, perhaps Rebecca can chime in, is that they are now faxing those requests to the um, county school attorney. And so what's actually happening, and then the school attorney is, is sending it to me directly. So what's happening is I'm actually having a longer period of time. And so sometimes when we're appointed super fast and we've got in the context of foster care, you're coming back at a five day hearing and, and some of those things, I don't have the records yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that I haven't asked, I don't have them. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I do get them back, you know, depending on what's going on, there'll be a varying stack that comes in, the paralegal bring it in, sits down. I just spent about an hour reviewing several last night. So that's my process for getting them. I don't know what Henrico or Richmond does. Well, let me ask, when you send that letter, are you relying on 16.1-266? I always records? attach a copy of my appointment order um, and page two, because sometimes folks aren't really familiar. Um, we have occasionally had pushback from medical providers as well as school providers. And so um, then I have a highlighted version that I, I send as a gentle, by the way, I don't need permission from a parent or anybody else. It's right here within the code and it's highlighted. And that tends to be fairly effective. So so the combination of citing 16.1-266 and providing your appointment yes. order. Mm -hmm. And you said the second page of the appointment yes, order. Yes, because that's where it lists what we have access to without, by mere virtue of the appointment. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. right. And I think we've provided a copy of the order of appointment um, with your materials. But uh, if you look at the second page, the second page is literally without further order from the court, mm -hmm. the guardian ad litem is allowed to get all of this stuff, um, which is the really easy way of saying it's it's the, it's our 
pass to get school records, medical records without going to the parents who can often be um, obstructionist, uncooperative, um, or subpoenaing records, which takes time and money to do. And you have, and then you have to sure. disclose them to, you have to disclose them to the other side, that sort of thing. I've also found that if you are having a little bit of issues, Henrico doesn't require them to go to the, the county attorney yet. Um, most of the time they will send that. I've had a couple of pushback and say, you can come to the, the school and get them, but we're not going to fax them to you. Um, normally I try to visit kids at the school anyway, if I can, because then I don't have parents breathing down my neck while I'm trying to talk to my, my ward. Um, and so while I'm there, just kind of stand there and wait for them to get me my records if they've been particularly difficult about getting me records. Um, because if I'm there, they can't ignore me <laughs> as easily as they can ignore the fax. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to do two plugs, which are probably good to, to a, a later question, but um, the reason why you're going to get a different answer from each of us is because we probably all have the same form letter and I don't know, perhaps maybe I might've originated that letter. Um, knowing other GALs is super important and talking to other GALs on like, how do, how do you start your case and what do you do um, is so important, right? Um, and share, and we all share our work. Like seriously, I can't tell you how many people I've sent that form letter. I've sent my form questionnaire that I send mm -hmm. out. They all start to look alike. And you're like, I don't even know who started this. You know, somebody might've tweaked something in it, but then that they all really come like, including formatting, mm -hmm. um, which is hysterical. But I, I, interestingly enough, I think, um, I don't cite the code section. I never have. Um, I say, I have a court order, give it to me. Mm -hmm. I've never had pushback. Um, I, I think I also always ask when I'm standing there, um, because one, I get it and I get it faster, but two, it just kind of opens up an avenue to have a conversation with the person who's getting it because they know more about Jack than you think they do. Right. Um, and they will tell you things that are not going to be in the school records. Um, so I do a combination of both of those things. Um, I've never had to push back with the statute as a guardian ad litem. It's very different as, as a defense attorney, but as a guardian, I've never had to push back with the statute. The only other thing I'll throw out again, like kind of a practice tip type of thing is be mindful of what you do with them because the schools talk, the schools know who I am, okay? They know who Erica is, they know who Rebecca is. They, they know because we do enough volume that we're in and out of the schools. Be careful what you do with the school records and make sure that you are mindful of whether or not you are really allowed to further disseminate and what you can further disseminate. Um, be mindful about, you know, repeating what that nice person in the administration office just told you about Jack and his family, um, because that that kind of goodwill is just going to get you even farther. Um, and so if it was going to be the letter that gets bounced to the county attorney, it won't get bounced to the county attorney because you've not ever done anything that they think you are now like, you know, coming after them. Mm -hmm. um, so just be mindful of that. Obviously, there are legal obligations um, of what you do with records as well, but um, the way you treat the staff um, and the way you treat those that you decide you will contact because of something that's in the school record, um, those things will all come back to haunt you in the next 15 cases. Um, so just be mindful of that. It's really interesting that you don't have to cite the statute because we actually um, had a change in council for the school system in Richmond Public Schools recently. And the new council is actually suggesting that even the statute is not enough to get the records. Really? He wow. suggests that the FERPA counter, you know, is, is more uh -huh. important and without consent, he won't provide records. Wow. Very interesting new development. <laughs> yeah. So every locality is a little different, mm -hmm. but we should be able to get those records by statute without mm -hmm. consent. But if, of course, if you can get a consent, that's even, you know, more helpful. But we don't always have that ability. For it's also, I think, and it delays things if you have to get it. I'm sorry? It delays things if you yes. have to get it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like having to stand up to a judge and say, well, have you looked at this? And say, well, judge, I asked, but I, I haven't gotten it back mm -hmm. um, just because I like to be prepared. I've also had more pushback with private schools than okay. public schools. Absolutely. We are not nearly as known of an entity as a guardian at the light of what, what is that? Um, even in, frankly, some of the most contested um, custody and visitation litigations where the parents you're up in circuit they have hired you so um, this you know they have agreed everyone's on board and they are they are paying you to be the guardian which is a slightly different role than when you're appointed in the juvenile courts and so you'll go to a private school and oh, I'm, same thing as as Rebecca said meet the child at school I don't get the accusations of they said xyz because mom brought them or dad brought them it's the child's house when you think about it they spend so much time of their day there it's a very stable place 
And they, who are you? What do you do? And I recently had one say, well, you can't visit with the child. I had my order and um, we can't give you records. Our attorney will be in touch. And said, absolutely fine. Here's my card and went on my merry way. It, I wasn't going to gain anything to Jennifer's point of standing and, and at this particular juncture, it wasn't an emergency. I didn't need to see the child, um, but it also had some ramifications because I wanted for this child to come when no one knew I was coming. Mm -hmm. And so there was no way for mom or dad to prepare her um, to say whatever she was gonna say to me. And now I've lost that element of surprise because I got that pushback. And so I can certainly go again, but now as the guardian, I have to listen knowing the child may have been told what to say if I show up again. And so that is something that because I got that pushback, I lost that element. So I had to make a case judgment at that point. Was it worth standing there and saying, I'm not moving, get your lawyer on the phone or balancing everything else that I knew was also going on saying, well, it was a good shot. And that's a case by case analysis. You kind of have to get yourself in the moment. Yeah, that actually leads me to ask a question about how do you navigate challenges with parents, you know, when you're in the role of guardian life? It depends, which is the lawyer's favorite answer to any question. <laughs> um, it, it really does depend on what the case is. You know, if I've got a foster care case and the parent is non-responsive or something like that, that can lead to ramifications about whether or not that child's coming home, right? You know, um, if it's a custody case and the parent is being difficult, sometimes it's trying to figure out why because a lot of times it's because they don't understand your role and you've talked to that other parent and therefore you must be on that other parent's side. Mm -hmm. I had a situation, a situation with that literally yesterday where mom called me to rant about the fact that dad hadn't given the child medication recently and the child has to have the medication. I said, okay. So I called dad and said, hey, I hear the kid's supposed to be taking this medicine. What's going on? I don't know why she's calling you. He's taking this medicine. It's fine. You, why, why are you bothering me with this? And I pointed out to him, you know, this isn't a situation where I'm believing what she's saying, but she's given me this, con this concern. I have to investigate that. Part of that investigation is finding out if, you know, Charlie's actually taking the medication Charlie's supposed to be taking. Um, so some of it's kind of digging deeper. What is the issue? Um, it could be a, a, a language barrier. I've had that happen. It could be an educational barrier. You got to make sure you're talking to somebody at the level that they can understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's just, they don't have the time to talk to you and they don't want to talk to you. And this is all too much for them to handle. And it's hard to balance that out with representing your ward and representing what that child needs, but also understanding that people are human and that any case in front of the court is a hard case for a person to be there. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> that question. And how do you, how do you talk to the kids um, are like they're like nightmare questions, right? Because there's no, there's no answer. There's no real answer. Um, we could talk for hours. In fact, you could do an entire day seminar on that because it's an evolving process. I am not the same person that I was 17 years ago when I interviewed the first parent. And I don't approach cases the same way. I probably don't approach cases the same way as I did six months ago. Um, it's an evolving process. It's about human nature. It's about connections. It's about boundaries, knowing your own boundaries and your own roles getting burned, right? So my mom is my mom, my entire life has said, you learn more from a negative experience than a positive experience. No wiser advice is there. Um, so you get burned and you're like, oh, I'm not doing that again, right? Um, so it's an ever evolving process, but I think part of what, at least starting out, what I would say to people is, know your boundaries, know your roles, know your biases before you ever pick up that phone. Um, you need to be respectful of the fact that they may not have time, they may have emotions connected to the case, whatever it is, but also I'm not gonna advocate then you have that phone call at 8.30 at night because they work, okay? Because we have to have boundaries also. Um, but, and, and the other thing that I will say is, which is part of the reason, so my, my unofficial motto dubbed by my colleagues has always been, if both parents hate me, then I'm doing my job. Um, I. Don't make issues that aren't issues the court can't resolve. It is so easy to do that because they want to pick about everything, mm -hmm. right? The court is not going to tell you who can get Johnny's haircut. The court's not going to do it. So I'm not going to listen for an hour and a half about why mom says it should only be her and dad should say it's only him and at the barbershop. So you have to be able to say to them, 
I understand that it could be frustrating. That sounds like a co-parenting issue. That sounds like something you all need to be working out together. But in terms of the court process, legally, these are the things the court's going to focus on. So let's talk about that. Um, and you've got to do that without making them mad, right? Because there, there are the ones that are like, I just want you to listen to me about the, about Johnny's haircut. And if you're not going to, then I don't want to talk to you. And that's when you have to figure out, okay, I've been doing this long enough. I, got, I, know, I know how to go around. I can go around and represent my ward by going around. Um, it makes it harder and it's more work when you do it that way. But sometimes you do. Sometimes you have a parent who just isn't, isn't going to give you the information you need, will not talk to you, hires a lawyer who says, you're not talking to my, my client, whatever it is. Um, there are absolutely those cases. I mean, unfortunately, I've had custody visitation cases where the one parent never spoke to me, never, mm -hmm. because they hired an attorney who said, you can't speak to my client. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is, I don't know how this is going to go, um, but you're, you, and I tell the court. I feel like I was handicapped in my investigation because I only received information from one side and then funneled through an attorney if I even got information through the attorney um, because I want the judge to recognize why perhaps my, my recommendation sounds a little wonky based on what the judge has now heard. And that's because why well, I didn't know half of that before we walked in, not for lack of trying. I agree with that. I think it's a, a very evolving process to Jennifer's point. I, I don't practice it the same way I did when I started out, mm -hmm. um, you know, constantly calling and checking in. I, I'm going to have my initial, you know, questionnaire, and then I'm going to have a phone call. And then I, we follow up as needed after that. But if I have a parent that comes in and it's crickets and it's been crickets for four months and they come to court, well, well, you know, here's all these things. And I didn't hear from the guardian. It's like, well, did you pick up the phone? Did you reach out to me? How am I supposed to know this is going on if you don't bring it to me? Um, and I think I pushed back in that fashion far more than I did when I started. I also, um, in terms of boundaries and things like that, there have been some parents that I have taken off of a telephone and I'll say, you know what, all our communication at this point is going to be in writing. Mm -hmm. It will not be a telephone anymore. Yeah. Um, I've done that. Um, I have done where, you know, I'll only do letters, the old snail mail. Mm -hmm. And that's because I've had a parent that's called, yelled at me, screamed at me, cursed at me, accused me of things, accused my staff of things. I mean, so those are like extreme examples. That's certainly not the norm. And then the other thing I often find I have to um, educate parents on, you're supposed to be neutral. You're, no, I'm not. I'm not neutral. If I'm neutral, I'm not doing my job. My job is to advocate for the best interest of a child. I am zero assistance to the court. If I come up and give a recommendation and say, well, judge, I don't really have an opinion. I don't have a recommendation for the court. I'm neutral. I can see both sides. That's not what the court's appointed me to do. The court's appointed me to investigate and stand up before the judge and say, based on my investigation, and I often will start by saying, um, you know, if there's any opening from the guardian, all I'll do is say I've talked to, and I'll just kind of go through who I've talked mm -hmm. to, what I've done, just a very, here it is. So that to Ms. Newman's point, if I haven't talked to the parents, like, well, I called dad, left a voicemail, I've sent emails, I never got a response. You know, there's that judge, you can do with it what you will. But then I have to give a recommendation. And to give a recommendation in the best interest of a child means I've had to pick a side. I'm not neutral. I have had to make a choice to advocate for what is in the best interest of that child. So I find that's common. People expect you to be neutral. It's not the job. So would you have made that determination about what is in the best interest of the child? And part of what you recognize is that they need services. How do you go about getting those services funded, getting them in place, deciding which ones are- So I have actually filed chins myself mm -hmm. before. Um, so appointed on a private custody visitation litigation. And then I get into it and go, oh, heavens. And I'll go down and file a chins. Um, and that will, of course, trigger for the services, uh, rarely for supervision, but definitely for services. And then that will generally- trigger the ball rolling. Um, you can also only ask for foster care prevention off of a paper. As Ms. It, it, to her point, I, I called Jen, I don't know, a month or two ago. So I've got this terrible case. I can't, what's going on? I need foster care. I need foster care. And um, judge had me file a chins. And this is new because it used to be sometimes you would get foster care prevention plan in place without having a paper before the court where the court can remove a child. And that's what you need. And so I'm talking that through with Jennifer, that's why the chins is needed. And so I've done that too, to get foster care prevention in place to also help see what we can do and other services offered. So I filed those before. Can you briefly explain what a chins is? Oh, sure. A child in need of, well, I'm sorry. Someone else wants to talk? There are several. <laughs> <laughs> There's child in need of services and child in need of supervision. Um, essentially it's a paper before the court saying this child 
needs supervision. There's a lot of times it's truancy issue with kids not going to school, um, running away, that sort of thing. Uh, services, kid needs something and they're not getting it um, because either because the parents don't know how to access the services, they don't have the money for the services, or we just don't know what services they need. Um, so it, it puts some require puts the child before the court. There are some interesting ramifications to that in terms of the court can order the parents to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Court can order the child to do certain things. There can be um, show co criminal implications to that if the parents fail to do that, contempt of court issues if they fail to do it or the child fails to do something. Um, it can order foster care to be put, foster care prevention to be put in place. It can order the family to go to different um, services. Henrik, for example, and I do a lot of work in Henrico. So Henrico Mental Health, let's do us get evaluation, see what this family actually needs, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And transfer and custody can be transferred off of Yes. Which means they could in theory come away from mom and dad if neither is suitable and they can be put into foster care. Mm -hmm. And then that of course rolls a whole other process. Sometimes you have the same guardian, sometimes you don't. Depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what if it's a situation where you think it's actually appropriate for the child to stay in the home, but that they need additional services, grief counseling or whatever other services might help um, build up the protective factors in this family? How do you go about getting those funded? So I, I'll tackle that. So I don't know anybody who's been practicing less than five years who didn't come out of the mental health profession who can answer that question. And that's because it's different in every single jurisdiction, right? Which is why you hear you hear Erica saying, I practice in Chesterfield. You hear Rebecca saying, I practice in Henrico, because it matters. Mm -hmm. um, and it matters for those of us who do this to know who practices elsewhere in case we need to call that person mm -hmm. and say, the family has now moved jurisdictions. What, what is there? Um, and how do we access it there? Um, there are some things that statewide are sort of consistent, uh, not enough, I think, to be helpful. Um, so you have to know your jurisdiction. You have to know the people in the jurisdiction that have access access to that. So you need to have a connect at your at your local CSB, which is your community service board. You need to have a connect at the Department of Social Services. Um, you need to have a connect at your CSA office, which is sometimes inside um, the Department of Social Services. That's the um, that's that's the funding stream that comes down from the state for a lot of services. Um, you need to know your private providers. Um, yeah, I mean, I, because in a straight up custody and visitation case, a lot of times that's just me saying, listen, I know in Chesterfield, same day access at Chesterfield Mental Health, you can go there, mm -hmm. they will they will do an assessment immediately that day, and they will tell you whether or not they can meet your needs. Um, or I can say, I have worked well with these three counselors, and I think they're great for this age group. Mm -hmm. um, can't fix the funding issue, right? Um, and I, I stay away from, even though I'm sure everybody would really like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to suddenly become the health insurance Medicaid expert. I don't know. So when they say to me, does that provider take Medicaid? I don't know the answer. <laughs> Please call them and ask them. Um, I know about the community service board. I don't know about the, lo the local private providers. It's just too much information. At some point you have to kind of stop and be like, I can't, I can't be the one that holds that information. Um, so I can't always fix the funding piece, but I can at least direct um, to services. A lot of times, I don't know why, but a lot of times I will say things like, do you have private insurance? Have you called them? Like some people don't know that some private insurance has like a five day visit or, you know, five time visit for mental health services or something like that. They don't even know that. Um, and so I just happen to say it and they're like, oh, wait. And then they call and boom, now we've found this funding source that we didn't have before. Um, and then the rest of it is knowing, again, knowing what's out there. So most localities, you can ask for what's come up, called the community staffing, which is done through your FAP CSA office, but it's not an official request to go before FAP because we cannot do that um, as, the, as the GAL. But it gets a whole bunch of people at the table from the school, from local um, um, private agencies, from the state agencies, from the community services board, there's usually somebody there from the court services unit. Um, and you kind of just say like, this is what's going on in the home. And all of a sudden, and you're like at a table of experts, right? And all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, you need this kind of therapy and you need this kind of therapy and we need to hook you up with this mentorship program. And, and, and then they do that. And if something needs to be connected to a funding source, they can present it to fact. Um, so can there's knowing that. But... For one minute, Jen, I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Can you explain how we would get before that team? The community staff, call your CSA coordinator. 
And how do you find out who the CSA coordinator is? Mm, they're online now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot harder 20 years ago, but now they're now they're all listed online. There's a whole list under the um, the Children's Services Act is what CSA stands for, and it lists the coordinators across the Commonwealth. Um, but that's how you get before the, the the staffing. If you if it gets slightly more complicated and probably too complicated to, to get into here, but if you can take things before fact, then you are bothering that person. So if your kid is on probation, they can take things to fact. So you go to the probation officer and you say, Hey, listen, this kid needs to be in some kind of you know specialized grief counseling, whatever. Um, and they don't have any insurance that's going to cover that, you know, would you consider taking that to FAP? So knowing who a FAP case manager is um, becomes important, but it's it's something that you learn um, over the course of time. A probation officer is one, the court services unit is one, and if anybody, if they're connected with the community services board, they're another. Mm -hmm. GALs cannot, people will tell you all day long we can, there are limits to what GALs can do. We cannot ask for a case to go to FAP. We go to those meetings and we advocate, but we cannot ask for it to be. Heard. So did I hear you correctly that a probation officer starts that process with that? They, they can. can. Absolutely. They can. Who we else can them. besides a probation officer? Anybody, so, anybody connected to the, 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 the community services board. So if you've got anybody. If it's a, depart, if it's a foster care case, yeah. Department of Social Services mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. I've had Henry Recommend Health help mm -hmm. me get into that. Um, usually if I've got some, if I've got some tapped resource, if I can't get it there, they know somebody who can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think Part of the how to connect into the services is very dependent on what case kind of case it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, because obviously, if it's a Department of Social Services case, I'm reaching out to that social worker that's on that case. I'm reaching out to the department to say, we need a family, a, a, what's called an FPM, which is a family partnership meeting, um, to talk about what services this family needs. How are we funding those services? Do we need to take it to that? You know, if it's a chintz petition. DSS is often on those cases, so we can get it through there, or if there's some recommended health involved, they can often get me there as well. So it just really does depend on what kind of case it is um, to the point of, you know, IEPs, things like that. If I'm seeing the child struggle at school and it's a chin's petition, I can go to the school and request a child study. I can say, hey, this kid doesn't have an IEP. Maybe they should, or can we at least look at the possibility of why, why, why are we struggling here? We can request that as, mm -hmm. as guardian items if we're appointed. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing I think a lot of people forget with guardian items. When I'm appointed and when the case is over, that's the time I could do stuff. Mm -hmm. If the case is done, I have no more power. I have no more authority um, because my entire authority is derived from my order of appointment. So who can request a child study and what is a child study? You open the door. Oh, I open the door. So a child study is essentially what starts the process um, to see if a child needs an IEP or a 504 plan um, under the uh, at the school. I believe parents can request a child study, guardian ad litem can request a child study, and I believe a teacher can as well if a teacher is seeing the need for a child as well. I'm if that's, I don't know if that's an all-encompassing list, but those are the people that I know. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying the nodding of the heads over here. So yes. Um, so that's that's kind of one of those things. If you go to the school and say, we see a need here, please, can we try and see what we can do? They'll do it. Mm -hmm. They have to. Yeah, that's great. And can you also break down which kids go to CSA and which kids go to FAPT for the funding? Okay. And sometimes is there overlap? Um, there's absolute overlap because the CSA bucket is actually the bucket that funds that. Mm -hmm. So, but you said earlier, a probation officer would take it to FAPT, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not true with the CSA, if you go directly to the CSA for funding? So the, the CSA piece is, so many, many CSAs, again, which is who supports the local FAPT teams, will do what's called a community staffing. So it's, I call it like the unofficial FAPT. Because okay. you 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 cannot ask for money, but it is the room of experts that sit at your fact table that hear what's going on and say these are the things that are out there. Number one, and here's what we think would help, and here's how you access it. From that point, they can connect you to somebody who becomes your case manager who can take it to fact if there's a funding piece to it. Um, but it is it is a direct connection to services mm -hmm. and to knowing what's in your locality. Um, because again, it's, it is made up of, it is made up of FAP team members. It is usually larger than a FAP team. <clears throat> the community staffings are, <clears throat> um, but it is not a, 
it is not a formal, we're coming here to say, we need a psychological evaluation. Will you please pay for it? It's a, we're coming here. Here are all the issues that are going on in the home. Help us, right? Mm -hmm. So there's not even really a specific request for a certain something. Um, but the, the experts are at the table and someone says that sounds like the, a psychological is you know in need or an updated psychological for the child or a connection to grief counseling or family functional therapy or something. Um, and here's where you can go to connect yourselves to that. And again, if one of those pieces like a psyche valve ends up being something where there's a funding issue, um, as long as they've then connected the family to somebody who can become a case manager, that case manager can then take that to FAB. So it ends up being like a two-step, three-step process. I find it's a very helpful tool um, for individuals and families that may not have as much legal sophistication or understand the legal system. They don't have the money to pay an attorney. Um, and so if you're appointed as a guardian, um, private custody case, for example, and you see these things, but you don't have parents counsel, right? You're, you, we can't really give parents legal advice because our duty is to our, our child. We can give our child legal advice, right? We can do that, but we can't give it to the other parents. And so it's kind of, as Jen said, it's a go around to get the services in place that you believe serve your child's best interest, but in a way that you're not, you know, stepping on other toes and it's more effective. Um, and that's where I find it really, the staffing can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Terrific, so we're almost out of time. If you could each give us one thing you wish you had known when you first started working as a GAL, I think that would be really helpful. Um, so this is one thing that one of the guardian items that I trained with told me. Um, she was very, very blunt, which I think is important. Uh, you're going to do this job. Some days you're going to hate it. Uh, some days nobody is going to like you. Um, and they're going to tell you that everything is your fault. One, that doesn't make it true. <laughs> and two, there are going to be days where you it's worth every second of it. So it's just kind of one of those. If you know, if you love it, you love it. You're certainly not doing it to get paid. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it is. It's probably the most, um, <clears throat> in most ways, the most thankless job, um, except when it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's extraordinarily rewarding. Um, I think for me, it was, um, I didn't realize because I, I had not, I didn't know what a GAL was when I got recruited to come be a criminal defense attorney in juvenile court. I, I had no idea, I'd never heard the term um, and I'd been practicing four or five years. Um, but I, I don't think I realized how much people think we know <laughs> uh, and how much we can do and how unrealistic that really is. I, I did not know that, but I also didn't know that I also was gonna need to learn a lot of stuff about a lot of different things and have just the right amount of information um, to look somewhat competent, but be able to direct people in the right direction. I, I just, it, if you if you watch it in action, I just, I don't think that's obvious, right? We just look like the third lawyer in the courtroom mm -hmm. um, asking some questions, um, but what happens outside that courtroom is, is expansive. Um, and I just didn't know that. Um, same thing. I mean, I like to say it's kind of like neurosurgery, right? You, you practice for the 3% you know, you're going to lose 97% of your patients. You practice for that 3%. So I try to keep that in perspective on those days when everyone is telling you you're the terrible things, or they go on social media and they talk about how terrible this guardian ad litem was and how dare they, and they're a bad mother and blah, blah, blah whatever. Um, so you have to have a thick skin. I think I knew that going in. I too had a very blunt um, mentor. And I think that's kind of important now we've all said it. You, if you're going to do it, you've got to find mentors that are going to be there to send a text and say, I have this, can we talk? or what have you done? Um, having someone to soundboard and bounce with is so important, I think, in all areas of law, but especially in the guardian um, world as well. What I don't think I knew um, going into it was that it would make me a better lawyer. And the reason I say that is because by sheer virtue of being that third lawyer in the courtroom, I so early on in my career gained the ability to observe other more seasoned trial attorneys. And so it was very helpful for me, especially as a younger attorney, because I started guardian work pretty much the same time I came out and passed the bar. And so I was able to take things I liked here and I liked how that attorney did this. And so observing and then taking those things and putting them into my own practice. So I, I think that was something I went in because I wanted to advocate for the children who don't have a say sometimes in what's happening in their life if their mom and dad are separating. But ultimately, I think it's also made me 
a better attorney because I've observed um, other counsel and frankly, I've observed the judges. And so I feel like I have a pretty good feel now if I have a private client come to me to say, well, this is how this is probably going to go. This is what we need to really be looking at. And so I think it's really complemented my practice by, by having both. Terrific. Thank you. I think we have time for one question quickly. If anybody has a burning question they want to ask the panel. Yes. Yeah. I've had experiences with GIS and other public school teachers, and I have been just kind of like hyper focused on what the child needs, and sometimes we even ask teachers. Like I just had good experiences. I have parents. Sometimes I can get kind of heated. So I just wonder do you all ever have? Someone come, I know you're a lawyer, but do you ever have someone just come with you to be a second set of eyes and ears when parents are involved so that they can be a witness to that? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. No, no that, that's like that's that's all the heated <laughs> parents get so excited, and I'm like, they only care about you. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, yes, you have to be careful with that, but yes, um, I, I used to, not anymore, um, but I. I used to, if my door was forbidden and the parent was in there, it's because I wanted other ears, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody was sitting in, but there, were enough, there was enough business in the building. I wanted other ears. Um, I have absolutely brought my investigator with me um, to home visits when I either, she happened to also be a former police officer, if I either was concerned about my safety um, or I was concerned about um, you know, a heated confrontation. Um, those are also the cases, though, where you have to stop and say, do I need to have that conversation? Can I say it's only by email? Um, is it only by phone? Um, and so that's that's where really being able to assess what your job is and what the actual issues are in, in the in the case and what information will be gained. Because, uh, I mean, you know, there are just some cases where, you know, every single time it's that down on the other phone, it's not going to be pleasant. And if, if you're not getting any, that's, it makes it hard because it doesn't repair any relationship. But if I'm not getting anything in terms of my investigation to further the best interest of the child, then why am I participating in it? Um, and then you're not, you're just not going to be fan of any of this. But I think most, professionals would say exactly what you just said. And that's because we're dealing with you on a professional level. We're trying to deal with a parent on a professional level who's not dealing with us on a professional level and is very emotional. And on top of that, again, kind of how I got the reputation, I'm pointing out your deficiencies, right? For each of you, both mom and dad. And they don't want to hear that from me. Um, and, you know, and they don't ever expect, but almost always get, you know, I need to have physical custody now because Joey's failing math. Well, when I go talk to the teacher and I find out, well, it's also because by the way, you don't, the other parent doesn't even bring the kid to math class in the morning because they're tardy every one of those days. Well, it, now I'm shining light back on you and you're the one who made the complaint about the other parent and they don't, they don't like that. And so you're always going to have a little bit of that. Um, but yeah, you have to be careful about having, having somebody there. You don't have an attorney client relationship with that parent. So you're not violating anything there. Um, but it does need, you need to think about who it is, right? And most of us, I mean, me in particular, I'm a solo. Um, so when I had the investigator there, I mean, I paid her out of my own pocket because there is no such funds for a guardian item. So that was out of my own pocket. Um, and, but she was my employee. She was my contract employee. Um, and so if you don't have that situation, it gets a little kinky, but I, I definitely had the open door rule. Um, and, and people knew if I had the door open, it's because I was concerned that things were going to take a turn or any moment I was going to have to say, you know what, this is not a productive meeting and we're ending it. And, and what I try to do is if there's somebody else in the case, uh, a lot of times if we're, I've got some a parent that's that acrimonious or difficult, there's somebody, another professional in the case mm -hmm. that can help. For example, if it's a foster care case, you got a social worker, mm -hmm. go to do the home visit with the social worker, mm -hmm. you yes. know, or if it's a case where you've asked the court for CASA, which is court appointed special advocate, they're volunteers that write reports to the court. You can do your meeting, your, your visit with the CASA worker that's on the case. The other reason I do that is because in all likelihood, they're already going to be to court, in the courtroom. So if I need them to testify, they're already there. I've already got them there. I don't need to worry about subpoenaing yet another person to the courtroom because they're already there. So the good news is we have time for a few more questions because uh, one of the members of the next panel is running a little bit late. So there was, there if there are other questions, we'd love to hear them. Yes. 
how your cases come to be gender. So are most of the cases that you currently have uh, cases of students who are in foster care or families who are going through divorces and then there's been some kind of deferral? I think you explained this earlier, but I'm just a little curious about that. And the second part of my question, what's the, how do you know when it's over, where your world has ended? Um, and what are the, like, I, I'm just so I'm going to answer the second question first, <laughs> Wait, um, because it's, it is confusing to people, but it's super bright and clear. Um, you get appointed and not, and, and we are not talking about circuit court cases. Okay. Um, I know Erica brought them up, but they're, they're just another beast, but <laughs> you get appointed based off of a petition that's been filed or a motion to amend in the, in the court. Okay. It has a case number. When that case number has a final order, you're done. Okay, so if you're appointed on a petition for custody and visitation um, for Joey and that you have a trial two months later and there's a final order giving custody to, to dad and mom has visitation, you're, you're finished, no matter what else might be going on. You might still be in the process of connecting to services and, you know, working on a child studying all that kind of stuff. But that, that's why that first question about a special education case was really hard for us to answer, because it, it is literally that clear um, that when that First, and it's all controlled by case numbers because of the way um, the juvenile court came into inception. So that case number is what controls it. So even if other things are filed, if you're not appointed on those other things, your appointment ends when that first case is finished. Final order. Yep. Processes, and then your it ends. Yep. And then who looks out for the child? Well, you you hope to God that the parents are. <laughs> Um, and, and then you navigate the phone calls from the parents because they're like, Miss Newman. And I'm like, I am. And, and that becomes super weird, right? Because you mm -hmm. want to be helpful, right? Because you want to make sure that they still follow through. But at the same time, so that's a lot of, I don't have the authority to do anything, but you know, those are the names that I gave you. I'd encourage you to call them <laughs> um, and schedule an appointment, but you don't, we don't have any, we only operate by, by, by court order. So once the court order is no longer a valid court order, we have no authority to do anything. And so it, it, it's a fine line and parents don't really understand it when you're trying to follow up, but it's, it's that definitive. Sometimes it's helpful too. So if you've got private custody petitions, um, you know, as a practicing attorney, if one side filed, you want to file because if the other party, the petitioner withdraws, the mm -hmm. case is done. Mm -hmm. And so if you are afraid after hearing it's like, oh, waffling's like, whoa, we don't need the, if I'm going and filing the chins, well, now that's my motion. I'm now in control of when I pull that motion or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times it's being proactive with what you're filing to keep the chins case number alive, even if yeah. someone over here that you can't control kills the custody and visitation case number, so. And and there are some caveats to that. I've had judges, for example, leave me on a case even after a final order for a certain number of days so that I have the ability to file something if I need to. Um, and I've certainly, again, filed things in the effort to try to stay on a case because if that case filing goes away, then I'm out of luck and that kid can be. Mm -hmm. but, but to Jen's point earlier of you learn more from your mistakes then from your um then your successes i had a situation where i had a ward who had my contact information contact me after the case was over and i told her i would call her back after i had an answer for her and i got an angry phone call from the dad who act correctly told me i didn't have any right to speak to his kid and if i did he was going he was going to file all sorts of things could he probably file all the sorts of things that he threatened no but i didn't have authority to speak to that child and so dad absolutely had the right to tell me i couldn't and actually it hurt my relationship with that kid to the point because i didn't follow through with what i had said i was going to do to the point where when it came time for that child to have a new guardian uh, to have a guardian ad litem reappointed and often they will reappoint the same guardian ad litem to the case if the case comes back before the court so that that child doesn't have to relearn a relationship. Mm -hmm. I made the decision to not be that child's guardian item again, because I didn't, I think that that child needed somebody that they could think, believe would follow through. And I had, I had heard that for them. And that was, that was my bad, you know, <laughs> but you learn from your mistakes. And your first, the first part of your question is everything you can think of. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 you know, and I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant, but literally everything you can think of. Um, in the custody and visitation cases were appointed, in Chin's cases were appointed. You're absolutely appointed on an abuse and neglect, which mm -hmm. turns into a foster care case. You can be appointed on a family abuse protective order. You can be appointed on a judicial bypass. You can be appointed on a delinquency case as the GAL. You can be appointed on a criminal case as the GAL for the victim. 
I mean, and it, I mean, it for just protective order for because a, the, there's the caveat in that statute. I think it's I think it's subsection G is basically anytime the judge thinks it's a good idea <laughs> um, if it's in juvenile court. And so it that's that's kind of where that jack of, you know, jack of all trades, master of none comes from, because it's it's everything you can think of. And sometimes it's things you're like, I, I, I've never done this. And I that's why I'm you out to your cup. <laughs> you know, I've um, had this. Have you ever had it? So, yeah. So it, the cases are varied, probably more so than in any other kind of practice. Yes. I have a question in the custody context, and it's regarding the issue of sole educational decision making. <laughs> <laughs> we just started talking to the judges. Yes, yeah, we did. <laughs> so, what's your question? It's a huge big deal because, unfortunately, there are some schools who will use that acrimonious relationship between the parents and both the qualify. As a parent under the DPA, to play them against each other. One parent knows the child's disabilities, believes the child even has a disability, is advocating the other parent knows nothing, and just wants to stick it to them. And so the schools are sending IEPs and backpacks. So maybe in this scenario, dad who's willing to stick it to mom and signs it, thereby officiating the parent's right to think about the process or do other things because a parent. Has consented to what the school wanted to do. So it, it can be a huge problem, especially. Mm -hmm. So I spoke on that panel to the judges last <laughs> 90 <laughs> minutes. Um, oh, yeah. On this it, one topic. Yeah. Um, and it, hopefully, GALs are learning that and understanding that because, you know, judges don't want to make that call um, for a lot of reasons. A lot of them are very legal reasons about not wanting to make that call, about giving one decision, you know, one parent decision-making power over the other. Um, but those are the types of scenarios where the judges would would give it more thought. Um, you know, part of what we talked about is, you know, what is the actual issue? You know, is it one parent sticking it to the other parent? Um, you know, or is it a religious exemption? We don't want the child medicated. And we you, so it's very, you know, it's, but the judges, need, the GALs need to be able to access that information well enough to present it to the judge so that the judge has all of the information about mm -hmm. if you don't make this decision, here's what's playing out or here's what could play out. Mm -hmm. And I would also argue that that's part of the reason it's so important to reach out to the school to get the records, mm -hmm. because I cannot tell you the number of times that I've either gone to the school to talk to a kid, or I've sent the letter to get their school records and had a counselor call me back and go, oh, thank God this child has a guardian yes. item. Can I talk to you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Which, of course, I want to talk to that person right away. <laughs> um, but if I haven't asked for those records, unless a parent tells you I'm involved, y'all aren't going to know. The school's not going to know. And actually, that brings up an interesting point about what Rebecca was talking about, with, you know, like a child reaching out to you afterwards. I can't tell you how many times I've been called because some school staff member has seen my name in the file. Mm -hmm. And gotcha. I'm like, yes, I was. And the case is over. And I can't, I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I get, I know why they're calling me. You know, I'm on the, I'm on the custody visitation order. They can see that I was at the IEP meeting that, you know, and they're like, oh, well, you know, you're, you're this child's guardian at line for life. And it's like, mm, doesn't work that way. And, and the parents aren't currently fighting in court. Um, but I'll be calling you if they do, um, <laughs> when they do, because yeah. all, because all the courts really there, there's a, there's not really a mandate, but there's a very strong suggestion that it should always be the same guardian ad litem if they're willing to accept the appointment that's for consistency, not just for the child, but across the board, um, for the, for the, the same reason they sign mm -hmm. the same judge, um, to every filing that comes in on that family. So, and it is, I mean, I was uh, on the phone, I guess. Wednesday with one of the school board attorneys for Chesterfield because a mom had shown up at the school and I had been there to visit with my my child earlier I think a week or two before and so of course there's my name in the file and then the mom's having a moment in her feelings um and it was really <laughs> raising a stink and you need to call and so I picked up the phone and called the county attorney I was like here I am what can I do for you what do you need from me and it was an interpretation and accuracy of a protective order that governed whether or not mom could have contact um, with the child. And then what was the current legal status? Was there a valid court order? Um, so interpreting and kind of confirming for them with that too. That's one of the first times I've actually had that come up. So it's always something, mm -hmm. um, always. but yes. One last question. Yes. Uh, Right. So how often do the judges actually go with your recommendation? And if they don't go with the recommendation, just an example of why they didn't. 
So I'm, I'm going to say that that's a tough question because, um, um, so technically your recommendation is based on your investigation as well as the evidence to the court. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, I think we have a lot of really good GNLs in this program, and we have a lot of really bad ones. Um, you can't stop forgetting that you're a really student. Uh, because sometimes, and again, this is one of those learn from your mistakes, sometimes your recommendation then is like, what? And it's because it's based on your investigation, but you didn't provide any of that evidence. So the judge doesn't understand what you're making. Um, or you didn't ask the parent who might have provided you with more information the right question. So again, the judge is like, I don't know why you're, and, and in that case, not following the recommendation. Because it, to them, it makes no sense because they've got to make a decision based on the evidence. Um, and I, I will say that that's one of those places where, yes, judges do appreciate us. I do not agree that things are where they were 17 years ago. I don't think our recommendations carry the way they did 17 years ago. Um, I think judges have heard enough about you need to make your decision based on the law and the facts that are in front of you. Um, and I think sometimes for them, it's really hard when they have a really experienced GAL who's been for a really long time to make a recommendation that doesn't quite fit with what they heard. Um, but I think they're making the right call and they're, they're, they're following the law based on the facts of what they've heard today, not necessarily the recommendation. So I think it's a different, I think it's different than it was 17 years ago. Um, we, we can bring the dirt back. Right, because we've done the investigation, and that's why you can't forget to be a lawyer because we, we can't forget, oh, well, how do I get that? I need that witness there. Mm -hmm. I need Casa to testify that they saw the bomb because I can't say I saw the bomb because I can't do this. Um, and you can't just rely on it. Well, somebody might have written that something in the report, right? Because so maybe the report doesn't come in. So don't forget that you're a lawyer. And, and so I, I always, when I'm training young GAOs, I always say, Figure out what your recommendation is sooner than you think you should, and then figure out what you need to make that recommendation make sense. Because you have to be able to back it up the time to get records, to get witnesses, um, you know, whatever else you might need, so that the judge has the information that they need. But I, I don't, I don't think, and because of that, I, I don't track it anymore. I think there's a lot of um, more oftentimes one side versus the other. If they have an attorney, they all have to be. Right, because it's the easy way out. And I can say it's not very good. Um, so I think they more often accept it, you know, as a whole than even the judges do. I think the judges still try and put a little bit of a tweak on it. And then you also have judges who will never ever follow a specific recommendation that you have, like on a specific topic, because you know that judge. But as the GAL, if you still think that's what's best, you got to make that recommendation. So if you know the judge is never ever going to do week on week off during the school year, but you think that's what's best in this case, you got to recommend it. Mm -hmm. Even even though you know, you know that judge is going to say no every time. And so being a lawyer, sometimes it means you have to. I hate to subpoena a teacher or a guidance counselor because I, I'm daughter of an educator. I, I I know what it means when you have to sit there and make sub plans. So when I have to be the lawyer and I there is no other way for me to get it in, but then through a direct witness subpoena, I have to issue it. But I do try to always call in advance and say, I am so sorry. <laughs> Here's the date. Cause we know the trial date two or three months, sometimes more in advance. So we try to give as much notice, but um, no, if we subpoena you, it's cause we probably have no other choice and we have to be able to support our recommendations. So I think there is absolutely that perception, mm -hmm. um, particularly with, say, pro se parents mm -hmm. of, oh, the judge is just going to rubber stamp whatever the guardian ad litem says. Mm -hmm. I hear that all of the time. And I will tell you that I often hear the judge say, I agree with the guardian ad litem. I would posit that a lot of times they're agreeing with me because I have roadmapped them to that with my questions or my evidence that I've presented to the court so that when I make my recommendation, I can point directly to, and dad testified that this mm -hmm. was happening and mom testified to this was happening was the evidence shows the court, just like any other lawyer with a closing mm -hmm. argument, my recommendation points to those things. I might add a little weight to it by saying, and I've done the investigation by talking to this person, this person, this person, this person. So the court knows that I've done my job before I walked into that room. But if the court is... I will tell you, I very rarely ever looked at a judge and said, why did you agree to my recommendation? I didn't, I didn't put the evidence out there for you. And I think if you've done your job as a guardian ad litem, they might agree with you. And I've had judges where I've done that and they go, I hear you. I don't agree. And they've done something completely different. And then I have an obligation to decide if I need to appeal it. 
Mm-hmm. Because as a gar- as the child's guardian light up, I too have to make a decision if that if I truly think that's not correct for my child, I need to appeal it. Mm-hmm. And then your appointments. Continue. All right. And then my appointment it's continues forever and ever, and ever and ever and ever. <laughs> I think we need to wrap up. Yep. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you so much, Professor McConnell and all of our excellent GALs for being with us today. Um, Next is our third practitioners panel, which is our judicial advocacy panel. So we'll have the Honorable Judges Langer, Landry, and Campbell, moderated by Professor Kevin Woodson. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, We are in a crunch for time. We have three distinguished guests and not a whole lot of time to, to get their insights. So I'm just going to jump right in and get started. Uh, If each of you could please introduce yourselves and and tell everyone where you preside and how long you've been on the bench and how you got there, that'd be great. Want me to start? Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judge Landry, and I sit in uh, Colonial Heights, um, Juvenile Domestic Relations Court, and also Chesterfield County uh, Juvenile Domestic Relations Court. I've been on the bench for nine years, and how I got there, I believe it was a miracle. And... um, Yeah, I wrote the Vatican. Uh, They have not assigned an inquisitor yet to come out and investigate that, but I'm I'm going to urge them to. Thank you. I'm Mary Langer. I'm a judge in the Richmond Juvenile Domestic Relations Court. Um, I took the bench in 2016. I think that's right. And uh, I'm going to also a miracle, but um, prior to taking the bench, I was a prosecutor in the city of Richmond and also in Chesterfield County, focused my practice on um, complex child abuse and domestic violence cases. Um, I also did a little stint at the AG's office where I met Judge Campbell for the very first time. And uh, I started my career as a public defender in the city of Richmond. Uh, My name is Richard Campbell and I uh, was on the Juvenile Domestic Relations District Court in the city of Richmond for almost 16 years. And Judge Langer and I worked together there many years. Uh, Before that, I was a state and federal prosecutor and also in the attorney general's office. Uh, I went on the circuit court in the city of Richmond about a year ago, Um, went to law school here and uh, teach a class on um, family law procedure, um, if anybody's interested in that next semester, so. Great, thank you. Uh, And the, the next question is for judges Langer and Landry in particular. Uh, how would you describe your role as a judge on the juvenile and domestic relations court? What are some of your powers and duties there? I go first. Sure, you go first. Okay, I'll, I'll correct first. you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have two sentences written. Try to condense it. Um, my background, I'll just say, is a is a guardian lion. Uh, I served as a guardian lion for twenty four years before I took the bench. And um, it kind of consumed my practice. I had a general practice of mostly a solo practitioner. And um, um, that's just sort of to um, explain the following two sentences, I suppose, is that what I see my role as, what I see, what I see my role as now, after, um, uh, after a few years on the bench and um, the years uh, before that was to, I wrote to help young adults in particular to become resilient. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later, but that is the overarching umbrella from my point of view, all right, in terms of, and I think it replaces a word, uh, the word is compliance, um, which is something that we get sort of uh, tied into in terms of complying, having young adults check all the boxes in terms of what they're supposed to do, such as go to school, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I've been trying to shift my thinking into trying to help young adults to overcome challenges because that's why they are there. They have particular challenges and how can we do that, whether it's through services or otherwise. Uh, I also wrote my second major sentence is to uh, help, um, let's see, parents and children survive the crisis. I often uh, uh, tell parents that uh, what uh, I see my job is is to help their children survive their dispute. And, um, uh, And secondly, everyone who comes into our court, I believe is at some level of a crisis and so, that's the assessment from my point of view in terms of uh, looking at their needs and trying to address those. I'll give a bit of a more technical answer just to make sure that everyone understands the, 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 the scope of cases that the juvenile court hears um, is pretty broad. So um, today, for instance, I did child support enforcement. Um, also crisis times, but a little bit different than might we might be thinking of with guardian items and children per se. 
Um, there's also custody and visitation and, and private child support matters, um, spousal support. There is the delinquency matters where young people are charged with offenses that would be criminal offenses if they were over the age of 18. Um, chins matters, so kids who are in need of services that they aren't able to access without the court's assistance. Um, attendance issues that might be also charged under truancy, uh, chins petition. And then there's the adult offenders where there's domestic violence, so intimate partner violence um, as defined by the code. So those, those adults and children um, that come before the court. And so, um, yes, everybody we see is perhaps at a bit of a crisis point. And our, I certainly agree that we're trying to help them through that and hopefully grow uh, from the, the problems that have brought them there. Um, but it is a broad, broad authority and jurisdiction that the juvenile court um, manages. Foster care too, you may have mentioned that, but that's not that. foster care. Um, and I would just say from my perspective that in according to the code, you probably know this, the circuit court has concurrent jurisdiction with the juvenile domestic relations district court. So certainly things are appealed to us, but we also have concurrent jurisdiction. So all the, that, that broad um, uh, scope is also part of what uh, is the work of the circuit court. So I have a follow-up question for you, Judge Campbell. Uh, now that you presided on both courts, could you tell us about some of the differences or how your, your prior work on the JDR court has informed your work on this court? Well, it certainly has. I, I mean, I think one of the reasons that the General Assembly asked me to serve when they did was because it had been since my predecessor, Judge Jenkins, went to the circuit court that someone had gone from our court to the circuit court. And there are um, particularly in issues like foster care, um, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, support, but probably more juvenile uh, criminal matters. There, There is an expertise that we have in the juvenile court that, that is just particular to what we do. Um, so that has helped me out a great deal. Um, and it's helped me be able to, I was just relating to, to my friends, uh, be of assistance to my colleagues who may not have had as, as much experience in, in what we do. Um, certainly a court of record. And so when you're in the juvenile domestic relations court, very high volume um, and, you know, it's million served. And so uh, it's, it's um, I, I don't know that I think the pace is as different as it is just being mindful that you're on the record uh, and things are a bit more deliberate. Um, but the issues are really similar. Um, and it's interesting when you have an appeal, remember in Virginia, we have trial de novo appeals from the district court. So we're really starting over. So I'm using the very same things that I was using in the Oliver Hill course building and the John Marshall course building. It's just a new day. Thank you. Uh, and so the next question is sort of a broad question for whoever wants to take a crack at it. And it's when the facts of a particular case require you to balance different or even conflicting interests between children, parents, uh, guardians ad litem, uh, DSS, et cetera. How do you go about doing so? Sure. All right. Um, <laughs> what's the load star? The best interest of the child. That's where your focus needs to be. That's the way that I see it. And yes, everyone has um, um, interests in it. I had um, a parent who filed a motion to amend and what he cited as the uh, reason why there should be a change in the custodial arrangement is he said, because I deserve as much as the other parent does. And how I responded to that is I said, um, sir, uh, it's not about what you deserve. And ma'am, it's not about what you deserve. It's about what your children deserves. So that's, I think, is the lodestar in terms of trying to balance the various interests is you have to focus on the interests of the child that's involved. Uh, and there's really no other answer than that, right? That, that's what is, that's the reason we're sitting in the spot that we're sitting in is to try to discern what is, what, what structure of whatever matter we're taking up, foster care, custody visitation, a delinquency, um, uh, disposition is serving the child's interests. And so the, uh, there shouldn't be a conflict of interest. There might be different opinions about how that interest is served, but everyone who's working in the court should be trying to explain to, to me, the fact finder, why 
their position is in the best interest of the child. And I, you know, I, we don't have a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers who appear in custody visitation cases in, our, in the Richmond court. I think Chesterfield has a great deal more, but um, you know, I often have a lawyer who just says, it's the it, this is the best interest. And I was like, well, uh, that's my, that's what I'm gonna decide. <laughs> I understand that's what I'm supposed to do. I need some facts. I need some evidence. I need some information that's going to help help me agree with you, right? If you're right, that's great. But tell me how that is, and or something that I can at least consider so that I'm certain that um, the best interests of the child are served. You can't you can't just tell me. And I often see the pleading that is, what's the change? You know, why the change to the custody? Why the change to the custody order? It's in the best interest of the child. And again, I'm like, well, that's kind of the whole point. So, right? so much like when people are seeking protective orders and they say they threaten me, I said, well, how about you tell me what they said and let me decide if it's a threat. So, right. Help me. Give me some facts and then see if I can come to the same conclusion. But but help me. Yeah, I, I was with uh, one of our uh, colleagues, my former colleagues at the um, JDR court, and she was saying that in either her first or one of her confirmation hearings that one of the legislators said about being a juvenile domestic relations district court judge, it's just the best interest of the child. How difficult can that be? Well, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, and and what, what uh, my friends and colleagues have indicated here uh, tells you why. I do think to your question, there are competing interests that then you have to stack up against as you're determining the best interest of the child. So for instance, parents are, are, they have a primacy of interest. And we run into that a lot in Richmond because we have a lot of grandparents with deep abiding interests in their grandchildren. And sometimes we have to look at them and say, you had your turn and mom and dad are now rearing this child. And you may think you know better than your child, but you know, that kind of thing. You have the competing interest between parents sometimes in DSS and you have kind of an ongoing struggle of, is the child gonna go back home to parents who maybe have some challenges or is DSS on a road to either, you know, long-term foster care or adoption. So I do think you have these things that stack up against, you know, what competes against uh, each other uh, for the best interest of the child. So uh, I guess moving to the, the children in need of services context, uh, could you explain as you see it, uh, why is it important to ensure that young people in need receive the right services? So what are the possible consequences of, of getting it right or, or children falling through the cracks and not getting those services? Um, again, I tried to condense it into uh, one uh, sentence. Um, my response is that there's little possibility of appropriate change without appropriate services. And uh, so if you don't match up the services with the actual need, or if you don't understand the need in the first place, what chance do you have? Uh, I guess you have a blind chance that you'll get it right. But um, so that's my response. Well, there's an escalation of problem, right? I mean, what what's the, what is the need that the service is being addressed to? So, I mean, mental health issues, we, I mean, we've had a pretty good example this week of what happens when mental health goes unchecked, right? Um, or untreated and, and access is a big issue for many of, many of the services. And so um, an exacerbation of the problem, even absent of curing, actually addressing the problem, we've got to try to keep at least the status quo. Um, but we know that ch delinquent children will dive deeper into the system and, and that's not a good outcome without the proper services so that uh, trying to avoid sort of this checklist of we'll do these three things for every child that's not every child needs those three things they may need other eight things they may need one of those things they may you know we, we've got to be matching the services to the needs of the individual child in order to avoid any further problems and that's probably the hardest part is to not kind of fall into some kind of cookie cutter response yeah, I think that in a city like Richmond, a Chen's um, petition, be it child need of services or child need of supervision, you got to think about the fact that by the time a parent or a guardian or a school has gotten to where they're, they are swearing out a court paper for help with a child, things are at a rough place and, and people need help. And, you know, we handle our chins in such a way that we are fairly clear uh, that this is not, you haven't been charged with a crime. 
You know, I used to have my my uh, young people either contest it or not contest it, not plead guilty or not guilty. And part of the reason was because you just need to release those services. These people just need some services in place. So Judge Langer came up with a past docket, which is related in, in terms of getting the citizens to a place where they can avail themselves of, be it, you know, uh, school resources for a truant child or a child that's not being sent to school or mental health uh, services. But it's hugely important in terms of, of the court acting on it, because when people come, it's really a cry for help. <clears throat> and I guess to, to back up a bit, uh, what kinds of actions or services can you provide? So either uh, you know, in the chins, in cases of delinquency cases or uh, with respect to chins petitions, what kind of services do you provide or can you provide? Lots. <laughs> there you go. I, and I think the, the first step is assessment. You have to really understand what the needs of the family are, and particularly with regard to chins, because usually I think it's the tip of the iceberg is what you see. A child's not going to school. All right. That's not the problem, okay? There's a lot of underlying problems, typically, as yes, mental health services. It may be lack of medical care. Um, it may be, let's see, what else I must, oh, parents. well, parents. Parents may be a very dysfunctional household. I've seen a lot of that. And um, so then you try to match up those services after you do that initial assessment, whether it's a mental health assistance for the parents. Um, I've seen a lot of effectiveness with parent coaches, all right? Because uh, when you have a dysfunctional, I shouldn't, shouldn't call them dysfunctional parent, but a parent who has a lot of challenges in terms of just scheduling or those sorts of things, attaching someone who is their own coach as to how to help out, you know, not only are they handing them a piece of paper saying, here's, a, here's an agency you can call and seek help, but to help them in terms of, well, let's sit down, let's plot it out in your phone as to who you need to call for what. And in fact, let me make the first call for you and calls up to the pediatrician's office look, we'd like to bring in Johnny and mom's right here next to me because Johnny needs some sort of assessment in terms of uh, medical care and that. And, uh, and then I think the, you know, besides medical, mental health, parent coaching, um, and with the first part being the assessment, uh, housing is also a critical need. And I think, I, I know in Richmond, it's a critical need. And I know in Colonial Heights, it's, it's a real issue. You know, people are subject to eviction and, um, and they're in and out of multiple homes so within a short period of time. That really affects a child in multiple ways. So, so my first answer to that question is that I don't provide services, right? Uh, well, yeah. we, are not, we are not the people who provide services. I am not an expert in service providing. I have a pretty good idea of of agencies and, and methods of treatment that are available in the community that, I, that respond to different needs. But it is about getting families to professionals who, who can do the work. And the court doesn't vet those people, but for delinquents, say for children on probation, right? The, um, the court services unit has vetted um, people who have applied to be vendors of services and hopefully confirm that they are doing evidence-based practices with current treatment methods that are effective and that they are following through with ongoing evaluations to determine that the people who say they're serving the kids are serving them, that they're showing up when they say they're showing up, they're giving them the hours of, of service that they need. And so it is about, it's about Marsh, our role, my role, I believe, is to give the incentive to go and do and make that make the assessment appointment, make it, get to it, follow through on, on the appointments that are needed. And substance abuse is another avenue right. that wasn't mentioned, but right, there's great, many, many, many avenues, but encouraging being, being the, the carrot and the stick that helps people ad admit or accept that this is something that's needed so long enough that they can see the benefit and they'll take it on and do it themselves. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, sustaining a chance petition releases basically funding. It's the, the money is then going to be there for the child to have the services. Um, I, I, I think that you can see here, too, that there's there's layers here. Um, there are parents that need services. And I am a big one on asking, where are the parents? 
Because too many times when the cases get to my court, we have a really bad situation with a young person who's committed a really bad criminal act. And the question does need to be asked, where were the parents? Well, when we're at this juncture, perhaps we can put some of these services in place to make sure the parents are coming to the table. But then we've got services for the children uh, as well. So a lot of layers. And as Judge Langer says, it's a matter, I think, of, of getting those resources to, to the families. And uh, Judge Langer, could you tell us more about the PASS uh, docket and your work with that? I would love to. Um, this is my pet project. Ms. Uh, Professor McConnell um, graciously donates her and her students' times to help to help make this work. Um, and it's in, her work is an integral part of it. So um, as I said, I was a prosecutor in the state of Richmond before I took the bench. And I sat on, I don't, I can't count the number of committees and task force and working groups and whatever other phrase you can put for people sitting down to talk about how truancy issues and how how we would improve the attendance in Richmond public schools. And in many of those meetings, I would say, I think we should start with elementary school kids. And, and if we don't change what's happening in elementary school, I don't think we're going to really make any difference. And people would get mad at me and tell me I was throwing away a generation of people and I didn't really mean that. I didn't mean don't do anything about them. I just meant, why aren't we doing something for elementary school kids? And so when I took the bench um, and our bench and our court became fully, um, the bench became fully filled. When our fifth judge came back, there was a little bit of a little bit more freedom in some of my docking time. And so I went to um, the person at Richmond Public Schools who had been in the same number of work groups and discussion groups and task forces that I had been and was equally frustrated with really never getting to really try something new and different. And I said, so how about we do this now? And she said, can we really? And I said, well, it's just you and me talking. So <laughs> you know, let, let, what, what, what would it look like if we could do the thing that we really wanna do? And we came up with this idea that we would hold um, a docket outside of the courthouse. We would have it at a school. So we would show parents that schools were the school was where we wanted everyone to go. We would focus on um, elementary school children up to the sixth, seventh. I think we've had a couple eighth graders because of just because kids need siblings and things, but primarily um, elementary, middle school. And we would invite um, service providers to come, we call it our vendor group, to come to the same location um, and, and we would connect them to these people on that day. Uh, so RBHA is there, social services is there, VCU Health is there, um, all of the service providers from within the school system. So community schools, their health people, um, their security groups, um, uh, the trauma-informed care network um, quick offered to help to offer some resiliency and trauma-informed things for the parents. Um, who am I missing? McKinney Vento for the housing, uh, the housing issues. So transportation can be arranged for kids. Uh, we also have um, Central Virginia Legal Aid there because particularly post, well, I guess you realized it pre-COVID, post-COVID is another whole discussion. Um, Central Virginia Legal Aid came for the eviction issues because so many of our parents were, were really unstable uh, in their housing. So the a petition is that the parents are identified by the school system as not having enrolled their children properly or not the kids not attending properly. And by not attending properly, I mean, most of our cases have 50 to 80 absences. There's only 180 days in a school year, by the way. Um, so, they're identified, a petition is brought through the court that's called a parental participation petition, not easy to say, um, that says the parents have not engaged with the school properly to ensure that their child attends properly. And you can give a fine or other things that are needed by the court. So we go to the other things needed by the court. We order, I order the parents to attend, to meet with each of the service providers and they have to provide a little checklist. They have to, um, and then obviously correct the attendance issues. Ms. McConnell and her students offer um, counsel to the parents. They're in a pro bono fashion representing the parents so that they're getting somebody to talk to, to say, you know, I don't know why I'm here. Nothing's really wrong. <laughs> and I think Ms. McConnell helps them understand that maybe something's wrong sometimes. Um, but really when we talk about identifying layers of issues, um, 
these are the most complicated cases that I hear. I mean, and we used to do them in our court in 10 minute segments. And these people would come in and they would just drop all the stuff on us. And we're like, I got 10 minutes, I got 10 minutes. <laughs> And I got, I got, I got, I got nothing, right? I mean, I, I just don't have what, so um, we're having the people right there. Um, I think there's been some real boost in the use of mental health services because of it. I mean, um, we've just seen, we've seen a lot. I think the first docket after COVID, so about two years that we didn't do it. Um, I tell the story all the time. This woman's in court, she's holding this baby and she's rocking this baby, rocking this baby, rocking this baby. And she gets a little worked up and she says to me, um, I don't know why we're here talking about, you know, Johnny. What's the big deal? I have two other children. I'm not sending them to school either. And everyone, all the grownups in the room for lack of bread, all, the, all of us are like, uh, what is she talking about? And two of her children had aged into school age during COVID. Richmond Public Schools didn't even know about these two children. So the social workers like looked at me going, can you ask their names? <laughs> and so, I mean, the depth of these problems, right? So she's like, what's the big deal? You're not worried about the other two? Well, we kind of are now that you've raised it. So let's try, let's talk about what we're going to do for all of your children, right? But I mean, it is just, you can't imagine, you really can't imagine um, the things that people are dealing with and also trying to get their kids to go to school. So I sometimes don't think it's very effective, but um, we had a lawyer who just joined us. I was trying to recruit her to do something for the past docket. So I was like, come watch. And uh, she's like, wow, this is, this is so great. This is so different. And I thought, okay, we've lost our, we've lost our, will, our ability to see that. So it's nice to have a fresh set of eyes that say, I think this is different. And I think this might be willing to do something. And uh, so then I said, okay, so what are you going to do to make it even better? And we're, so we keep bringing different people in and trying to address needs that, that become, I, that are identified to us from these parents. I need people to walk kids to school. If anybody wants to help children walk to school, that's what I need. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to just say we, we in Richmond, um, and, and not every jurisdiction in Virginia does it this way, but there's one paper you file for the younger kids. That's a failure to send your child to school, which means the parent is having to answer for that. Truancy is when, you know, Matilda is 16 and we're not going to look at mom anymore because she can get herself to school. And the reason she's not going to school is probably something to do with her behavior more than mom's behavior. But to to Judge Langer's uh, point before the past docket, I would have these failures to send ca uh, cases and you can always appoint a guardian ad litem according to the code. So I would at least start getting in there and I put a guardian ad litem on for the child. And you know, as as I think you indicated, the, the failing to send the child to school was just the surface. I would say better than half those cases ended up being foster care cases, cases with mental health issues, chins issues. And so it was good that it gotten brought, had been brought into the court, but the real issue was a family issue, was a bigger issue, the kinds of things that the past docket is, is addressing. And just keep in mind, these parents oftentimes are willing to go to the past docket to do elementary school stuff, the truancy piece gets harder because a lot of them didn't go that far in school. So they're okay with talking to school people when their kids in third grade. But by the time we get to ninth, you know what? They didn't do ninth grade either. So I, you know, so we have a lot of issues with that. Well, thank you. Uh, sounds like a pretty remarkable program. So I'm glad to hear about it. Uh, Judge Landry, couldn't you tell us more about the resiliency award for successful chins participants? Uh, certainly. First, I hope I get there. All right. Uh, as soon as possible, talk to Judge Langer about it. And I think it's absolutely fabulous idea. Um, we've got some particular challenges up to 10 years ago. I think there was one, there was one truancy officer for the entire county, Chesterfield County, 365,000 people, I think. And you had one person trying to handle the cases. It was impossible. That's no longer the case. There's more, but there's some um, challenges there in terms of trying to get something done. And it occurred to me, um, that my experience as a guardian litem uh, with Chin's cases, I was uh, appointed a number of times in, in those matters, is that um, I had one that went on for three years. And it was like this. Every three months, we would do a review. And, um, and Johnny uh, wasn't going to school anymore. 
And so the judge would say, please go to school. And if you don't, I'm going to do something. Three months later, same speech. Three months later, same speech. And you've got everyone coming in um, who's involved. There's a number of professionals are trying to provide services in that. And, uh, and it's just not working. And uh, I remember one case where um, a young man, he, he uh, was testifying and, and I asked him the astute question. So you start going to school. Why is that? And he said, I was tired of coming in court. <laughs> well, that's a good reason. So I guess we could do that and spend three years of court time uh, traipsing in. And I just see that as torturous for the families and no point, no waste of resources. So I sat down with um, the interagency. I, I decided to experiment in Colonial Heights because it's a lot smaller community. You can basically walk around the courthouse and gather all your people together immediately. And sat down with um, the interagency team members, which is um, uh, in Chins. You convene what's called an interagency team, and it is you know mental uh, public health, mental health, court services unit. Those folks, schools that are involved, and said, let's try a different approach. The code looks at three different stages, really, in terms of Chins matter: adjudication, disposition, and review. All right, I said, let's focus on coming in, getting everything front loaded. All right, right in the start and then trying to resolve it one way or the other in a six month time period. And if we don't succeed by then, we let it go. And um, so that's what we started doing. And what we wanted to do was to focus around helping the young adult, because quite frankly, as, as uh, was mentioned in those matters, typically you're dealing with high schoolers, okay? Or their high school age, okay? So they may have repeated the seventh grade three times. And um, so they're there, what can we do uh, realistically. Let's focus on trying to help them uh, meet their challenges, okay, with whatever it is. And um, so that's what we started doing. And at the end, um, as they, and what, what I have found is that um, you can succeed um, within three hearings, that's possible, maybe four, and uh, uh, where a young adult, because of the services that are coming in, they're helping them, and what we do is um, I award them a resiliency award and we have a celebration and, and I do a kicker beforehand as they start to succeed. And I turn to everyone in the courtroom. I say, I think we should have a celebration if he continues like this or she continues like this. And then I ask the young, the young adult, uh, what's your favorite food for lunch? And it's always pizza. So it's easy. <laughs> and, um, you know, what do you like to drink with your pizza? And I find that out. And then uh, what's your favorite dessert? And they tell me that. And so we have a little celebration later. I dismiss the chins. And the, um, this is what really gets them, okay? This is the Resiliency Award. They are handed a plaque. I'm gonna try not to start crying. Yeah. <laughs> and the first one, and it, it's held true in almost, um, well, at least half of them. Ward this, and the young adult just starts crying or holds it back and says, I've never received an award before. And what I tell them is that I want you to put this someplace, okay, that you can see it every day and you can tell yourself, I have overcome. I have done it before, I can do it again. And the challenges are different, you know? Um, a lot of kids with mental health, especially now with COVID and just, you know, if you're an introvert, you, you, know, you had to go back to school and you've got a lot of things going on at home, you know, you feel really uncomfortable and your anxiety is really high depression, you know, depression is out of sight in terms of young adults now. And um, so it is, it's a major, major act of resiliency in terms of being able to do that. And their parents or their guardians, I mean, it really impacts them also. And, um, and each situation is different, but there's that sort of commonality in it in terms of trying to overcome that young adult themselves, making the decision to overcome the challenge that they face. And we've had, um, we're about to do, uh, next Friday, we'll do our 12th uh, celebration, and um, which to me is, um, you know, and 10 of these are in Colonial Heights because that's where I started you know, a focus on. And for a community of 18,000, and uh, to be able to award 10 of these and have success within uh, 11 months um, is really extraordinary for my, from my experience. That's great. I guess a, a more 
a less inspiring but important and informative question for those in the room who are considering uh, practicing in this area is uh, if you all could tell us a bit about guardians ad litem uh, specifically, how do you go about assessing their reports? What kind of considerations determine how much weight you grant to a particular GAL report? Why don't you start? <laughs> well, we continue to use guardian of items in the uh, circuit court, and oftentimes when a case is coming out from lower court, uh, the guardian of litem will continue on with that case. There are cases where sometimes the attorney, sometimes even the lower court will say, you know what, maybe somebody else needs to take a look at this. Um, more often than not, the reports, at least in the city of Richmond, are given orally, verbally. Um, we do have some give it in writing. There is some benefit to it being done in writing for those of you all who may go on into that kind of practice, but it takes a lot of, of you know, time and preparation to do that. Um, sadly, I have to say that that I just want a guardian line that's done their job, that's, that has gone and seen the child recently. They can give me a legitimate recent um, report. So I always open any case I have with, with a young person by looking straight at the GAL. And the first thing we do is to hear sort of a how are things going? I don't want their whole report, but you know that gives me an immediate uh, sense of how recently they've seen the child because they'll say, oh, I just saw him yesterday or I've saw him last week or I've seen him three times or I haven't seen him in a while. Um, and uh, in terms of how much we rely on them, um, you know, this is this really throws you to some of the fundamentals of uh, practicing law, but their reputations are fairly uh, quickly known by the court. And so uh, there are GALs that I would take everything they said and probably do everything that they said or most of it. And there are some not so much. Now, you know, there's some great GALs that I will not necessarily always agree with. And that's because we do what we do every day. And we sort of have this unusual situation of seeing so many cases at some point in time, you kind of know what's going to work and what's not. Um, but, um, and, and I always tell families don't necessarily think that just because the GAL says it, the court's going to follow it. Um, but, you know, there, there are definitely when, when uh, I had a clerk that worked for me for a better part of 10 years, and um, without me ever having to say so, uh, that clerk knew who to, who to appoint as a GAL and who I was not going to deal with very easily. And not because I didn't like them. It was because they didn't serve the child well. They didn't do their job, you know. And so um, we need good GALs. I know you're continuing to have a, a need for them. It's a very important job. Um, but that's some of what I would say you all have. Yeah, We need lawyers to serve on our court appointed list. So if any, a lot of students out there, um, if you're going to put out a shingle, shingle uh, feel free to come help our court, help our families, and and learn a lot really fast. Um, but I agree with everything that Judge Campbell said. Um, but here's so here's it's a judicial perspective, right? So I'll tell you, it it is startling when you take the bench, all the things that you can see from that seat yes. that I didn't know judges could see like the facial expression on every single person in the room. And so um, I really have to go back to some of the cases I tried and wonder what kind of faces were being made behind me that yeah. the judge saw. But that would keep me awake at night, so I try not to. <laughs> but when a, a lawyer, or particularly a GAL, starts talking and everybody in the room is kind of going, <laughs> right, makes me question if the information that I'm getting is particularly accurate or current or something, right? There seems to be something that's wrong. Now, sometimes people just get angry because it turns out the GAL is telling me something they really didn't, they hoped would never be said out loud. And that's a different face. And I can access that one too. But um, it's important to know that, that you are, if you're working as a GAL, that you should be doing your own independent work and that that is the work that the court wants to hear. Because I'm gonna hear from other people in the room, I'll hear from mom, I'll hear from dad, I'll hear from social workers, right? I, I, I don't need, a pr you know, that all said be pr as if that's a report. It, I need the work of what's going on at school, what's going on in a medical condition, what, how is the treat, you know, are, are, is the treatment that the court's ordered being followed through, is it being effective, are we, are we heading in the right direction? Is the child safe and happy and healthy, right? The, the thing that, that, that I can't, get an unbiased view of 
from the other parties. Um, and I know when I was practicing law, as a, even as a criminal lawyer, when there would be a GAL, I would have a conversation in the hallway and then I would walk in and suddenly the GAL is parroting the exact thing that I just said to them in the hallway. And I thought, they're getting paid, they're getting paid for that? <laughs> right? So um, just, I mean, I think as Judge Campbell started his comments, do, do the work and then tell us about your work. That's what we wanna know. I think I'm just going to add two things. Uh, first of which is how I assess it is I listen to the questions posed by the guardian item of the witnesses. That tells me a little bit how much they have done. And for me, that's the key point. You know, if they're asking basic questions and it's obvious that they really don't know the answer, um, then that tells me something. All right. And um, second thing I just want to point out is that um, I think it was 2020, um, statute was a minute in terms of the requirements for a guardian litem and that they're supposed to um, file a certification form which says that they've complied with the standards of performance, but also how much time they have spent in talking to their client, the child, right? And so that's another, uh, I think, important um, uh, bit of information. I'll leave it at that. Bear in mind, too, in Virginia, a guardian of item is telling us what the child wants. All right. We we don't have a lot of Kramer versus Kramer. We don't have kids in the courtroom and 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 uh, you know, at least in Richmond, we don't relish taking them in chambers. A lot of people, you talk to the child, you talk to the child. That's a very traumatic thing for a child to do. And so generally our practice is to not do that unless we have to. There are times when you need to. But that GAL needs to tell me, I mean, they may not agree with it. You know, Mary may want to go live, I always say, at Disney World if she had her druthers um but but she needs to tell me that's what this the, what, and, and good GAs will say that you know Mary would tell you she wants to live with mom I don't think this is best for her judge because I've done all this work and she needs to go with aunt or father or whatever but um you know that's a very important role and if they don't know their ward if they haven't talked to them then that's a terrible disservice to the child and, and I have to disagree slightly and uh, respectfully. And uh, we're doing a different approach in Chesterfield um, and we've, um, uh, the bench has adopted a protocol to have children involved in the dependency matters. So it's not too much of a disagreement, but- with Yeah, it's being more private custody. Well, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. we definitely have them in dependency and, matters. And we're not going to, um, at least at this point, um, do that, but we think it's very important for a child in, in foster care matter to have a say and uh, to be involved and to be in the courtroom if they want to be in the courtroom or to have the ability to be able to participate in some fashion that they feel comfortable with. It's always their choice, all right? But um, I've just gone to too many conferences where you have um, adults now, but who went through the system when they were children who talk about how they weren't talked to, all right, by anybody. They never had an opportunity to talk to the judge, never knew what was going on, and basically, someone's going in there and making a representation. Oh, well, it's too traumatic to have them uh, come in. And um, our point is, it's extremely traumatic not to have them involved. It's their life. They need to have a voice, and they need to be there if at all possible. And uh, we've um, there's been some adjustment in terms of uh, trying to change people's practice. In terms of that, I had one matter, which was a, um, it was going to be a change of goal to adoption. And if you know anything about that, well, if you're 14 or older, you can undermine, not undermine, but you can say no to the adoption. So it's kind of important to understand what the person um, has said, uh, what the um, uh, child believes in that instance. And um, it became, as I was quizzing the folks um, on this change of goal, um, has this been discussed with child? You know, it's dead silence in the courtroom, all right? Uh, so no one has talked to this 14-year-old who is articulate, who is smart, who I knew wanted to be involved, okay? He wanted to object to a lot of things. I, I knew that. And um, no one had talked to him about the change of goal. And then I got some pushback from the department. I pushed back harder. And um, I continued the matter down and said, this is what's going to happen. Um, you're going to talk to this young man about the change in goal. And I want him to be able to participate however he wants. And he did subsequently. 
and you participate by phone. And it was absolutely great because he had an hour long, we took an hour, imagine that, um, on the phone and uh, listened to him. This was in chambers, okay? And, um, and he told me um, all of his hesitation. We talked a lot. His guardian line was present. His cost was present. And it was, I think, a, a critical piece. And that switched everyone's mindset in that case. And we're trying to do that. Um, we have assistance with the National um, Council for Juvenile Family Court Judges, uh, ABA. We've put on some workshops with all our stakeholders to get everyone on board to how they can fit into that process so that we can have children in those dependency matters participate and have a vested interest in it. And so they become the focus. See what I mean? Okay. And uh, they become the focus as to the adults just coming in with, with their vested interest being served. Yeah. And just to be clear, Richmond is completely on board with that. I was meaning okay. private custody okay. cases. We, we've done that in dependency cases for 20 years, I think. So okay. thank you. Well, great. Uh, on that uh, note of agreement, I think we have to end. So Judge Landry, Judge Langer, Judge Campbell, thank you so much for taking the time to share your perspectives. Thank you, Your Honors and Professor Woodson. We will now have a break until 2.55. All right, if everyone could please grab their seats. Our next speaker is Melissa Waugh presenting on what to do when the school says no. Uh, Melissa Waugh has practiced special education law for the last 13 years and represents parents at IEP meetings and mediation with state and federal complaints in due process hearings and in federal and state litigation. Her representation includes matters arising under the IDEA, the ADA, Section 504, and Title IX. She and her husband are also the parents of two amazing children who happen to have special needs, so she understands firsthand the complexity of this area of law and the dire need for more parents, for more attorneys representing the interests of parents of children with disabilities in our schools. Please welcome Ms. Melissa Waugh. All righty. Good afternoon. I'm back. Sorry about that. Uh, you thought you were rid of me, but no. Uh, and this time the crazy people are giving me a whole hour. <laughs> so, uh, but what we're gonna talk about today, although I don't see my slides up here. So, um, oh, they're in process. Uh, there we go. What we're going to talk about uh, for the next hour is what we can do when the school says no. And there are lots of things that the schools can say no to parents on. Uh, no, your child isn't eligible. No, your child, uh, uh, it's not a manifestation of your child's disability. We're going to go ahead and fully discipline the child. No to a good transition plan. No, we're not going to provide you with data. It just, there's a lot of things that we can get no's to. Um, but we're not without uh, recourse. There are things that parents can do. And there are three primary laws that, um, that I utilize in my advocacy work, particularly with the schools and when it comes to IEPs and eligibility. Um, one we, you've heard about a lot today is IDEA. But there are two additional laws that provide rights to children with disabilities and their parents, and that is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I, um, early on in my career doing special education law, um, someone, I saw this in another presentation, this Venn diagram, but it really helped me in one snapshot to understand kind of the scope here, right? So the black box are all students with disabilities and that the majority of them actually qualify under Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA. And then there's a subset of those students who also qualify under IDEA. Um, but it's important to remember that all the students who qualify under IDEA will meet the definitional requirements to qualify for protections under 504 and ADA. So that's why it's so important that we remember we have those tools in our toolbox as well. Um, so sources of authority, are, of course, the federal statutes and laws that are the three in particular I just talked about. Um, there are federal regulations that are in the Code of Federal Regulations, or CFR. 
Um, we also have judicial decisions um, from federal courts, from state courts, but also from due process hearing officers. Um, you can uh, rely on, on those and cite those in, in briefs. And state regulations, um, and then guidance documents from federal and state uh, organizations such as um, within the U.S. Department of Education, you have uh, the Office of Civil Rights or OCR, you have OSEP, um, OSEERS as well, and then in the Virginia Department of Education, they will also produce guidance documents. Um, but I think it's, uh, maybe it was Latanya who said, you know, before that she learned in her education law class, um, while these don't have um, bind, there's not binding authority, um, but they are precedential in the sense that these guidance documents um, can guide the decisions, particularly of our administrative due process hearing officers um, as to what the school district should be doing. All right, so the first law we're gonna go through with the administrative remedies, um, what you can do when the school says no is IDEA. There are several common areas of disagreement that we see all the time. Um, and I kind of put these in order of kind of where they happen chronologically. The first thing is child fine. School districts have a legal obligation to go out into the community, not just their little school buildings, okay, but out in the community and identify all children suspected of having a disability and evaluate them for special education services. That is actually their legal obligation. Yeah, but realistically, that's that's not really happening. Um, a lot, even within their own little schoolhouses, right, parents are having to fight schools uh, to get them to even evaluate the children for eligibility. But technically, that is their requirement, even children who are homeschooled, even children who are in private schools. Um, so that is one area that we see a lot of um, disagreement. And uh, let's see, the next one is eligibility, failing to find a child eligible who, you know, in our humble opinion, would otherwise qualify. Um, a lot of times that comes in the evaluation process. The school district isn't fully evaluating the students in all areas of suspected disability. Um, that can contribute to this failure to find them eligible in the first place. Um, sometimes it's finding them eligible inappropriately as uh, I think he's gone now, but Dr. Geller was talking about this morning. And, and I, I mean, I had this case recently with intellectual, actually we had a mutual friend uh, with intellectual disability that a lot of times the schools are looking at just an IQ score and not looking behind the score. Um, and part of in the DSM-5 to be diagnosed with an intellectual disability, also in addition to having an IQ score of a certain level, they also have to have uh, uh, subsequent deficits in adaptive functioning. And there's, I think, about six areas of adaptive functioning. So anyway, so sometimes schools get it wrong. <laughs> Finding them eligible, but eligible in the wrong category for the wrong reason. Um, independent educational evaluations we talked about a little bit earlier. That is a one of the two, I think, most powerful tools in a parent's toolbox. Um, independent educational evaluations are paid for by the school district, but the parent goes out into the community and, and finds an independent, in other words, no affiliation with the school, provider to then do the assessments that they want on their child. Um, FAPE, the uh, free or an appropriate public education, which is the requirement, that's the goal of the IDEA. And so uh, areas of disagreement are whether, um, first of all, the IEP that was designed, did it actually meet the child's individual needs? And then more importantly, um, was that IEP actually followed? Um, and for, you know, once the parent and the school district agree this is what needs to be done. What is in this IEP and in, in this document, that's what needs to be done to confer a free and appropriate public education or FAPE on, on the child. When the school doesn't follow what's in that document, then by definition, they are not providing that child with a FAPE. So those are some of the areas um, that we deal with um, through administrative remedies. Least restrictive environment. Um, this goes to the heart of why the IDEA came about. Um, so, some of you may or may not know the um, disability rights and the IDEA, and these all grew out of the civil rights movement. Um, those cases came about about the same time we had Brown v. Board, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. And at that time, as I'm sure everyone in here knows, that's where the U.S. Supreme Court said separate but equal is not equal. <laughs> and so um, in the educational context based on race, and so a lot of families at that time who had children who were being routinely excluded from the public school system started saying, wait a minute, our kids are being housed in these facilities where they're not getting any education. Um, how is that any different? And so that was kind of the evolution of um, the, the disability rights movement. And then of course, the development and the ultimate passage of the IDEA. 
but least restrictive environment means these students should be with disabilities should be educated to the greatest extent possible and appropriate for that child with other non-disabled children. Um, and it, it can be a bit of a slur in some circles, but you know, you may have heard the word inclusion, but the idea that we want children with disabilities to be educated right alongside children without disabilities to the greatest extent appropriate for that child. And it's not appropriate for every child. And for some children, the appropriate placement might be in a separate classroom with a smaller class size, more one-on-one -on -one assistance, medical care, whatever. It has to be based on the needs of the child. But the ultimate thing is where the IDEA came about is that we were trying to combat this idea that any child with a disability needs to be segregated, needs to be put aside and warehoused somewhere else and not, you know, we shouldn't, our normal children shouldn't have to be exposed to that. All right, that's what we're fighting. And so least restrictive environment, again, is the core of what we do. It's making sure we're um, including kids with disabilities as much as, as possible and as appropriate. The IEP, failure to develop appropriately ambitious goals, that's the injury standard. Failure to implement it with fidelity, I talked about that. They didn't do what they said that they agreed the child required. Procedural violations, parent participation, it's got to be meaningful. Um, parents have rights. The IDEA created procedural safeguards that are protecting the rights of the parents as well as the child. And then discipline. Um, I think it came out a couple times today about these manifestations of a child's disability. There are lots of protections for children under the IDEA in disciplinary matters. And so um, uh, part of that is after on the 11th day that it may be uh, consecutive or it could be cumulative, but on the 11th day of the child not being in their regular placement, suspended, whatever, in school suspension, out of school suspension, that triggers these manifestation determination review hearings. And if it is determined that the behavior that's causing the disciplinary action is a manifestation of the child's disability, then they go right back to their placement, all right? Otherwise, they get, with some exceptions, treated just like any other student um, as well. So these we see a lot of disciplined cases that come out. Stay put, I mentioned that earlier this morning, but that is the, um, the idea that during any kind of litigation of a special education matter, the child stays in their current educational placement, the placement that the parent last gave consent to. Um, that's called stay put. That's the federal definition in Virginia because um, consent is required to any change of the IEP, to any change in eligibility. Um, we take a much broader view of stay put. Um, you don't actually have to be litigating a case. Um, just from the point the parent decides not to provide consent and there's a point of disagreement, they're stay put. And that's why I was saying earlier with the partial consent, it basically maintains the status quo. The school can't change without the parent's consent what's happening. And so we refer to that as stay put or stay put on that issue. Um, uh, okay, I think I talked too much about that. So uh, when things get so bad <laughs> that the parent feels like their child either can't be educated or worse, isn't safe, um, in that school district, the parent has rights to remove the child from school. Um, of course, we all know the option of homeschooling. The parent could certainly homeschool. The parent can certainly place the child in a private school at any time, even if they don't have an IEP. But what you, what's unique about children who are protected under IDEA is that if a parent has to remove the child from the school and place them, say, at a private school, if they follow these rules, then they can, down the road, seek reimbursement for the cost of that private placement. Um, so that's kind of the extra protections that they have. But they, the rules are either at an IEP meeting, before you actually remove your child from the school district, you have to state your concerns and that you intend to enroll the child in this private day placement or private program, and you intend to seek reimbursement from the school. Or the other, you don't have to do both, it's an either or, or 10 business days, before removing the child, you send this letter to the school that essentially says the same thing. Um, now, the way the regulations are written, and this is uh, Hank's DB versus Bedford County case, um, the way the regs are written, or the rules are written, is that um, the administrative um, due process hearing judge, right, has the option not to grant reimbursement. It's not mandatory. Unfortunately, in Virginia, our hearing officers tend to take the view, if you don't follow this to the letter, if there's any small, slight deviation at all, you're done. 
you're not going to get reimbursed. It's unfortunate, but we actually have a great um, case out of the district court in the Western District, um, Hank's case that said that where the judge said, "Look, it's not we're not we're not going to hold the the parent um, who wasn't represented at the time to the letter of the law here, and we're not required to do so. That's not what the rules are. It's just the hearing officer has the discretion not to award if you don't follow the rules. So, um, but practice tip: make sure this happens <laughs> because in reality. Um, Unfortunately, our hearing officers will tend to latch onto any small possible thing to be able to find against the parents. Um, it's very rare for parents to prevail in Virginia um, on uh, administrative due process hearings, um, despite you know competent representation. Uh, but um, and there's a there was a class action lawsuit recently filed that got dismissed, but is still being um, investigated out of Richmond. But on this issue, so it's not just me. Anyone who's ever done any of these. Can 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 testify that uh yeah it's very difficult to win in Virginia, um, but let's talk about some of those options. Okay, besides that very difficult due process path, um, there are other options that we have when we run into these common problems. First of all, there's informal uh, resolution with the district. Um, there are some districts in Virginia who have um, like internal review. Uh, uh, procedures that may not be official, you may not find it written down anywhere, but as you work in the district and you develop relationships with the administrative staff, particularly the um, director of special education, sometimes you can reach out, say, hey, here's what's going on, or, you know, can we work something out, or um, whatever the case may be, but so it is possible, again, as you develop those relationships to try, try to do some informal resolution um, of problems uh, at the Virginia Department of Education, or VDOE, uh, there is an ombudsman for special education, and I think I've got some more information in your slides, more details on this, um, and links to and more information, but there is an ombudsman for special education. They don't represent parents, but it's a place that parents can um, call and ask questions um, about, is this right, or, you know, I'm being told this by the school, you know, what should I say, what should I do back? Um, that's primarily their function. There's another uh, option that they have in the VDOE, which is called a facilitated IEP. Um, that is where uh, the school and the parents jointly can request that a trained facilitator uh, who works for Virginia Department of Education comes in at, to the IEP team meeting and helps facilitate the process. But they're not providing legal advice. They're not, I mean, they're just making sure the process is moving forward in a, you know, uh, as collegial or collaborative way as possible. But again, they're not giving legal advice to the parents. Um, and while I'm on that about not giving legal advice, that's the frustrating thing. And, and I'm, I'm glad um, it was mentioned in my bio about, I very quickly learned once <laughs> going to my kids' first IEP meeting, we adopted two kids from foster care who came with IEPs. So I go to the first meeting and they're, you know, it's all friendly and nice. And they give you this book, here are your rights. Thank you very much. Six months later, I get through that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Expecting late. I mean, at this point, I've been an attorney for seven or eight years, and I'm, I'm looking at this. And we're expecting lay parents to a read all this and b understand it and apply all this to their unique fact pattern for their children. This is crazy town. And so, anyway, funny enough, I started going to conferences to learn more to advocate for my own children, and met Hank at a, he was teaching at one of the conferences, and this is a million years ago, but. Um, but yeah, and he said, look, you're an attorney and you've learned this stuff, you know, more than most people out there working on it. Why don't you take some cases from my legal aid office? So anyway, that's how I got into doing special education law because there is such a need. <laughs> yeah, so, so the reason I'm here, it's all his fault. Blame Hank. But, uh, but anyway, um, but, the, but it, that is the problem. And I can't tell you how many times I've said along the way through all these years, parents just don't know what they don't know. And without good advocates, without good attorneys, without GALs who know at least a little something about special ed and judges, um, there's no one to really point parents to, to what really should be happening for their children. And we all want to believe that the teachers love our kids and want the best and, and the staff all want the best thing for our children. And it's not that they're bad people, they're not. But the reality is, they're put into boxes by their administration and who are worried about cost and worried about staffing and these kinds. So there's a lot of things that go into what's happening and what is and is not being told to parents in these meetings. Um, so again, 
adding to our cadre of folks who can get out there and help parents navigate this incredibly um, confusing and difficult process is great. Um, yes. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Parents don't have to pay, all right? And I'm going to talk about some, I am going to talk about the pros and the cons, especially with mediation and whatever and how that's set up. But, you know, parents shouldn't have to pay for these things. And, that, and these things are made available. The facilitate IP, uh, facilitate IP facilitator, um, that's free. That doesn't cost the school or the parent anything to have that person come in. Um, the value is debatable, um, you know, to how much value they can add to the process, but, um, but that's free. Uh, let me talk about state complaints real quick, and then I'm going to get to mediation. State complaints um, are filed with the Virginia Department of Education. When I first started practicing law uh, about 13 years ago, um, I did a few state complaints, but very quickly it became very clear that VDOE did not take their job seriously. Um, and then and then meeting more colleagues and talking to other people, it, it wasn't just me, I wasn't crazy. This was happening across the state. I would file a state complaint and I would say, all right, parent is complaining of uh, issues A, B, and C. And we would get this notice of complaint back where VDOE decided they were gonna investigate uh, issues R, Z, and Q. R, Z, and Q? <laughs> no, who said anything about R, Z, and Q? I am not kidding you. They literally would change the claims and then ultimately find, and the parent doesn't win. You know, the school was fine on R, Z, and Q. We didn't even care about R, Z, and Q. And it wasn't me. So the system was completely broken. Um, so for, I don't know, seven, eight years, none of, none of us were filing state complaints. But um, because of advocacy by Cheryl Poe and others, um, over the last three to four years where they got the U.S. Department of Education to come in and investigate Virginia Department of Education, and they spanked them. I mean, they did. There's another way to say it. They said, you are wrong, and um, you need to clean up this state complaint system, and things have been getting better. We're not getting the changing of the claims anymore. We're getting serious investigations where they're actually talking to people. They're actually going and getting documents, um, and we're getting good results. We're getting... Um, uh, findings against these school districts. Now, VDO still didn't quite have their act together with the corrective action plans. Um, and <laughs> right, uh, where the corrective action plan is where VDO says, yes, school district, you screwed it up. Um, but here's what we want you to do to make things right. And um, so in some cir circumstances, they'll get a, what looks like a pretty good corrective action plan, but then they never enforce it. So then the parents are forced to go to due process. Just, horrible process um, to be able to enforce these things. And so um, so that's a problem. Or the things that they uh, order in the corrective action plan are just so uh, benign. I mean, it's just a slap on the wrist. And prime example, um, I did two systemic complaints um, recently against uh, Loudoun County Public Schools and um, on these IEEs because they set fee caps that were so low that literally there wasn't a parent who got an IEE who didn't have to pay hundreds, if not thousands of dollars out of pocket. And again, remember the law is it's supposed to be free. <laughs> and so, and you can imagine with our lower income populations, this devastating, they can't afford that. So, um, so we did the complaint, we prevailed. They did find that, that their rates were too low, but for all these, for example, Loudoun County has almost 10,000 students with IEPs. And this was, the SEAC had been involved. This had been years they had been doing this, right? And so the corrective action plan said that the only that the uh, first of all, the school district got to decide how they're going to determine who they were going to reimburse, right? After all these years, thousands of families, who they were going to reimburse and how and to what extent. And so, what the school district came up this great plan for them was that they were only going to reimburse um, parents who had requested a waiver of the fee cap based on a unique circumstance. When the Virginia Department of Education, in their letter of findings, said, They've created a circular problem for parents because since the fee cap was low for everybody, there was no unique circumstance, yet they let the district determine the criteria for reimbursement of anyone who got who asked for a waiver. In the second complaint on the same issues, because they didn't fix the problems, and that we filed a year later, 
we got the information of how many, how many families got reimbursed, right? This big, huge school district, how many families got reimbursed? You know how many got reimbursed? Five. That's it. And not some of them, not even the full amount that they spent because they capped it at their new uh, fee cap amount, which we got a ruling a year later was still <laughs> obscenely too low. So, um, so we still got some issues with complaints, but it's better. And so now I'm changing my song about complaints and I'm telling people, let's do file the complaints. Um, let's do, let's hold VDOE accountable to make sure that they're um, investigating uh, the schools and making sure they're complying with the law. As a, as a preface or precursor to eventually filing a due process to get the investigation done. Yes, they could. they could. The great thing about the state complaints is that um, it's a very short turnaround or timeline for them to get a response. And so, um, and because VDOE is still under the microscope with the U.S. Department of Education right now, so they're being pretty good um, about staying pretty close to those timelines. It, now, when they ask for an extension, it's just of a couple of days, in my experience. Um, so, uh, so yes, you can get that done quickly because, as we'll see, I'll say in a minute, for administrative due process, you have a two-year statute of limitations period. So when you're talking about a state complaint being resolved within, you know, let's say 60 days on the outside um, with some extensions, that's plenty of time to then go ahead and file something um, for due process. So yes, it absolutely could be a precursor. But hopefully, if VDOE is doing things right with the corrective action plan, you don't have to go to due process because we're resolving it where it should be resolved which is at the, um, the state complaint level where it doesn't cost parents six arms and 25 legs, which I'll get to with due process. Mediation. Uh, mediation, again, when I first started, the first several years that I practiced was fantastic. Um, the mediators are trained uh, by Virginia Department of Education. They're paid by VDOE. It's, uh, the mediator itself is free to the parents. Um, the school and the, and the parents have to agree we would go to these mediations and the school would negotiate in good faith. And we got great results through mediation. Um, and I know you've been around long enough too that you did too as well. Um, and then again, about six, seven, maybe eight on the outside years ago, something happened, we don't know. But all of a sudden the mediators weren't holding the school districts to account. They weren't holding their feet to fi the fire. Like, you know, when, um, for example, in district court, if we're getting mediation with the, uh, uh, the magistrate judge, you know, they expect you to come in prepared, ready to, to negotiate in good faith, and they're not going to let you get away with it. It used to be that way with mediation through VDOE. It's not anymore. And we've dipped our firm, we've dipped our toes in the water. In fact, the last time I did mediation, that was our mutual friend. And um, the school district literally requested mediation. And then when they came to mediation, after now I've spent you know, a lot of money preparing and we brought in an expert witness to testify. Um, so the parent invested a lot thinking we were going to do this in good faith. And the school district came in and said, yeah, we're, um, we're going to do this one little tiny thing that costs us nothing. And that's it. Thanks for playing. <laughs> and, we're like, and even the mediator came back into our room and was like, and, 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 and the council opposing council and were like, that's it. That's, you know, and, they asked for the mediation, but there's really nothing, you know, if, if they decide not to mediate in good faith, there's not really anything that we can do. And the mediators aren't allowed to do anything, apparently. So at this point, mediation, we are not recommending. Um, and, you know, yes, go ahead. Fair enough. Find out what you're seeking, right. and then they offer things that should have been in Medicaid to begin with. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I was asking for. You're giving me something that you should be given comment or any uh, anyway. But the person that is was sitting in a lot of those mediations, you know, DS is an in that position anyway. So I'm hoping that there's a shift. Too. There could be, and we're always looking for that. We're always hopeful, always hopeful. You can't do this job yeah. without being hopeful. Okay. Um, because there's so many things stacked against um, parents. 
But um, but yeah, we're hopeful mediation will get better, but at this point, I can't unfortunately say well, that. Well, started using the postal worker uh, union mediators who had no idea what that is special correct. education was. That is correct. So these aren't mediators necessarily that are specific to um, special education. Oftentimes, they are will be primarily the other kinds of things. Yeah, I've had the gentleman with it. Yeah, I've about a mediator who kept looking to the school's council to say, can you explain that to me? Can you explain the law to me? Because they don't understand anything about special education. Yeah. And, and I wonder if these should start, you know, most of our school systems now use the same law firms. And, and well, that a lot is a of the problem. things that I see that were happening on the Spotsy County, a lot of things that are happening in other larger counties are now coming to my county. And so I can, all I have to do is see what happened two years ago, you know, down here. And it's like, okay, now I don't see it. Yeah. Because now everything is mediated. Oh, interesting. So in that district, it is. So again, you have to kind of run your district and, and, and dip your toe in the water um, with these things, but unfortunately, I just can't say, at least from a systemic level, from Virginia Department of Education, that there's been much change or effort to make the mediation process productive again. It used to be, um, but it's just not enough. Due process hearing. That's an appeal, um, and, and it's an administrative um, hearing, uh, but for those of you who have never been to a special education administrative due process hearing, um, make no mistake, it's a trial. Okay. When I was in law school, I did social security administrative hearings. You know, as a law student, we're sitting in a office. I mean, it's just, it was low key. Okay. Um, this is nothing like that. Nothing like that. This has no reliance. This is like going to court, except we're not in the courthouse and the hearing officer doesn't wear a black robe. But other than that, it's really the same. Um, we, which <laughs> I keep pushing back on this, and the and U.S. Department of Education has pushed back on this, but we are full motion to practice uh, in, these, in, in these administrative process hearings. And for those of you who aren't attorneys, you're probably like, what does that mean? Yeah, guess what the parents are thinking? What does this mean? You know, the intent of the administrative hearings were that parents unrepresented could come in and work things out of school. That is not what they involved into. Um, so, so the cases can be dismissed on um, uh, before the parents have even had a chance to present a scrap of evidence or have a sort of any testimony. Uh, but, but again, that's just our work in Virginia. Um, we have uh, due process hearing this came out in the class action that was filed in, in their um, complaints and their exhibits. Uh, but there are multiple hearing officers in Virginia who have um, been hearing officers for literally decades who are not once have ever found for parents. Okay, that's shocking. You mean to tell me in decades, not once, a parent came into your hearing room and had a legitimate claim? Um, that's what parents are up against. Uh, and the other part about due process is because it was so labor intensive, um, and again, like a trial, when you hire competent legal counsel, it's very expensive. It's your house. Um, it's your putting your house. No. Yeah, well. I did that the due process, last due process case I did this summer. Our firm, it was so nice, but we tracked all the time, we did the time, hoping that, you know, we ultimately will sell things and get our, our fees, but we had $160,000. And yeah, so not that all of our cases are that expensive, but I mean, we're not talking 10 bucks. We're talking six figures. Hey, what can we afford that? I mean, really? You know, and so and it's hard for our late friends to be able to do any of these cases because they are so labor intensive and it takes so long to queue them up properly where they even have a, a shred of a chance. Of and you'll talk about the problem of getting reimbursement from expert witnesses and that too. Yes, well, horrible <laughs> U.S. Supreme Court decision that said that, um, yes, well, you for, you're the prevailing party, you can get recovered from fees, you can't recover expert witnesses. So unless we, especially when we're doing our work, work, unless we can get an expert to do it for free to come testify, um, it can be a problem for our lower income families. It's it's a mess. It's a mess. So um, yes. So um, I, I have some slides. Like I said, you guys can check out there all in your box, right? If you want to get um, links and phone numbers and stuff for all of these, here's the, the form with, for the facilitated IEP. State complaints. Again, state complaint can be made by anyone, an individual or organization. Um, it is formal and you do write it. They give you a little form that's, is it even two pages? Would it be one page? Could be two on the outside. Little form that parents can fill out. 
um, the complaint that I'm finishing up now, I'll be drafting as soon as this thing or sending in as soon as this is over is 26 pages single spaced. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's kind of even the form sets parents up for failure. There's no way that a parent is going to put enough information on that form to prevail at the standard that, you know, the information that VDOE would want or need to make a, a good decision in their favor. But again, it just kind of sets parents up because they don't know they were given this form. Okay, so I must two sentences should be plenty. And you do. Yes. Yeah. It's everything you're sharing. So if you have tons of documents, you know, backing up your case, you've got to make multiple copies and mail those out. Well, that could be done electronically. You can follow electronically, but you do have to uh, face I was talking to school on when I emailed um, my complaints to BDOD. But anyway, um, but at 60 days to the decision, um, but it, and, and there is a, there is an oh practice tip. Uh, so parent files complaint, the school district has an opportunity to respond. Um, and uh, if, if this, if VDOE, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a step. This parent files a complaint. If VDOE decides that it's sufficient, then they will issue um, uh, a, notice of, a notice of complaint saying we are going to investigate. Then they set a timeline. The school district gets a chance to respond, right? But then there's one more deadline where either party can provide additional evidence. All right, so there is no reply brief. And every single time the school just like, Miss Law is not allowed to do a reply brief. And I wanna say, I'm not doing a reply brief. I'm providing additional uh, evidence. Um, but there is an opportunity for the parent to get the last word. But you just wanna make sure you're filing that on like the last day <laughs> that you can file it. And then you get the last word. Oh. That the school lied about something, you didn't tell you about something, you didn't provide us. Yeah, it's one year and it's from you knew, knew or should have known. Um, but generally speaking, you know, again, practice tip make darn sure you have a document that is within that one year window or VDOE isn't, it's gonna, they're gonna boot it for insufficiency. Yeah, just make sure you can document on a piece of paper that you're sending them. You know, for example, um, the prior written notice from an IEP team meeting where a crummy decision was made that you're upset about, or an email where um, the principal says, um, you know, even though we know you're supposed to be getting Orton Gillingham instruction for your child, uh, we don't have a teacher. And so we'll let you know in some future date when we're going to hire a teacher who's trained to give your child what your IEP says the child is supposed to get. Um, that email could be the documentation of starting the clock because at that point you knew they are failing to provide the services that everyone agreed in that IEP the student needed for FAPE. Have our, they don't know the law. And so when I find out the law on my own, so there's, they were supposed to give me something they never gave me. And so there's no, there's no paper except for me telling them, I just discovered this was the law. Can you give me this piece of paper you were supposed to give me? And, and then you know, so. Yeah. So again, it can be just do the best you can. Right, to document in some way you're within that one year window. And then, if possible, don't wait that long. Um, oftentimes, we know that they screwed it up long before a year. Um, okay, real quick, I just want to move on to the due process hearing. Um, some of the points there, again, as I said, <laughs> even though it's an administrative hearing, an evidentiary hearing, it is on the record. Um, it's before a impartial hearing officer, um, meaning that they are not paid. Uh, by the school district, um, although we do find that there is some manipulating by the school districts to get certain hearing officers that they want assigned, which is unfortunate, but again, you know, it's not a lot we can do on these things, um, but technically they're supposed to be impartial, and uh, let's see, the burden of, of proof falls on the party who's filing the uh, due process complaint, which is typically the parent. Um, so the parent does have the burden of proof, which is very difficult because the school district has all the documents, <laughs> the school district has all the experts, and the parents can't get expert witness fees paid. And unless you did the IEE, that's the reason why the IEE is such a powerful tool, because technically it's supposed to be for free, right? Even though some districts set their fee cap too low, but, um, but basically that's a way a parent can get an expert witness who could testify because it's got to be somebody who evaluated the child or else the hearing officers will boot them out. I mean, I can't tell you how many times myself and my colleagues, we brought in experts in dyslexia or experts in, you know, an in intellectual disability who reviewed the child's records, but never actually spoke to the child. 
but the hearing officers will say that testimony is out. They, they, they give it no credibility at all because they didn't, even though we know in court that happens all the time. You have, you bring in expert witnesses on a topic that doesn't fly in Virginia due process. But anywho, um, it's a two-year statute of limitations unless there's some kind of misrepresentation or they did not provide the parent their rights in their native language, um, which is a case that Hank and I had in the past as well. Um, and you gotta be careful because issues not raised in the due process complaint can't be raised at the hearing or obviously on appeal. And so um, again, that's a little problematic for parents who aren't represented because again, there's a little form that VDOE provides that is two pages long. Um, but again, it gives you like this much space to say your problem. And again, when we're filing a due process complaint, it's you know, 15 pages, 25 pages, 35 pages, and plus you know, 35 exhibits or more. Um, so it, it's just, it, it kind of sets the parents up for failure, but that's, that's what we have. Okay. Uh, our hearing officers in Virginia, we don't have discovery um, in, in uh, admin, our administrative hearings, um, but the hearing officers can issue subpoenas for witness testimony or for documents. The problem is <laughs> that um, if the school district just ignores them, uh, there's not a lot you can do. My boss, in two different uh, uh, circuit courts have, has filed this petition um, where the, the school didn't comply. We asked the hearing officer to enforce his subpoena. He refused. And then we took it to circuit court for enforcement. And twice now we've got rulings that, um, uh, that if the hearing officer has to enforce the subpoena. So then what do you do <laughs> when they refuse? You're just kind of out of luck. So um, it's a problem, but technically they can issue subpoenas and I guess the school districts just can comply if they feel like it or not. Um, the hearing officers can exclude certain evidence and testimony and um, uh, they are required to enter just some kind of disposition on each and every issue or claim that the parent raised in their complaint. Uh, but again, we don't have discovery. So there's no depositions, there's no um, interrogatories, there's none of that. Um, all you get are the records and you get, um, you know, witnesses that can come testify that, again, you haven't interviewed <laughs> because no school board attorney is going to let you interview anybody who works for them. So um, that whole thing that you learn in law school about never ask a question of a witness that you don't know the answer to, <laughs> throw that out the window. That does not apply <laughs> uh, in what we do um, because we, we, we don't get to talk to these school board um, staff. So uh, Anyway, this is just a timeline that's going to be in your materials. So I'm going to kind of skip through some of that uh, remedies. And it's my segue into real quickly talking about 504 and ADA. Um, let's see. Yeah, I've got a little bit of time. So remedies under the IDEA, you can get prospective relief. Um, the hearing officer could order a finding of eligibility. Um, they could order some kind of change to the IEP, a change in placement or prevent a change in placement. Uh, for example, if um, the child was in a special private day school that the school was paying for and the school all of a sudden decided we don't want to pay for that anymore and, and, and paying, let me make this clear too, because a lot of people understand <laughs> I'm talking about it. Schools actually don't pay for these private day placements. Uh, you may remember some earlier panelists talking about CSA and FAP teams and all of that. Well, the Comprehensive Services Act says if a private day placement or residential placement is in the IEP, then CSB has no choice. They are mandated to pay for it. And that's important, right? Because, you know, the old adage, follow the money. Um, but a lot of times I'll have clients be like, oh, well, I know Johnny really needs, you know, this $120,000 a year placement at this special school. But oh, if I do that, how's that going to hurt all the other children at school and take away from their services and whatever? Um, and I have to, you know, explain to them how the funding works. It's not being paid for by the school, which is always in my mind, <laughs> kind of makes me go, do they not understand, the people in these IEP teams understand how the funding works? Because why are they fighting so hard? to not give kids what everyone agrees they really need, <laughs> but, um, but they do. But, but little side note there, practice tip um, on how this funding actually happens. So anywho, but if the school wanted to stop um, placing a child at a private day school, that is the kind of thing the parent would not provide consent to. And then you could file due process um, to enforce that. Although you don't really have to because they got to leave. That's the stay put placement. The school could file due process against the parent. Um, but anyway, so it could prevent a change in placement. 
and the hearing officer could reverse a manifestation determination decision. And by the way, there is expedited due process for these disciplinary matters. It's much, much shorter time frame. Um, they can grant re retrospective relief, comp ed or tuition reimbursement, attorney fees and costs, no expert witness fees, ugh, um, and no punitive damages under IDEA. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, I'll explain a little more detail about those in a sec, um, but they're civil rights laws. They're about equal access to education, so it's a different standard. And under Section 504 also has a FAPE standard um, that is very different from IDEA. IDEA, remember that's, it's, it, we got rid of more than a minimus, but, but it's not equal, all right? And in fact, the first case on FAPE, the US Supreme Court decided in Raleigh, they specifically um, said that th under IDEA, that FAPE did not guarantee an equal education to non-disabled children. They specifically said that for IDEA. Section 504 has a FAPE requirement. It is exactly that. It, under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, schools are to provide equal access to education. They can't, um, it's, it, it is an equality standard, a comparative standard, and that's very powerful. And it's one thing I think we probably don't as advocates leverage enough because um, we, we all are so locked into IDEA because um, it's so dominant, but it is different. But in these cases that we bring 504 and ADA claims, you can also get retrospective relief, comp ed, tuition reimbursement. You can get monetary or compensatory damages, which is different for IDEA. So for example, um, because the school you know messed something up with the child's education, the child's at home, the parent had to quit their job because he was gonna stay home with Johnny um, while he's there all day. Um, the parent had to pay for private uh, uh, counseling and the counselor only counselor that took their insurance was an hour away. Under 504 and ADA, you can get the um, mileage cost going to and from therapy. You can get lost wages. Um, so there are more damages that are available under these laws that are available under IDEA. Um, the problem though, or, well, it is a problem, but, but the, uh, way that you prevail on those claims, however, is much harder than IDEA because we have to prove intentional discrimination, which the courts have said means you have to prove bad faith and gross misjudgment. And circuits vary <laughs> on how, what they consider to be bad faith and gross misjudgment. And unfortunately, in our circuit, um, we, there's a very high bar to be able to prove bad faith and gross, very high bar. Um, so that does make these cases difficult, but that doesn't mean we're not bringing them. We're still filing them. We're still trying to, to, to um, make progress on that front because this can be a very powerful law and, um, to, to protect children's civil rights. Um, so we just keep fighting the good fight. Um, but you, again, the good, other th good thing with 504 ADA is you can get expert witness fees. Uh, oh, and quick practice note, also um, recovering attorney's fees that... Um, while the, the prevailing party, if the prevailing party is the parent, they get their attorney's fees. However, if the prevailing party is the school district and the hearing officer rules that, um, I'm sorry, not the hearing officer, I apologize, um, that the district court judge, because you file a fee petition in um, federal district court, and if the judge rules that the parent's uh, complaint was frivolous or brought in bad faith, uh, or, then they can, in that situation, they can award attorney's fees against the parent and their attorney. So keep that in mind. Let's not be filing any frivolous lawsuits out there. Um, it has happened, but the cases that I've read are, are truly egregious, where the parent filed literally the same claims five times. Um, you know, so these are the examples are egregious, but but just you have to be aware and you have to tell your client if they want you to file something crazy town. That I don't feel like paying the school board one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> they get plenty of money. Um, all right, so. Uh, don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm going to kind of breeze through, kind of hit the highlights on 504 and ADA. The big thing to know is that um, it's a broad civil rights, non-discrimination law. This one's 504. ADA is very similar. Um, it does also apply to um, not just to schools, but also to colleges uh, that receive public funding and provides protection for people with disabilities. Um, Again, here's the issue, it's to provide equal access to education. So it is a comparative standard to non-disabled students in, in our situation. Um, unlike the IDEA, it also includes an anti-retaliation provision. And, um, and that includes not just retaliating against the student, but retaliating against the parent or an advocate or anyone who is um, 
uh, advocating for that student's civil rights under this law or under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so, but there is an anti-retaliation provision uh, in the law. And uh, the law provides legal remedies if a school district discriminates, excludes, or retaliates against a parent, child, or school district employee that are exercising their rights under the law. Um, eligibility, and it's the same for Americans with Disabilities Act, all right? Um, but it requires a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act amendments a few years ago, um, there were some horrible Supreme Court decisions that basically made it really raise the bar for eligibility under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Section 504 adopts the same eligibility standards. And so Congress came back and said, no, that is not what we meant. We don't want this to be a high bar for people with disabilities to qualify under these laws. Um, so it, it's, it is not a high bar to qualify. The other thing that's different about these laws for, to qualify for protection is under IDEA, you have to show an adverse impact um, on their academics, on their education, right, in that realm. Here, it's a substantially limiting one or more major life activities. So the life activity may not involve anything <laughs> at school. It could be some a, a major life activity that's a problem in the home or somewhere in some other environment that's irrelevant for eligibility for these laws. Also, the other difference is under IDEA, you have to show to be eligible that the student needs specially, uh, uh, special education, specially designed instruction. That sometimes can be very difficult and a tricky wicket. Um, that isn't at all involved in these laws. So that's why if you remember my Venn diagram, the 504 ADA circle was so much bigger because it's so much easier to qualify under these, under these laws. Uh, here's where I talked about the Amendments Act. Not only that, um, the determination of eligibility should not demand extensive, extensive analysis, but you can't consider ameliorating, ameliorating effects of mitigating measures like ADHD medicine. They can't say, oh, but Johnny's on meds now and he's perfectly fine in the classroom um, when Johnny was you know, off the chain three months earlier. Uh, that's irrelevant from, for the decision or the determination about whether the child is eligible. Um, and other things like um, assistive technology or reasonable accommodations. You know, A lot of times before these kids get a 504 plan or, or an IEP, the school is intervening. They're doing things, especially good teachers, right? They are giving these kids all kinds of accommodations and help. But you can't look at, like, say, Johnny was making A's and B's. Why doesn't need a plan? He's doing just fine. Yeah, but Johnny's getting A's and B's because the teacher's reteaching the material, because the teacher's letting him retake the test three times, because, you know, which is okay. That's not a bad thing. But at least for the purposes of ADM 504, teams can't take that into consideration. They have to look at what's happening before the teacher was implementing all of these interventions. Um, I'll let you guys read some of this stuff. These, there's a big long list and it's not exclusive of the different major life activities, um, but caring for oneself, you know, if, if um, uh, bending, speaking, learning, it, it, it's, a, it's a broad list. And it's also major bodily functions, not just the activities. And again, those are not exclusive. Um, again, 504 requires students to be given comparable aids, benefits, and services. Uh, this includes music, physical education, lunch, services of the guidance office, vocational training programs that our kids often get excluded from. Um, these are, they, uh, unlike, like I said before, unlike IDEA, where the Supreme Court rejected this comparative standard, that is the standard under 504 and ADA. All right, and I talked a bit a little bit about the FAPE requirement, same kind of thing, free appropriate public education, but the difference is it's got to provide equal access. It's the last second to last line there to the education that uh, non-disabled peers receive. Okay. Uh, oh, let me go back real quick. Similar things, informal resolution is always an option. Um, federal complaints to the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. Uh, let me just say, though, they take forever. <laughs> I have one that we filed, I think, nine months ago, and I keep checking back um, with uh, OCR, and they keep saying we haven't decided whether to even investigate yet. So where the VDOE state complaints, pretty quick turnaround, the federal um, OCR complaints take forever. Uh, but they do, they can be effective when they do finally investigate, uh, it just takes a long time. There are often local appeal and grievance procedures that you can get in the policies, but um, you're not required to exhaust. 
any of those to be able to either go to due process or even to go right into federal court. The only thing you have to worry about with exhaustion before bringing 504 or ADA claims into federal court is have you exhaust if um, your claims involve a free appropriate public education, if those are the kinds of claims you're making, then you would have to exhaust your IDEA due process procedures. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Vision. Yeah, so here's what, okay, here's what they said in Fry. All right, Justice Kagan said in your Supreme Court decision for Fry, how do you know if you have to exhaust through IDEA administrative due process first? Okay, and it was a two part test. Number one, can the student bring the same claims that you have at issue against a library or a movie theater? And prong two of her test was can an adult bring these same claims against a school? And in Fry, it was a matter of a, uh, a dog, a service assistance dog that the school refused to let the student bring in. But that claim could have been brought by an adult as well. And so that's why the Supreme Court held in that case, exhaustion was not required. Um, the newest case is Perez, which I'm about to, I'm so excited, I'm about to file one to test the Perez um, holding. But in that one, it was a matter of what kind of um, uh, damages you were requesting. And if you're only requesting the monetary damages, compensatory damages, I should say, um, then you do not have to exhaust through IDEA due process. So those are the two US Supreme Court decisions about exhaustion. But if it has anything to, to, to do with the school um, and you don't meet one, either the Fry test or the Perez test, then you better file due process. And that's even if a child has not even yet been found eligible, even if the school said this kid isn't even eligible, there's case law out there that says you still have to go through due process. I do. Yes, sir, I do. So I, I, I'm going to dot every I and cross every T. So I will raise my 504 and ADA claims. Typically in Virginia, our hearing officers refuse to hear ADA claims. There is actually in the Virginia regs that say they have the discretion to hear 504 claims. Some do, some don't, but that's, that's where we are. Okay. Um, I'm gonna zip on through, and like I said, ADA pretty much is very similar. There's some more powerful communication regulations that, that we use under ADA, but otherwise everything is pretty much the same. Um, oh, and by the way, you, there are due process um, that you can do that are for 504 and a ADA, but you, if you're gonna file due process, you need to file it under IDEA so you can exhaust. So there's never an issue and you don't have to do two due process cases to exhaust if you don't prevail on the first one. Um, but again, you don't have to exhaust any grievance or any due process procedure under 504 ADA. The only thing you have to exhaust if you, I guess, fail the Fry or the Perez test is an IDEA administrative due process that you have to go through that, that nightmare. Yeah, and okay, same thing with Perez. Lots of guidance documents, um, OCR and OSEP, US Department of Education on their website. Virginia Department of Education has lots of great websites. I always, I, I barely know Pete Wright, but um, he's got this website rights law that has a lot of free information that parents can search. Um, so I don't get a kickback or anything, but it's a good resource um, that I send people to. So I, I think we only have maybe two or three minutes. So maybe one or two questions. Anyone? Think one minute. Yep. Is against parents. I like you. I, I mean, I had a law degree, and when they handed me those my rights book, I was like, first of all, none of this makes sense. Then when I started learning what the federal law said, I was like, well, this doesn't even say what the federal law says. Mm -hmm. So, and, and certainly, no IEP team I've ever been a part of ever knew the law, not a single one. Yeah, yeah. it's um. um yeah, it, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of misinformation that teens are giving parents, and again, parents don't know what they don't know and they trust. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it, it's tough out there. But again, we wouldn't be doing this job if we didn't have hope. And, you know, we hope that any of these law students out here will decide to pick this up as an area of law that they would like to um, specialize in and work in, because uh, it is a great need.
Well, and they just redid the parents guide with it to be more simplistic for the families, but it's taken out a whole lot of stuff that gives you the background information of why this is in here in the first place. Well, and funny thing, I actually made this argument in that due process case this last summer, that rights book, you know, that we all got and then I got, remember, I was like, oh, and it took me six months to get through. And the thing about it is now knowing what I know, the majority of the really important stuff, the important rights aren't even in the book. It's not complete. It doesn't give parents all rights. And there are certain things that, that the parents didn't hold to account because the school said that we gave her the rights. And I never turned out. Here are the six things related to this case that there's not a peep about it in those parent right books that they gave them. Anyone else? How, how do you get your clients? How do you mark it? Is it just word of mouth or? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Because um yeah, there's so few of us that do this work. Yeah. And um like yeah. my our firm, we don't work it or anything. Um we just I mean, but Delkowitz Law has been around for at least 10 years, maybe. I, I've been with them five. So um, you know, but I think all of us are the same. There is a dirt of special attorney in the steps. Because we don't have enough. I mean, I literally had a friend talk to me. Uh, he was licensing in D.C., Maryland, and North Carolina. And talked to me to get a license in Virginia. Um, just I'm in the Tyler area. And we really don't have anyone uh, to help represent families because she's full. <laughs> yeah, there's a major contract firm. I'll take a hold. They find out that that's one of the priorities today for us education, special education law, and they have a private attorney involved with the AI program. And you can probably actually get paid a little bit as you learn to do those cases. So that's another option. Yeah, and if you're really looking for cases, go to the rural areas, of, especially here in Virginia, because there is no special ed attorneys, basically, you know, far out. And volunteers to learn the language. Okay, that's how we ask. My contact is with all of us. He was very collegial, very collaborative, and he would call us and do a lot. Really take it. I'll take it. Thank you so much, Ms. Wall. Our final session of the day is also our final practitioners panel on legislative advocacy. It's with Valerie LaRoe. Uh, Cheryl Poe and Abby Phillips. Unfortunately, Rachel Dean is sick today, and it will be moderated by Professor Tara Casey. Um, which I guess is probably uh, a good motto for the type of work that we've been talking about all day long. There, there is, is no break. There is no break. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Tara Casey, and I'm on the faculty here at University of Richmond School of Law. I am the director of the Carrico Center for Pro Bono and Public Service, and it is my honor to moderate this panel of amazing individuals who are engaging in legislative and policy advocacy, which is um, a different branch of practitioner in this space. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, unfortunately, as was mentioned earlier, uh, Rachel Dean, who's the Executive Director of Voices for Virginia's Children, um, is not well today. Um, and so uh, she, as determined as a warrior as she is, um, there are days where you just have to say, nah. And so she is, um, is, is homesick today. But I feel like in the time that we have, we still have plenty to discuss with the wonderful people here in the front. Um, right next to me is Valerie LaRue. She's the Deputy Director of the Center for Family Advocacy at the Virginia Poverty Law Center. She is a policy attorney for low-income families and children and their parents in the child welfare system. And she advocates for evidence-based trauma-informed solutions that respect family strengths and right to self-determination. Prior to joining BPLC, Valerie was the Director of Public Service Career Development here at the University of Richmond School of Law. She's also an alum. Um, and she also spent time as a public defender for a number of years in Charlottesville. Thank you so much, Valerie, for joining us today. Thank you. Next is Abby Phillips. Abby is a macro social worker 
her by training and began her public policy career with the goal of centering equity and creating systemic change while eliminating racism, discrimination, and barriers to economic mobility. That is a mission statement. Um, she has extensive experience working in the Virginia General Assembly from running special projects in the governor's office as an assistant secretary of the Commonwealth to serving as chief of staff for both state delegate and state senator. She is a co-founder and board member of a philanthropic giving circle called Collective 365, which is a Henrico County, and she's also a Henrico County Court Appointed Special Advocate for 14 years. Thank you so much for being here, Abby. And last but certainly not least at the far end is Cheryl Poe. Um, Cheryl is the founder and executive director of Advocating for Kids, Inc., which is a special education advocacy organization that provides resources information and workshops to parents and professionals with a special focus on addressing the needs of black and brown children with disabilities. Um, Cheryl has over 20 years of experience working with children with various disabilities and their families. And she was the chair of the National Association for the Education of African-American Children with Learning Disabilities Parent Network and served on the board of the Council of Parents, Advocates and Attorneys where she served as co-chair for the Social Racial Equity Committee. She's also the past board president of the National Allies for Parents and Special Education and completed a two-year term as the Student Outreach and Recruitment Committee Chairperson for the Mid-Atlantic Group Psychotherapy Society Board of Directors. Um, Cheryl holds a master's degree in urban education and counseling and is the mother of two boys with learning disabilities. So thank you so much, Cheryl, for, for joining us today as well. Pretty amazing right now. Um, so this is the this is the practitioner's panel for legislative ad advocacy, and I wanted to actually start uh, with a question to Valerie because you're the attorney. Well, I'm an attorney, but we're the attorney on the panel. And what is the difference between legislative policy advocacy and legal advocacy, especially when you're a lawyer who's having to be in both worlds? Well, that's a really good question. And um, I was thinking about that today before I came over here. And I thought of this sort of old canard that, you know, a good lawyer knows the law and a great lawyer knows the law and the judge. And there's <laughs> so many things about that that is completely wrong. And also there's lots of different ways to interpret it. Um, but I was thinking that when it comes to legislative advocacy, it is absolutely true that a good uh, legislative advocate knows the law and a great legislative advocate knows the law and the legislators, um, because legislators all have, they come to this, uh, the, their work uh, serving us um, from lots of different perspectives and experiences. And it used to be that much of the General Assembly, if not most, were attorneys, and that is no longer true. There's a smaller uh, a minority of legislators who are now attorneys in the Virginia General Assembly. And so um, having that experience as a, an attorney, I find has been super valuable in terms of both analyzing the statutes or the proposed uh, bills um, and having the understanding that, oh, if you put this comma here, it might sound better as a sentence, but it's gonna change the meaning of the sentence. And a lot of legislators don't really understand that. Um, another thing is that if you work in a particular area of law that the statutes are gonna impact, you've been in the courtroom, you've used those statutes and you know, you know what the impact of it will be on people in the courtroom. And, and that's a really valuable perspective that, that legislators really, really appreciate. Um, but the other thing is that you, um, you know, have to have this sort of broader understanding of personalities and perspectives and political leanings and things like that. And so you have to, you can't just go in and say, well, the law says this, and this is, you know, how, what the outcome will be if you change this. You have to figure out, well, what message will resonate with that person in order to get your point across. And so it's a... Uh, um, you know, that, that's very similar to like trying to persuade a jury in some ways, except that um, it's just sort of, uh, I don't know, more wide open, I want to say. Um, and you certainly don't have to worry about things like uh, 
hearsay mm -hmm. <laughs> rules and things like that. But one of the funniest things is that you can always tell when someone is getting up before a committee of the General Assembly who is an attorney because you're supposed to address your marks to, you know, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Ms. Chairwoman, members of the committee, and mm -hmm. people, and I do this sometimes too, will start off saying, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> May it so. please the committee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Well, and, 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 and I think like going further with this with legislative and policy advocacy, because Abby, I neglected to mention, you are also the director of um, policy at the Legal Aid Justice Center. Big part, I forgot in your introduction, my apologies. But as somebody who is in an organization where there is both legal advocacy and legislative advocacy, can you walk through for us what that type of legislative policy advocacy looks like in your organization. Yeah. Yeah. So we're a legal aid organization. So we're providing legal aid to the community. And really that's the direct service that informs how we make policy and decisions and how we develop policy to take it to the General Assembly. And our organization is trying to essentially dismantle the overcriminalization of poverty through both uh, legal work through impact litigation and through advocacy work in the General Assembly. So we can represent people one on one, but we also recognize that if there are issues with the existing laws, we have to try to change those um, to address a lot of the things that we are seeing happen over and over and over again with our clients. So one thing that's really wonderful about Legal Aid Justice Center is that we work in community with impacted groups to help us figure out how to address um, the biggest needs that the community is facing. So we don't just have our attorneys go into the courtroom for, say, like a housing uh, eviction case and let the attorneys decide how they think the law should be changed. But we also work with that impacted person who was possibly evicted or facing eviction to help us understand what they are going through and the barriers that they're navigating and then use that as a way to develop policy, because otherwise it's just a lot of people making decisions for the group of people that's actually most impacted by what's happening. And same in our, in our work, we have a youth justice program and our youth justice program has attorneys that work in special education. And when those issues are coming up in the General Assembly, we have that direct experience on the front lines with community members navigating the IEP system. Um, and we can go to legislators and say, here's why this will be problematic if you pass this, or here's why this will be helpful if you pass this. And so we can bring that direct legal experience and community experience into the actual policy making process. And frankly, I think that's the best way to make policy as many voices who are impacted, as many stakeholders that have an interest in that issue should be part of that conversation. And most certainly the ones that are gonna be impacted by how we change the laws, their voices should be raised in that process. So that's part of how we do it at Legal Aid Justice Center. Well, and, and going now further to Cheryl, so much of your work is empowering individuals to be engaged in this advocacy as well. And so I would love to hear, like, how does your organization address what can oftentimes be the deficit in information right. for, for children, for children of color, for parents as they are going through this process and are wanting to be advocates on the legislative policy stage for themselves and for other members of their community. Well, I work with other agencies like um, Abby, <laughs> I work Amy Walters, like she's yeah. a partner with her. So yeah. their capacity is bigger and their temperaments are probably better suited <laughs> for that kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I identify uh, parents or community members that are being impacted by specific laws that are going up to say, hey, if you can give testimony or give to support to this. But um, our organization really, I don't see ourselves that much um, being involved in, in laws, um, in law development, other than watching, right? For laws that I know are gonna target black students with disabilities in our public schools that lead them into the school to prison pipeline. Like mm -hmm. for instance, 
um, last year, there was a three strike law that was coming up. And though I did not um, personal, well, I guess I did, I, I reached out to people um, locally in the Virginia Beach area, but I really did need to count on the other agencies amongst the states mm -hmm. that do this kind of work to push it up and make sure that people that needed to know that this is bad law, mm -hmm. um, that they got that information. So it didn't go through it. So that's that's how I see it. Yeah, my I see my work more as, as a legal advocate when you talk about the two, mm -hmm. just from a perspective of recognizing a lay, I should say lay legal advocate, right? Not an attorney. Uh, Asterix, believe. no EUPL present here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because uh, they love coming after us as advocates. And uh, even though I play one on TV sometimes. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I look at regulatory language that's already in place. Because as Melissa just walked us through, there are tons of regulatory language laws that already are supposed to protect our people of color. Mm -hmm right, and our students with disabilities. So when I intersect all of those laws together, I use that to help push agendas that are um, for my individual clients. But I've learned, because I can't go to court and I don't want to go to law school, using systemic complaints through those pieces. Mm -hmm. And then you have a bigger impact. So to follow up on a little bit on that, because your experience is been long. I mean, yes. it's been over a number yes. of years. Have you seen, how would you describe the evolution of that advocacy? For oh, me? Oh, yeah. It's been huge. It's been huge. Um, I initially didn't know what a sped ed advocate was, didn't, you know, kind of pay attention to it, even though I grew up as a student with a disability and I remember having an IEP and I remember going into those special rooms and I remember being teased. I remember all those pieces of it. You know, after I was able to compensate and learn what I needed to learn, I kind of forgot about it until I had children because things are hereditary, <laughs> right? So as soon as I, um, so when I had my son, my first, my oldest son, I was in grad school to become a therapist, post-grad school to become a therapist. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do therapy and I wanted to do therapy for the black community because mm -hmm. mental health was an issue and our, it is and continues at, at times to, to be an issue, but it's evolved way more than our public education has. So um, I think I our, my services have evolved over the years in several ways. I'm moving from a parent, just a parent advocating to get her two black male students services that are appropriate and aren't discriminated in a Virginia Beach City Public School with a mother that's from New Jersey. So that's one stage of what I had to do. And then after I was able to see su success and trust that my children were gonna be safe and that I knew enough to help others, you know, it's, it's the kind of same feeling I guess you guys had, but a different level of, geez, if I, me, <laughs> I'm having this amount of trouble as a black female. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was really, you know, I was told my child didn't need speech therapy because I was speaking black English to him at home, right? So if I'm facing that kind of overt, in your face, discriminatory biased behaviors, imagine what people who weren't impacted, weren't, uh, didn't have a master's, weren't um, getting the appropriate sped ed services to be able to stay in school and get that degree, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I evolved into then advocating for others and, and did that for a majority of the time, still do that. But the last couple of years, I've really been using the Justice Department, uh, the U.S. Department of Education to file systemic complaints. I currently, I did it. I filed a systemic complaint against the U.S. Department. Uh, against the Virginia Department of Education um, on behalf of all students with disabilities across the state, stating that the VDOE failed in its duties during the COVID time to ensure that students with disabilities received special education services. And the VDOE allowed school districts to hide behind a phrase of these services aren't available at this particular time mm -hmm. or this stage. OCR picked it up. I, I was surprised. I, I will admit, I didn't think they would, but they, they picked it up. They are actively investigating our Virginia Department of Education. I also have a U.S. Department of Justice complaint. I got a call on Monday. I did a systemic complaint against Chesapeake Public Schools for racial and disability discrimination. 
got a call that they will be coming here next week, boots on the grounds in Chesapeake, both units, the units that will be looking at the racial discrimination um, components of the allegations. That's a different department. It's still justice, but it's under a different yeah. header, I guess. And they will be working with the U.S. Department of Justice, the, the Justice Department for the people that look at the disability, civil rights, yeah. educational claims. So what I've learned and what I'm hoping to work on, thank you, with uh, the, the group up here, because we, we're all in this work together, is that's what we're going to have to change, do. We're going to have to file systemic large complaints. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to coordinate. So when I'm um, filing a complaint in Virginia Beach, if I can pull in some people from Roanoke or pull some people in from Richmond or pull some people in from wherever, so that it's statewide. And that really needs to be against the racial discrimination that is happening to Black students in the state of Virginia when it comes to our public schools. Mm -hmm. It is disgusting. We have to do something differently. For the last 20 years, 20 years, Black students with disabilities, well, Black students overall, but Black students with disabilities especially are overrepresented in expulsions, mm -hmm. suspensions, re referral to the courts, anything negative. They're not graduating equally to their non-disabled peers. And I do have theories on why that exists, but I'll wait for you to ask that later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one of your questions. <laughs> well, but I think, but what you're talking about is like, it's, it's also, these are things that are just key happening. Yes. And, and Abby, I'm, I'm curious because of your experience, both in the Secretary of the Commonwealth's office and also with uh, this delegate and state center, like during all of your time there, like what were things that you were seeing that just were coming up time and time again and just were not moving the needle, but yet still coming to the General Assembly or coming to the Secretary or Governor's office time and time again? I mean, the, the biggest thing that comes to my mind is how we fund public schools and how the deficit of that funding results in things mm -hmm. like black and brown children, especially with disabilities being disproportionately suspended and expelled. We don't have enough support staff in schools. I think there's a real crisis around actually having um, aids for kids with special needs in public schools. And we have underinvested in our public school system over and over and over again. And advocates have been coming to us and saying that this is what's happening. This is part of why we are seeing these things happen. And if you want to holistically invest in our communities and our kids and our families, you have to start funding public schools in a way that addresses the whole person. So you have mental health support in schools. So you have school social workers and school psychologists and counselors. So you have aides in classrooms um, where there are children with specialized learning um, or children with disabilities. And we just haven't done that. We haven't done that ever. Like we mm -hmm. have never fully funded public education in Virginia. Um, the way that we should be doing and and our communities are suffering because of that and it has not been for a lack of advocates coming and telling the General Assembly that this is a problem but essentially they would need to invest a billion dollars mm -hmm. to fix these uh, systemic problems and that's not an exaggeration it really it's not the, it's they, they put a number next to it and it is a billion dollars yep they'd have to invest a billion dollars and they haven't done it yeah. They haven't done it. We, we, um, in 2008, we had a cap put on support staff and have not yet fully raised that support staff cap. And that includes specialized support staff that's um, school counselors, social workers, um, and psychologists. And we have lifted it up a little bit so that the ratios are getting a little bit better, but it's still not enough. And we are seeing, I think, generations of consequences yes. from making those um, uh, decisions for our legislators and our governor's staff, making those decisions to not fully invest in public schools. In the meantime, we're hearing we have like surplus of a budget and we're putting lots of money in our rainy day fund because we are. And anxious. rebate checks. Rebate yes. checks coming out rebate next checks. year. If you live here in Virginia, you're going to get a rebate check. 
And, and frankly, that rebate checks is the compromise because they were trying to do tax cuts. And, and there is a, um, a coalition called the Funder Schools Coalition, and they fought really hard not to um, have those tax cuts in place and to try to really push legislators to put a foot down on putting those tax cuts in place. Because just because we have a surplus now does not mean that's going to exist in the future, and that absolutely would cut into something like public education funding. Yeah. So with all of this in the landscape, um, Valerie, I, I would I would love to hear your perspective because we're coming into a General Assembly session, we're coming into a historic election, and we're coming into a, a General Assembly session that many are, are are finding difficult to predict what it will look like. What do you what what change though do you think is right now most pressing in the child welfare and and parental rights space that we should be possibly focusing on as we're coming into the next General Assembly session? So that's a great question. Thank you. Give me a chance to get up in my soapbox. <laughs> so um, speaking of things that repeat and repeat, I've been working for a number of years on improving the uh, quality of the legal representation that is provided to parents when children are removed from them judicially um, after an investigation by Child Protective Services. And one thing that relates to all the things we were talking about is that Virginia has this really terrible habit of saying, you know what, we think that X amount of dollars is a good thing for this. So let's put in our code that we will pay X amount of dollars for this thing. 20 years later, with inflation and lots of other things, we're still paying X amount of dollars. And as an example, um, the attorneys who are appointed to represent parents when their children are removed and placed in foster care are, play, are paid a flat fee of $120 um, with no fee cap waiver. And that uh, is- Let per, that sink in. Yes, $120 flat fee per petition filed. And a first petition can be up to three hearings long. And I just looked up recently how much, so that was set in uh, 2003. Um, and so here we are uh, 20 years later and it's still $120. And I, so I looked up how much was, you know, how much in today's dollars was $120 back then It's $69. So essentially attorneys are getting paid $69 um, to handle three court hearings. And so, you know, here are the things we hear. Oh, the attorney just walked up, got up and walked out in the middle of the court hearing. Judges can't find any attorneys to appoint. Attorneys don't show up for the court hearing. Attorneys don't return parents' calls. Attorneys don't prepare for hearings. Attorneys do not subpoena witnesses. They do not review evidence. They do not argue or advocate for their clients in court. Now, there are plenty of attorneys who do do all those things, but they're working pro bono essentially. So the $120, especially when you're covering the five-day hearing, and these are mandatory hearings that are mandated by federal and state law, five-day hearing, an adjudicatory hearing, which sometimes is combined with the dispositional hearing, but that's three hearings um, on three different issues. And um, having handled these cases, I know that you can put uh, dozens or even hundreds of hours into these cases, but that basically pays for it. The court appointed rate, that's basically an hour and a third, um, but considering the court appointed rate itself of $90 an hour hasn't changed either <laughs> since 2000, um, that's basically you're asking someone to work for, for nothing, basically. And, and attorneys have also told me that they don't even bother to submit their voucher to the Supreme Court because that's even more time on top of all the time that they've already lost. And so there's no point. So they just treat it as if it's pro bono. So I've been working on this. Um, the Virginia Commission on Youth recognized this as a problem back in 2015. And so VPLC worked on it on that in that year. I joined VPLC in 2016 and started working on it then. There have been repeated bills to make improvements since 2015, uh, including 2015, uh, 2020, uh, 2022, um, and 2023. Um, and most of those bills substantively have passed the General Assembly, but the money to fund them has not. Um, but this year, I am very hopeful that we will actually achieve some momentum. And one of the things that's really important to know is, you know, when we talk about, we hear a lot about parental rights, you know, our governor has talked about parents matter, blah, blah, blah. And so when we hear that, a lot of times we're thinking about the things that we hear about in the news, you know, parents matter when it comes to uh, what books should my child be reading in the library, or parents matter when it comes to what pronouns does the child want to use to be referred to themselves when they're in school. But we're talking about low-income parents 
who don't matter <laughs> as far as the court system and our child protection system um, uh, it, it goes. Um, but also, all the data out there shows that when parents get better legal representation, the outcomes for the child are vastly improved and happen on a much faster rate. So when a child is removed into foster care, it's not like, oh, that's the end of the story. The parent works with the department. The department is supposed to, by law, again, federal and state law, work with the parent to provide services to the parent to address the issues that caused the child to be removed in the first place. And so that's an ongoing process. And if the parent has better legal counsel, that process happens much faster. And in states that have adopted what's called the holistic or multidisciplinary model of legal representation, it happens on average four months faster. In Virginia, we spend over $300 million annually on foster care for 5,000 children in care. So that's between you know, uh, 500 uh, or 5,000 and $20,000 a month per child. And so if we were to shorten um, that, amount of time that children spend in foster care by an average of just one month, we would be saving $25 million a year. So this is something that General Assembly has had a chance to look at and yet has said, oh, well, that's, you know, it's how, where are your figures coming from? How do you know? Um, but what they did finally do in uh, 2022 was create a work group. And the work group made a bunch of recommendations. In 2023, those recommendations are put before the General Assembly and they're like, oh, you know, well, that looks good, but you know, I think we need more study. So instead of doing anything, they created two new studies. But one thing that happened last year that is different, and this is an example of just, I don't know, serendipity or something. I was talking to one of the legislators and he's like, yeah, this is terrible. It's been going on for a long time. It's horrible. You know, back in 2005, we had the same problem with criminal, uh, the criminal defense attorneys who are appointed and um, it didn't change until the state bar got involved and I went, oh, <laughs> so I immediately reached out to the state bar and they're like, oh, well, we don't get involved in legislative matters. That's, you know, something we don't do. And I was like, well, you did do it in 2005. And I was like, really? And I said, yes, here's a letter that you sent to Warner <laughs> that is on your website. And they're like, oh. So um, I have been working since January to um, uh, reach out to a committee of the state bar, including one in which uh, Professor Casey serves on, and that is the Access to uh, Legal Services Committee, and reaching out to members of Bar Council. And uh, on October 13th, Bar Council voted unanimously to take legal action um, or to take legislative action um, on this issue. Now, they still need to get permission from the Supreme Court. Um, but since the Supreme Court has uh, just raised the rate that they are paying attorneys on appeals to the Supreme Court, and the Court of Appeals has also raised the rate that they're paying attorneys who represent parents on appeal in the Court of Appeals, I'm very hopeful that they're very cognizant of the issue and, and will finally pass it. Um, but that's an example of, you know, it's a complex issue because it's not an issue where you go to court and you have a trial and you either win or lose and then everybody goes home. It's a case where the attorney stays with that client sometimes for two years or more um, under the, again, it's a scheme of federal and state laws that mandate hearings on certain time periods. You want a very long time and it can impact a parent's very ability to be a parent. Never mind what pronouns their child wants to use, never mind what books are in the library, but whether they even are able to be a parent. And um, to follow up on your point, Cheryl, the parents who are impacted are, of course, almost all low income, but disproportionately parents of color. Mm -hmm. And in some cities, um, like uh, Portsmouth, for example, sometimes the number of children in foster care are four to five times higher than the number of, uh, of Black children in foster care than of Black children in the general population. And we see that in a lot of areas. Now, in Southwest Virginia, we don't see that just because there tends to be fewer Black children anyway. Um, but those in those areas, there are disproportionately just more children in foster care generally, and that relates to the opioid epidemic, and then also the prejudice we have about drug abuse. Well, and, and I think that what you're also bringing up in that, that, that last comment, and Cheryl, I'd like to ask you this question, is the intersectionality of all of this. Um, and there's these, um, and the challenges of almost confronting the intersectionality because you wind up having to touch different spaces, different spheres, different communities, different areas. So what, oh yeah, so, so take the deep breath. So, what, <laughs> so 
When confronting the intersectionality of these issues, what do you see as being the biggest challenge um, going forward? Well, the one of the biggest challenges is that a lot of the large nonprofit organizations in the state of Virginia that are literally tasked and provided funding either through the state or the federal government. Now I'm speaking specifically about special education or educational needs, right? right. Um, are run by white women and their boards are usually all white or maybe one black person, right? So right there, we know that the lens of what is valued or what needs to be addressed at any particular time through their goals, through their strategic plans are coming from a white lens, a white supremacist lens. Because if you don't have a black voice at the table, if you don't have a minority, several, not just one, several minority voices at the table, then we, we aren't seen, we aren't heard. Our needs aren't taken as serious. Now, I'm not saying that a white woman could not advocate on behalf of the needs of black families. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but I am saying that if we're going to talk about making significant, long-lasting change, we need to revamp everything. <laughs> you know, we need to make sure that when they pull these stakeholders groups together and they pull these study groups together, that they are inclusive of everybody. The demographics of Virginia should be represented in those settings, and they're not. Prime example example, the Virginia Department of Education, um, their state SEAC, which is a special education committee that they have to have, right? And it's to talk about the needs of students across the state. And they have um, requirements for regions, like you can only have two people from this region or a person from this region. So they have those democratic, those uh, demo demographics covered. I went and there was no Black people and I'm like, how is that possible when we make such a large percentage of students receiving special education services? How can you ignore, I mean, you can't be listening to our needs because if you were, A, I think we would be having better outcomes, but you, you're not even engaging. You're not engaging the community that is impacted the most. So uh, I, I really encourage leaders um, to leaders of these kinds of organizations or people that have the power to do that. When we talk about inclusion, because when it comes to disability, we'll talk about inclusion real quick, say, where's your person with disabilities? Where are also your, the representation of the demographics racially mm -hmm. on your boards? Where are their voices when you're making policies that impact our community the most? Like that three strike law, I, I can't believe that that would be an educational bill that had somebody, you know, of color, hopefully several. That's why I say several, because just because we're Black, we don't all think the same thing. But the discussion and the views of how traumatic that could be based on where we know we are, like, how did that escape anybody? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it just amazes me. And just to touch on the, the, um, the, the parental right. Every time I hear those words come out of his mouth, I just cringe. I, I, I think I'm having a, a, a traumatic response to it, right? I really am. I was like, wait, so the only people who count as far as parents are those who want to ban books that tell the true history about how Black people were hurt, mm -hmm. or if you're using the wrong pronoun for a child. Mm -hmm. That's when the rights count. We have IDEA. Do you know the word parent is listed in there 440 times? What about those rights? Right. He's in totally just picking and choosing who counts. Yeah. So I also see, I just saw that we have five minutes left. I do want to leave an opportunity for folks in the audience to ask questions. I always have questions. I question everything. So, but I do want to give folks the opportunity for questions. I, I just wanted to say that I was, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, County jokes really on me, um, but I just want to say it is disgusting what I've seen, um, the blatant racism that I thought I was removing my children from. I'm thankful I have my children, two of them are now going to three, four to go, um, but I, I just, I just want to thank you all for what you're doing, especially in this COVID. It's just virtual. <laughs> 
When I thought Alabama's horrible, but but Virginia's better. It's, it is so much worse than Alabama. So much worse. Can I just jump and say yeah. that? I think people forget that this is one of the things that I do in my training when I talk about the intersectionality, right? Of racism and education. You got to realize that not that long in Virginia, kids with black kids could not go to school with white kids. You close down public education to avoid black kids being able to sit in the same classroom with white kids. I actually had uh, my grandmother, we, we lived from a small town up north, we knew where they and we literally had, she would have like people come and stay with them during the week. So they can go to school from Virginia and then go to home yet because they weren't allowed to access public education. So Virginia has never ever, have you all ever heard of the normal 17? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Have you ever heard of the stories? It is suspecting what they had to do. Could you imagine trying to go to school knowing everyone in the situation? Talk about mental health issues. <laughs> you know, so I mean, for like, we need to be honest. Virginia is never black like black people. Let's just be honest about that. And just because it's 2023 and we've had one black president and one black uh, vice president, it doesn't mean that America is all of a sudden like like aware of the world, <laughs> right? So I, I just think we have to be honest about the realities of racism and how much it's embedded here in Virginia where, you know, the slave trade, that, that you know, that this is it. So a lot, I mean, and nothing has changed. Well, no, we still don't bring the slave trade that. But from the, the mindset, the idea of the the idea that whiteness is better than blackness, um, anti-blackness, those kinds, that kind of mentality exists in our system, not just education, housing, like you talked about, systems that are supposed to protect children, like all of us. So, um, yes, I, I have a, I've been sitting here for a second, I came back for just a second and I've been the judicial part of it. And um, it's not just today, but it's, it's even every time when I do have a TV, I have to take the time to process and to really remember that there is a reason why I do what I do mm -hmm. and to not say I'm giving up because our world sucks. <laughs> Excuse my, my language, but it does. And when it comes down to children and of all races, um, and then the disproportionality that happens for, you know, a, a big group of our children, black children, brown children, Latino, I mean, poor, I mean, it's just, I've seen it, just like Cheryl said, I've seen it, even with my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciate everything that everybody here does. I appreciate having a conversation about that, but damn it, I want to see you do it. Yes. That part frustrates me to no end. And it's really hard to stay in this fight when you don't see the dial move mm -hmm. or it moves to teeny tiny bits. Mm -hmm. It's hard to stay in it. Believe me, I'm not giving up because the fairy is holding right? So, but I don't know. I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really having a hard time right now. I have, I'm going to have to go back to my room and really be depressed because. I hate seeing, hearing, hearing it. We have to hear. We gotta be aware of it. But, but I, I want to be able to do something. I want to blow it up. Start it up. Not literally blow it up. So don't go home. <laughs> 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 don't start round up. It doesn't start when they start when they. You know, when they get it fit right, if you don't get it right at the beginning, it's going to suck up the ends. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to come out and they're going to be out here in society, um, they're in jail or they're out here, you know, they have nowhere to go. And I don't care where you come from. That's anybody. Mm -hmm. And I have to agree with the, um, what was your name? Valerie, that was up here. She's the amount of money. 
Yeah, we can ask for a whole bunch of money, but when they divvy it up and they give most of the money to this group and this group, but then you have this little group over here in Franklin and Franklin County, when they don't have nothing, they have nothing. nothing. They can't provide half the stuff that Virginia Beach could provide for their students. That is wrong. What? Who's, who makes the decision that one group of students is struggling more than the other? And that is so long. I'm going to stop. It is. It is. And, and, and honestly, like, in, in, our, in our time, I feel like it's definitely a conversation and it's an ongoing conversation. And it should make us angry and it should make us really upset. And we should leave here feeling both um, discouraged and inspired. And and have all of those feelings happen at the same time. And I love the line that you said, you're not going to be giving up anytime soon. And it's in that moment of discouragement and pessimism that you still have that voice inside of you that says, I am not going to give up. And I have been so impressed by everyone in this space, by Pillar and by the advocates here, because this entire day was a day spent about discussing all of the barriers that are before our children in Virginia. And you are all here. You chose to spend your Friday here. I like to think not because the CLE deadline is Tuesday. <laughs> I like to think that the reason y'all are here is because you recognize that there are these barriers, that barriers and nevertheless, you are not going to give up. And I appreciate you all for being here. I appreciate the panel for being here. And thank you so much. <laughs> We will now close with a few words from our editor in chief, Courtney Spire. Oh, you guys are smooth. We're totally agreed to stay. Please stay up here with me. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Aaron said, my name is Courtney Spires. I'm the current editor in chief of Richmond's Public Interest Law Review. Um, the privileges of this position are probably the most apparent on days like this. Um, and while I personally and everyone who's sitting in this room today could probably spend another eight consecutive hours talking about youth advocacy and the importance of adequate education for Virginia's children and Alabama's children and all children in the United States and beyond. Um, I'm really here now to extend the deepest gratitude and thanks to everybody that made today possible. First, I wanna congratulate our outstanding symposium editors, Aaron Sweet and Nicole Evans. Aaron and Nicole took their roles in stride last May, I think is when we did the appointment process, if we all can remember that far back um, and put in countless hours in addition to their important summer internships um, to make today possible. Thank you both for your dedication to the event and for everything that I know that you will contribute to the legal profession um, in a few short months when we graduate. Second, I'd like to thank the members of our symposium committee who worked alongside Aaron and Nicole to make today run smoothly. Thank you to Lainey Flanagan, Pillar's first ever director of programming um, for directing this committee and for all, um, all of their hard work arranging last night's reception, today's breakfast and lunch, and the celebratory social event after um, the symposium wraps up. Thank you to our committee members, um, Victoria Hagerot, Tucker Weiser, uh, Christy Thompson, Reagan Cavanaugh, and Caitlin Grant. Thank you all for your willingness to support today's event and for going above and beyond um, your positions on the Public Interest Law Review. Next, I'd like to thank all of the University of Richmond staff and administration for all the work that they did to put on today's event. In particular, thank you to Richmond Law's resident tech expert, Carl Hamm, who I believe is still in the room. Um, <laughs> 
and also Eli Anderson, another one of our tech support staff here, um, for allowing us to share today's event with a virtual audience, um, as well as all the various sound checking and technology service that um, Carl provided and coordinated for us today. Thank you to Mary Ruth Keys uh, for her ongoing support with scheduling today's event, um, providing the beautiful advertising materials um, and for essentially every logistical need in between. Thank you to Professor Joyce Janto for assisting our team with getting CLE approval for today's event, not just pending, it's approved. And thank you to Dean Sklett for her overarching support um, of today's event, of the University of Richmond Public Interest Law Review, and for all of our law school journeys um, that, we that we started two and three years ago. And finally, thank you to our faculty advisor, Professor Janice Kraft. Um, I'm sure she's glad that we held our first in-person symposium since the start of, our the start of the pandemic um, in her first semester as our faculty advisor, might I say. Uh, and lastly, thank you to the practitioners, the judges, the faculty and faculty moderators who contributed to today's symposium. Thank you for the important work that you're doing in your respective spaces and for giving us all kinds of new knowledge and expertise um, today. In particular, I'd like to thank Professor Julie McConnell um, for connecting our symposium committee and editors to a perhaps most of the speakers that we had here today. Um, and also for uh, Melissa Waugh for how, all that you did to develop today's topic and sort of um, provide direction to our symposium editors this summer. I hope everyone, whether you joined us in person or online, um, enjoyed your time with us today. And as we've said, please check your email for further information related to those CLE credits. Um, and do stay tuned for our written symposium issue that will be published in early 2024. Thank you again um, for sharing your Friday with us and for continuing these difficult but important conversations of surrounding youth advocacy. Um, I wish everybody a great night and a great weekend. Thank you.